Chapter 11 How can I insert troops without decent plans? Even if it all has to change at the last moment, I still need somewhere more solid to start. Solo used to be sharp, knew what we needed, and now it's all vague force stuff, and I can't work with that. He's changed. And what if it's not the force guiding him? What if he's just hearing voices? Colonel Pichoff, Rapid Deployment Commander, GA Task Force at Fondor. Mandel Motors, Keldabe. So the Jedi hasn't come to buy any Besulike, said Jir Yomaget. Too bad. The thousandth export airframe just rolled off the line. She came to learn how to arrest her brother, Fett said. The hangar was crammed with everything but Besulik fighters. This was the prototype department. Some of the vessels around him were eccentric, to say the least. I'm being helpful. So's Bevin. Subtle. I'll build her a vibro-mallet. She's handy with machinery. If we're saddled with her for much longer, she'll earn her keep here. Do we want a Jedi poking around in our technology? It won't help her much. She knows how a Beskod works, but that doesn't make her bevine on a battlefield. It was much the same with the export market. The Besulik fighters being sold to other governments, and the occasional wealthy gangster, were de-enriched spec, as Yomaget called it. Slower, lighter Beskar armoring, fewer verpine-produced weapons refinements. They still beat an X-Wing, so the customers were happy. But even if they'd been allowed to buy a top-of-the-range Besulik, reserved solely for Mandalorians, they wouldn't know how to fly or fight like a Mondo pilot. It's like sticking Beskar gam on a Bantha, Yomaget said. Good for a laugh, and the Bantha might feel safer if it understood armor, but it doesn't turn it into a soldier. So? Oh, yes, the Trocod. If you have an opening to field test one, I'll grab it. Whole war going on out there. Plenty of room. We're neutral. It never stopped anyone doing mercenary work. It's yours, if you can find a use for it. Fett thought the Besulik was a work of art. But the Trocod... There was no other word for it but a brute. He'd seen one test flying in the last couple of weeks, and grace wasn't the first word that sprang to mind. But the slab sides and maneuverability, now those were handy. Fett could see himself using the vessel to insert troops into high buildings, hatch flat against a window or a hole in the wall, or provide close air cover to troops on the ground. He climbed up on the hull and stood on a turret turntable. The ship was a twenty-meter slab of Beskar plate with a cannon turret on each corner, topside, and lower hull, and rotating modular weapon platforms on the top. Fett did a few mental calculations and worked out that the ship had completely overlapping arcs of fire. It had no blind spots. Nobody was going to surprise it. And the Verpine didn't want a joint deal on this? It's all old tech, said Yomaget. No advantage to them, but ideal for us. One of the top hatches flipped open, and Baltan Carid's head emerged, plastered with a satisfied grin. I hope you're not claustrophobic, Fett. Get in. Fett squeezed through the hatch, and dropped into a cramped compartment packed with machinery. There were pipes, hatches, and hand wheels everywhere, as if the interior had been taken from an old holodrama. On the port side, light spilled from an open inboard hatch, along with a faint metallic sound like someone spinning a handle. When Fett stuck his head through the opening, his assessment was spot on. Ram Zeramar the sniper he'd first met when Corellia had been keen to hire Fett's elite Ori Ramakade, 
super commandos, was turning gear wheels to aim one of the cannons, winding frantically. He came to a sudden halt, as if he'd hit an end stop and checked a gauge. Keeps you fit, Mondalore, he said. Just seeing how fast we can acquire a target. Carried pointed to more hand wheels and valves. See? The whole ship can operate on zero power for a while, if everything goes to OSIC. If we are fried, all the critical systems can be operated manually by gear wheels, cables, or compressed gas. We've even got zero-power fiber-optic screens that kick in so we can aim or see what's going on topside. Okay, it's hard labor, but this is a real beauty for getting out of trouble. He winked. Or causing it. Fett squeezed into alcoves and peered down a hatch that went straight through the belly of the trocot, good for defended troop extractions. It was a perfect ship for a pessimist, or a very unlucky man. Would have been good to have this when we fought the Vong. Denua's mother might have survived. Fett wondered if Denua thought about her mother as much as he thought about his dad. How many crew? One pilot can fly it in an emergency, and from various positions in the ship. Crew? Five. How many bodies can you cram in? Haven't tested that yet. Next one will have waterborne capability. Another multi-mission vehicle, Fett said. Yomaget squeezed in behind him. He was a man obsessed with making vessels that could do everything. It was a very Mandalorian attitude, wanting to be self-contained and ready for anything the galaxy threw at you, a kind of frontier mentality. What's the compromise? Speed. Okay. Next chance we get, let's give her a workup. Fett hauled himself out of the top hatch and found that he was already thinking of ways to exploit the zero-power capability. You didn't have to be dead in the water to make use of that. Ambush. Beauty wasn't everything. A vevine skittered across the floor, a high-speed scrap of tan fur that triggered Fett's HUD sensors. The small rodents were also enjoying a prosperous time, gorging on the new fields of crops. Everyone was doing better. When Fett walked out of the rear hangar doors, he could see a snaking line of dark soil, excavations to lay a water pipeline to the new settlement five kilometers south. Being Mondo, they were digging wells, too, Raitlini, just in case. A plan B. So you paid for all that, too, Yomaget. The Mandel Motors boss stood beside him, and took electro-binoculars from his belt. Yeah, I ship in food for the workforce, too. Farm output isn't keeping pace with the incoming settlers. It'll catch up in time. Fett was fascinated by the way that Mandalorians, who liked credits as much as any species in the galaxy, needed no law to make them share what they had with the community when times were good. It was a survival trait. It didn't come naturally to Fett, but he'd finally learned it. If Jaina Solo tells me what barbarians we are, I'll show her all this. Fett fired up his speeder bike's drive. Time for me to continue her higher education. He was glad that Bevin had been willing to take her off his hands for a day. It gave him breathing space, something he needed with Sintas around. Myrta seemed to expect him to sit patiently by the bedside, but there was nothing he could usefully do. He could tell Sintas her life story, minus the years he hadn't been around, most of them, but it wasn't going to aid her recovery. What if the Jedi could heal her? Fett did most of his thinking on the speeder now. If he retreated to Slave One— Laid up on spare land next to his drying shed quarters, folks came by wanting to ask him things. If he was moving, they couldn't. 
and there was something therapeutic about just swinging onto the saddle and heading randomly into the wilderness, the same as setting Slave One on a course and heading for the Outer Rim. They could still calm him via his helmet link, though. The amber icon pulsed in his HUD, and he blinked to activate it. Been a long time, Fett. It was a smoky patrician voice, one that got his attention a heartbeat before he put a name to it. Twelve years, more or less. She always resurfaced sooner or later. Admiral, he said, always a pleasure. So you're not dead, and I'm not dead. She rarely had jobs for him, but when she did... They were always interesting. Want to add a Besulik to your collection? You're so commercial, Fett. Well, good, honest mercenary work. That didn't quite offer the relief of filling his time the way it used to. He'd have been reassured by the offer before. Confirmation that he was on top of his game and in demand. Dalla was still A-list clientele, but old habits died hard. Maybe. What is it? Jason Solo. Uh-huh. I heard about your daughter. What's he done to you? Wouldn't have thought he was in your circle. I'm back with the Imperial Remnant, she said. Well, that would make every moth's day, Fett thought. He almost smiled. For how long? Depends. Gil Pelion's on his way back up to Solo at Fondor. I take it you know there's going to be a fleet action there. I have my sources. Want to help me out with your hundred finest? Depends what you want to do. Stand by, team. I'd like you backing me up, for old time's sake. I'm there in the wings in case things go badly for Pelion. The moths, of course, can rot. And so can the G.A. But Sintas is here. And Jaina Solo. Fett was quietly appalled at the thought. He'd never had to worry about things like that in his life. He had always been able to go where he wanted and do whatever paid him best because there was nobody else in his life, not even peripherally. Fed, are you there? Is it a fee issue? I can still pay. Just thinking. My ex-wife was found alive. Now it was Dalla's turn to fall silent. I'm glad for you, she said eventually. It's not like that, Dalla. He reacted without thinking farther. Job. Business. You're in control here. Okay. Maybe not a hundred, but I'll show with some handy hardware. Send me the data. I'll need you in the next twenty-four hours. Fearfeck. Deal. Usual terms. Fett parked by the main entrance to Bevin's farm, still working out how he was going to handle the logistics. Nothing more. Thinking about the emotional wreckage was one step too far today. When the doors parted, the big main room where all the cooking and eating and holy alien family stuff happened was like the arena at Geonosis exposed to attacks from all sides. Myrta and Jaina sat at the battered wooden table with Sintas between them. Bevin and Medrit both had their boots up on the bench, arms folded, chatting idly. They all stopped and looked at him. The urge to retreat was almost too much. You're seventy-one. You can't keep running from this. Fett took off his helmet and nodded at Sintas, even though she couldn't see him. Sin, he said, completely automatically. 
It was her pet name. He hadn't used it in decades. It ambushed him, but he blundered right on, hoping she didn't notice. How are you doing today? You're Boba Fett, she said. Yeah. Here we go. The wheels are about to come off. He glanced at Jaina, because it was easier than looking at Myrta right then. So you remember. You told me a day ago. Or whenever. She looked okay. She looked great, in fact. But then she always did. The heart of fire necklace hung around her neck. I lost track of the last few days. But I'm not forgetting the things people tell me right away. She pushed her chair back and stood up, tottering a little feeling her way along the backs of chairs and around the table toward him. Myrta jumped up to guide her. Bevin and Medrit scrambled to get their legs out of the way. She managed to walk right up to Fett and grabbed him by his biceps as she almost fell against him. Well, you wear armor. Fett could think of nothing except to deal with it as he dealt with combat. He followed the first impulse that came into his head. Do you remember what I did to you? Sintas stared up into his face. No. All I know is that you found me, after a long, long time. And that means you're not going to look like I'd remember anyway. He couldn't wait for the axe to fall any longer. We split up, Sin. A year or two after Aelin was born. I'm sorry. Sintas had always been tough. She was a bounty hunter for Fearfect's sake. She could take a lot in her stride. She was going to have to live the rest of her life, starting now. Lying to her was a lousy way to begin it. She frowned a little, creasing the top of her nose. But you still came to rescue me, she said at last. You can't be all that bad. Fett had to switch off or run. He looked to Bevin, who always hauled him out of the mire at times like this, and got a discreet thumb gesture to step outside. Myrta caught Sintas's arm and sat her down. Jaina followed Bevin outside, as if this mess was any of her Jedi business. Bobica? Sintas can remember things from the time she was revived, Bevin said quietly. She's got nothing from before then, although she knows she's from Kifu and that she had a daughter. Jaina thinks... What do you think, Jaina? Fett asked. Come on, share that Jedi wisdom. I'm just trying to help, she said, taking a step back, hands spread. My dad went through this, remember? Mom talked about how bad he was. I do recall, funnily enough. Okay, I'm sorry. I just think someone could help her, at least restore her sight, give her a chance to start again, and not be dependent on... Me? Anyone. Bevin stepped in. At least hear her out. Jaina might be able to find her a Jedi healer. Someone who's good at it. Jaina flinched as if she was expecting Fett to erupt. But maybe she sensed the way his gut twisted at the dilemma. If Sintas got her memories back, if he just filled in the gaps for her, she had terrible things to relive. But how could he not try? What would she be if she was forced to live like this? It's early days. She might get better anyway, so why is it such a big deal for me? Do I want to keep her this way for the rest of her life like some sick pet? It's me who's avoiding it, he said at last. There's no easy way. She's got a family, even if I'm not part of it, and she has to have her whole life back, even the painful bits. 
Get your healer, Jaina. Jaina didn't say anything and went back into the house. Bevin just waited, hands on hips, looking disappointed. You won't think so highly of your precious Mandalore when you find out what I did to her, Fett said. Bevin shrugged. You can tell me when you're ready. I've got a job to do anyway. Tomorrow. Dala called. Needs some backup for Pelion at Fondor. Shob! Bevin looked angry now. It was rare for him to react that way. She comes out of the woodwork now? Great timing. Go on, we'll sort out Sintas. Go! Go, Ron. Stay with her. Will you? It was obvious Bevin would rather have gone on the mission. Okay. I'm not blind. You think I'm running away from it. Does that matter? Yes. Bevin was about the only man whose respect Fett would regret losing. Your opinion matters. Okay, then you get back in that room, and you tell Myrta and Sintas that you're off fighting tomorrow, and you tell Jaina that her brother is in the lineup. Shab, Bobica! The Imperials are on Jason Solo's team now. The only reason I can think of for fronting up would be if you plan to take a crack at him. Am I right? Fett steeled himself to go back into the room. He hadn't thought it through that far. I won't be cheering him on, that's for sure. Myrta's voice made Fett start. I heard all that, you shabuir. She stalked up to him and shoved him hard in the chest. Don't you ever learn? And if you're going after Jason Solo, I'm going too. For my mother. And what about Jaina? Your best buddies now. She's been here a few days. We talked this morning about Mama, about having family members we want to love, but who make it pretty well impossible for us. Fett could calm Dalla and tell her to forget it. But he'd said he'd do the job. He gave his word. And while he couldn't change the past, he could see now who he needed to ally with to change the future. Maybe the Jedi wants to come, too he said. It'll be good training for when she has to do it for real. You happy, Myrta? Fett rarely used her name. He wanted to love her, too, but he didn't know where to start loving anyone. She could at least manage to love Orade. It made him feel relieved that she could, and that might just have been because he cared about her. You think that's the best compromise? Just do it, she said. Fett walked back into the room. It was going to be a long day, and he'd take it a piece at a time. Now wasn't the time to tell Sintas he might be in battle against the man who killed her daughter tomorrow. That could wait until he got back, assuming he did. Myrta took Sintas back to her room and Medrit went to sit with her while Fett faced Jaina. Okay, Solo, he said, standing over her at the table. She looked a different woman from the one who had strolled into Keldabe just days ago, not disoriented or resentful, as he thought she might be by now, but with the expression of someone who was struggling to follow a complex explanation, watching faces intently for clues. Got a training exercise for you. Tomorrow we might pay your brother a visit. On the front line. Captain's Day Cabin, Anakin Solo, off Fondor. If I were them, I'd have blown me out of the sky by now. While Kytus waited for Neothel's task force to show... He used the time to gather force impressions of the Fondorian defenses. They were waiting. He could wait, too. 
I'm not omnipotent. I have to understand my limits. I still need people to carry out my plans. There was nothing moving between the planet and the orbital yards now, not even routine shuttle traffic. But that was to be expected if they were battened down against an imminent attack. And there was no sign of the Fondorian fleet. They'll come out of hyperspace. They had a warning, like they had warning of the mine layers. So they jumped. And they'd be back when it was most inconvenient. But he'd be ready. He thought he could sense a great flurry of hyperspace activity, like the pressure he would often feel behind his eyes in the hours before a thunderstorm. There was movement out there, far more than just the elements of the Third Fleet or Pelion's Imperials converging on this position. And she has to go. Neothel. The leaked intelligence had to be one of Neothel's cronies. None of his own crew would be so careless or treacherous. It had to be one of her own Cal or Quarren buddies undermining him to shake his crew's faith in him, or even set him up for a defeat that would enable Neothel to take sole control. Index, Admiral. I just have to work out the least damaging way to get you out of my hair. Kytus still expected her to try to oust him every time he left Coruscant, but she never had. Either she wanted the war won before she moved in to take credit for it, or she was waiting for him to get killed. That's your single biggest mistake. If you'd seized soul power in my absence, I'd have had a hard time retaking Coruscant. Not hard militarily, but a counterattack on my own capital, on top of the fragile recovery from the last war. No, Coruscant wouldn't recover psychologically from that. It's the heart of my new empire. I need that heart unbroken. Neothel was a fleet officer to her core. She could never think like a galactic leader. She'd want to do things by the naval rules riveted deep in her psyche, to engage him from the bridge of a battleship, as if that somehow sanctified her actions. Her and Pelion both. He trusted neither. They went along with him because the pressure from beneath them, the rank and file, the moths, the crews, kept them from openly opposing him. Tebot. Yes, I wish I had done things differently. Was her destiny to show me that a Sith's true anger is meant for larger targets? I have to think she had a purpose. I set out on this path for all the Tebuts in the galaxy, the mass of ordinary beings crushed by the badly used power of a handful. I'd never waste a life like that, would I? Kytus had dreaded discovering that he might be sliding down his grandfather's disastrous path. Every day, though, he saw confirmation that he wasn't. There had been plenty killed like Tebut in Vader's day, people said. Not just one shocking act. But Vader had been crippled by love and his command tainted by a demented fool of an emperor. In Kytus's here and now, there was neither distracting love nor any higher authority stifling him. Yes. Tebut's death had been a wake-up call from the Force. He was sure of that. Death? Say it. I killed her. Face it. Learn from it. The past couldn't be changed, just observed. Watching history was pointless unless lessons were learned from it and used to shape what could be changed. The next moment and the next. Because that was all the future was. A series of decisions taken differently. 
Tahiri hadn't quite accepted that. Even if her rational mind told her Anakin was gone forever, and that each backward glance paralyzed her life in the present. But he would wean her off that dependency on regret for her own sake, as much as for his. Neothal is coming. It's not a threat. It's an opportunity. How do I take the chance that's offered to me? What have I learned? In any war, officers died too. He would recognize the chance when he saw it. No need to alienate Neothal's crews by making her look a martyr. I need them on my side. I can't do it all on my own, and fear doesn't keep order forever. Sir? Tahiri's voice filtered through. He'd known she was approaching. He was sure, he thought, but let it wash over him. Yes, Tahiri. Something's bothering me. If it was about Anakin, he'd be disappointed. She appeared like a sharp edge in the force sometimes. Go ahead. When the awful arrives, how can this assault possibly work? How are you going to be able to continue working with her after this? Not Anakin, then. The future. Good. That's rhetorical. No. Tahiri seemed to be making an active effort to learn as much as she could on this mission. I don't understand what options are open to you. You can't get rid of her. Why? Even you can't control the whole fleet all the time every day, because even a Sith has finite time. So you need as many loyal officers as you can get. If anything happens to Neothal, they'll worry that nobody's safe from you. You're impressing me these days, Tahiri. And you'll want my job. And there I was worrying where I might find a worthy replacement for Ben Skywalker. I think Neothal is going to make a mistake. I'm just giving her the proverbial cord with which to hang herself. Tahiri looked as if she were chewing the words and then digesting them, but not enjoying the taste. The landings on the orbital yards... The assault force commanders are getting anxious. I can hear them on the bridge conlinks nagging Captain Neville. They need the reassurance of times and coordinates. I can't give them that yet. But they have intelligence on the layout of the yards, don't they? Kaidas thought of Neville. Given that he'd flung his captain against a bulkhead in the Tebot incident and wondered just how low he'd sunk in the Quarren's estimation. He'd have to get Neville back on his side. And Neville is reassuring them? Yes. It's just nerves. Okay, sir. Tell you what, Tahiri, Kaidas said, remembering the Jason Solo who could get a whole hangar deck of troops cheering him. I'll show them that I'm not sitting here in comfort filing my nails. Kaidas opened the locker hatch where his flight suit and other abandoned working kit was stowed. He used to look like one of his own troops. It was time to restore that comforting symbol for this task force. He slipped his black cloak off his shoulders and pulled his flight coveralls over his pants and tunic. Kaidas pressed the desk comlink. Delta hanger, ready my stealth X, please. Tahiri looked as if she was expecting to follow. Just a sortie, to get a closer look. I know the kind of things they say on the Mestex. Commanders who hang too far back from the front line get awarded the Coruscant Star by the ranks. I don't want them giving me that decoration. Ever. Neothal's estimated time on station was one hour. 
That was ample to check out at least a couple of Fondor's orbitals. As Kytus made his way through the destroyer's hatches and passages, he picked up the mood of crew members, their lack of confidence, their uncertainty, and he suppressed the anger that threatened to well up. On the hangar deck, the ground technicians seemed puzzled. Make them believe by succeeding. You used to inspire them. It takes time to build a reputation, but a second to lose it. It was just a second, just a slip, just a lesson. Time I did a recce, Kytus said, blending back into their language and community. I'll never ask anyone to do what I'm not prepared to do myself. The stealth X dropped out of the hatch into the void and hyper-jumped for the orbitals. When it fell out into real space moments later, and within striking distance of Fondor, it was just a small black patch of undetectable nothing that blotted out stars, so vivid, so stark from space, for an instant as it passed. Sometimes Kytus wondered if this was what it felt like to be a ghost, seeing everything so clearly, yet not being seen. As he streaked high over the first orbital, a metallic arrowhead kilometers long, he could see the outlines of star destroyers flanked by buildings, cranes, and webs of pipes and cables. His senses told him that living beings huddled down there waiting for an attack. Around the curve of the planet, the next orbital ahead was oriented head-on, a slab with structures extending from top and bottom. It resolved into an industrial city as he passed above it. He could observe at his leisure. Again, a workforce waited for the worst, radiating anxiety and aggression in the force. And everywhere, on orbitals and planets, Kytus felt weapons and vessels ready to repel him. Fondor was small in galactic terms, but the whole planet was a dockyard with billions of staff. It had to be the G.A.'s asset again, or it had to be put out of action. I really wouldn't trust the Imperial Remnant to play nicely with this toy. The Moths had Borlias and Bilbringi. They'd be kept busy admiring those baubles for a while, giving Kytus time to restore stability and remove any temptation to step in and impose their own kind of order, just to be helpful. For a moment, Kytus thought he could feel familiar presences in the Force. But the sensation passed. It was replaced by his Sith battle awareness of his captains and commanders, a living grid of interconnected reactions that tilted, panned, and zoomed like a holochart marked with transponder icons. Kytus had a better picture of the theater of war than instruments could give them, he knew. It was a hard act of faith for them to surrender judgment to something so nebulous. Something blipped in his field of vision and was gone again. Maybe it had never been there. That was a drawback with battle awareness. The more he could see with the technique, the more detailed it became, and the harder it was sometimes to separate the images in his inner eye from what he could physically see. The orbitals he managed to observe before running short on time were packed with ships, many looking as if they were near the final phase of construction, and more than he'd ever realized Fondor had in build. This wasn't just a symbolically important planet to bring into line. It was a legitimate target. It would have been so much simpler with the mine network in place. He hyper-jumped briefly to bring him closer to his flagship. The technique alarmed non-Jedi X-Wing pilots. They once said he'd fall out of hyperspace smack into the hull of an SSD one day if he kept bouncing around blind like that. But Kytus knew instinctively where he was in three dimensions, and even in the higher ones. He knew. There. He was back in real space, and the Anakin Solo was visible in a constellation of frigates, cruisers, landing craft, carriers, and ten star destroyers. 
Neofel's Third Fleet, a task force, but it was convenient to think of them in separate fleet terms, because they were not all one happy navy, not by a long shot, would need to keep the planet's defenses occupied while he captured the orbitals. The Imperial Remnant would need to prowl the outer boundary, alert for the return of the Fondorian navy. Kaidas felt he'd planned it well enough. Even the awful's outburst and insistence on rushing here to show him how to do it properly— fell elegantly into the battle plan. He substituted Neothel for the mine net. Kytus reached out to his commanders and spread a little genuine confidence that things would work out fine. Neville. He could focus in on Neville, and the man was deeply troubled. Oh, yes. His son was killed. I forget that. It was an unhappy mind and Kytus moved on, concentrating on the threatening storm pressing on his sinuses, the vague sensation in the force that told him ships were out there massing somewhere, and the awful should have been dropping out of space just about now. He looked around for the blooms of light as ships reappeared in real space. As he slowed his approach, he caught the shooting star effect in his peripheral vision and rolled the stealth X slowly to look around. Yes, the third fleet was on time. The fleet gradually built up, star by artificial star, into a ragged constellation of navigation lights and harshly sunlit surfaces. Early warning systems on Fondor would have detected the emerging fleet by now. They could still surrender. He'd go through the motions, but only to check the boxes. If they did surrender, he'd still have to occupy the planet for a period anyway, just to make sure it stayed that way. That devoured more resources. There was still the Fondorian Navy to account for, though. He felt it out there. It was in hyperspace, and his awareness was nothing like the one he had in normal space. There was no real size or scope to guide him, just an impression a little more solid than a hunch. Now it was time to face Neofel. He flicked open the comlink, perfectly secure this close to the ship. Stealth X's almost always operated in complete calm silence, and nobody could monitor them without big clues like an open channel. The fighters really did vanish. Solo to Neville. The third is on station. Patch me through to ocean. She would be... No. Kytus had jerked the stealth X ninety degrees to starboard before his retina, fractionally slower than four senses, registered a slab of ship filling his vision. And it wasn't the Anakin. He righted himself relative to the assembled fleet, but he was suddenly overwhelmed ships popping into existence all around him in a complete 360-degree ring. Wherever he turned the stealth X, he was facing the spars and sensor masts and patchworked hatches of warships. Cannon turrets. He couldn't identify the type, the navy, anything. It was a fleet from another time and place. He could feel the ships, but he had no impression of lethal, implacable mass. His passive sensors showed static, as if he'd been hit by an EM pulse that hadn't tripped the warning. He sensed danger, though, a real threat. Kytus did what any pilot would, and signaled a warning as best he could, trying to work out what he had fallen into. Admiral Neofel's flagship, Ocean, off Fondor Jason Solo's open comlink spewed uncharacteristically loud chaos onto Neofel's calm bridge. Enemy vessels, I repeat, enemy vessels. Estimate five destroyers, type unknown, twenty light cruisers, no, fifteen, range five hundred. She stared at her chart repeaters. Nothing. Just the ships she hoped and expected to find. The third and fourth fleet components. She looked up searching for a simple explanation, and the electronic warfare control section, all ten officers, 
was staring back at her as one bemused being, equally dumbfounded, screens visibly devoid of frantic, blinking, unidentified icons, even from her position. One officer suddenly swung back to her screen and started punching in code. Nobody else said a word. Everyone with a sensor or screen was searching, cross-checking, looking to see what they'd missed and what bedlam was unfolding out there. Had the hyperjump disrupted all their calibration? Were they about to be vaporized? What is that man doing? Neofel was genuinely thrown, wondering if she might have interrupted him on some morale-boosting dry-run pre-attack. That was the kind of irrational, mystic stuff he'd do at a time like this. Colonel Solo, this is Ocean. We do not see the targets. Repeat, we do not see the targets. The officer of the watch and his juniors were at the forward view screen, physically searching through the transparisteel for whatever Jason could detect, but they couldn't. There was only so much a lookout could spot with the unaided eye against a star field and from this position in the ship. But given what Jason was calling in, they should have been able to see activity and the glitter of faceted surfaces bouncing raw sunlight back at them. And Jason's voice, impressively calm, Neothel had to give him that, continued to fill the bridge, transmitting approximated ranges and positions relative to his own. I've got him, ma'am, said the EWO, who'd been tapping at her console. I've mapped his comlink signal onto the holochart. Watch the purple trace. It was just a blob of violet light set a little way apart from an orderly pattern of blue transponder markers. The blue markers were in two distinct formations, pennant codes valid, showing two GA task forces. The violet light, Jason Solo's Stealth X, was racing across the holochart jinking and looping as if it were navigating through a congested space lane and avoiding bigger vessels. Neofel's initial shock, which had set her blood pumping hard enough to hear in her ears, was ebbing into disbelief and a different kind of worry. She glanced down at the comlink panel. Jason was patched through to her and to the Anakin Solo's bridge. Okay. Let's share your unique Sith insight, shall we, Colonel? She flicked a key, and the voice channel went to every bridge comlink in the two fleets. Ma'am, confirmed zero contacts. The EWO seemed to hesitate, as if saying what was now on the awful's mind, and probably everyone else's, was a little rude. There's nothing out there— Unless someone has cloaking technology we don't know about, and Colonel Solo is able to see past it, being a Jedi and all that. It was an outside chance, Neofel knew. Just to be on the safe side, she turned to the weapons officer. Bargas, lob the smallest torp you've got at one of those coordinates the Colonel gave, will you? She said. See if we hit anything solid. Very good, ma'am. Bargas had a chart full of phantom targets to choose from. He keyed in a course with nothing to lock onto and issued the standard warning across the task force. Stand by, stand by, all vessels. Live weapon, test firing, bearing and course. That in five standard seconds. And torpedo away. They waited. The torpedo's sensor trace tracked steadily across the screen. It passed the projected impact point and carried on going. And going. It looked like it would make it to Bestine in a few years, unimpeded by any mystery target. Maybe it's moved, Bargas said, struggling to keep a straight face. It wasn't humor. It was nerve-fraying anxiety not about an invisible enemy, but about a commander who was behaving irrationally. Whoa, he's lost it, said a whispered voice behind the awful, barely audible. Told you he'd flipped when he did that to Tebut. Jason was still transmitting, calm, but definitely confused. 
and a consolo. I have lost visual. There was a pause. Very good, sir. And the consolo respond. Did you confirm my visual? Anything? Negative, sir. One final visual check and returning to ship. It was so silent on the bridge that Neafel could hear the collective unk of humans swallowing after holding their breath for a while. The whole episode had been played out live to the fleet. Everyone had heard how JCOS-2, Joint Chief of State No. 2, as Jason was known in memos, had been chasing ghosts. If they hadn't heard it live, the utterly reliable Fleet Scuttlebutt service would provide highlights for them for years to come. Neothel checked her chrono and the time codes on the signals. The bizarre incident had run for a little under eight standard minutes. She judged that the time was right. Anakin Solo, this is Ocean. Get me Captain Neville. Now. Neville must have been right next to the comm station. Neofel hardly had time to blink. She didn't even need to pose a question before he answered it. He did a fine job of sounding as if they hadn't spoken in months. Ma'am, we're no wiser than you are about what happened. Tell me this was some ill-timed readiness drill, Captain. I can't, ma'am. Great gods of the waters! Is Solo insane? Her comlink was still transmitting to all bridges. She had a valid reason for doing that. If the threat really had been a cloaked fleet. But it was much more about enabling a bloodless coup. The ship's companies and their officers could now make up their own minds about which commander they would prefer to follow into a tight corner. I know he doesn't drink liquor. Ma'am, when Colonel Solo is available, I shall tell him you wish to talk to him. Most kind, Captain. Neofel smoothed her jacket. With the feeling of having found a thousand denomination cash cred in the street, she had paraded her contempt for Jason across the task force, and Neville had been seen as loyally supporting his superior officer. Honor was satisfied. All vessels, stand defense watches. She stepped down from the slightly raised dais that spanned the deck and paused. And if anyone doesn't spot anything that isn't there, don't hesitate not to tell me. A ripple of laughter ran around the bridge. Even though a battle was still imminent, the tension dropped a good few notches. She stepped into her day cabin and leaned back against the bulkhead, eyes closed for a moment, before calming Neville. Captain Neville, she said. Sorry about that. Thank you for sounding suitably non-committal. I just want you to know you're not alone. Chapter 12 Could I have stopped all this? If I'd told Calomus right at the start to let Corellia go its own way, would we be here now? Trying to force every Alliance world to pool its defense forces was a principle— we didn't actually have an external threat to face, but we created one. And if another enemy like the Yuzhan Vong had ever shown up, I'm certain that Corellians would have come running to defend the galaxy anyway, like they always have. Luke Skywalker to Han Solo Fifty kilometers outside Fleet Assembly Area, near Fondor. Kytus fumed. He was no fool. He wasn't mad— and he had explored more arcane force techniques than any member of the Jedi Council. He did not fall prey to tricks. But even if that phantom fleet had been a trick, and not some freak phenomenon thrown up by physics beyond his grasp, then who was creating it? He took one long loop around the area in the Stealth X. Kytus wasn't checking to make sure he hadn't missed any more humiliatingly non-existent ships— he was scouting for the source of the illusion, and it was an illusion. Yes, 
That was much, much more likely than the laws of the universe having a bad day. He'd pulled off some remarkably convincing tricks himself. He'd hidden Lumia right under Luke's nose. Literally. He'd also been caught up in manufactured illusions, and he could still feel the apparent reality of Lumia's conjured world in her asteroid habitat. Neothel, mundane rule-follower that she was, had simply tested reality by firing a torpedo, her mind unencumbered by any Hall of Mirrors thinking that would make her question if the torpedo failing to hit anything was also part of the same elaborate convincing construction. But I'm a Sith Lord. I should be beyond this. I should be anticipating these strikes against me. It had to be one of the renegade Jedi. Lumia was dead. Who else might be able to fool him? Ben? No. Ben had his skills, like vanishing in the Force, but he thought in honest, plain lines, channeling his Force power into extensions of ordinary talents, like smashing down doors, locating explosives, and blinding surveillance holocams. Two burly CSF officers and a sniffer ack could do that so it would be one of the usual suspects. Luke, probably, or maybe Zek, because it wasn't his mother's or his sister's style. Where were they? How far could Luke extend his powers? And why couldn't anyone else see it? Illusions could be made visible to many people, so it was designed to disturb him and him alone, not to lure his ships into shooting and whatever might result from that. Kytus could feel nothing beyond a distant sense that there were still Jedi in the Force, much the way the lights of a city were a constant and unnoticed backdrop until they went out. He was chasing phantoms again. That was what they wanted. He had to focus, swallow his anger, and avoid being provoked. The crew of the Anakin Solo had already heard him make a complete fool of himself. He'd have to work on restoring his infallible image. Luke. After Neothel, before order being restored, he had to do something about Luke. Perhaps Luke would have the common sense of the last remaining Jedi after Palpatine's purge and go into exile. Ahead of Kytus, an auxiliary vessel was hooking up to a cruiser to replenish supplies via a long tube-like tunnel, proof of how rapidly some of the Third Fleet had slipped their berths. They were catching up on routine tasks that would have normally been completed alongside. The Imperials would have brought forward their embarkation, too. As soon as they showed up, they could get this over with. Occupying Fondor wasn't an option. No. It would turn into Corellia, but worse. Worlds looked at Corellia, bruised but still confederate, and might even be emboldened enough by the cocky defiance to try to emulate it. Fondor might do that while tying up hundreds of thousands of troops and their vessels. Kytus intended to make an example of Fondor, the sort that said, Don't try this again. Torching Kashyyyk should have announced that, but the human majority on many planets probably took more notice of what happened to their own related species in nice clean cities. He was among the scattered ships now. The light level in his cockpit, the light from the distant sun at his back, dipped slightly. He couldn't see anything on his instruments. He couldn't feel anything near him beyond the general oppressive weight of warships preparing for battle. Remember what happened last time. Kytus wouldn't be caught twice. If he leaned slightly to one side, the reflection at his six often appeared on the viewscreen in front of him. He shifted in his seat. But there was nothing. If I jump at every shadow now, he's got me. Ludicrous. The next moment, the shank of tearing fiberplast vibrated through the airframe and his chest, and he was flung to port, spinning out of control. 
something had hit him. He hadn't clipped anything through careless flying. He was too experienced, too good. He punched the stealth X into a short burn to stop the roll, and peeled away under the ships to put some distance between him and whatever had rammed him. Obviously, he couldn't see it. No point sending a distress signal. This wasn't something to share with the fleet again. He accelerated, trying to get some edge, looking for what wasn't there. Stars. He was straining to find a dark area of obscured stars— the only way he could spot a fighter that was as camouflaged and undetectable as his own. I've been hunted by a stealth X before, Luke. You think I'm stupid? If he couldn't see Luke, he would maneuver where Luke couldn't detect him. He wasn't going to get in the same position of not being able to use his cannon as he had with Mara. He'd risk being hit by fragments. He didn't have far to run for help, if he got a slow decompression. This time, he'd use what he'd learned. For the first time, though, he began to wonder if it was Luke out there. Ben? Kytus hadn't felt anyone. Luke, he could always sense Luke. But Ben had taken to force hiding instantly. Mara had managed it for critical moments and nearly killed him. But this smacked of Ben. Bang! Something clipped him from underneath the fuselage this time, shaking his teeth. He corrected course. He didn't need instruments to tell him he had a breach somewhere. When he looped again, he caught sight of a thin trail of escaping vapor or fluid, probably coolant. Stealth axes had traded shielding for sensor negation. They still had pretty tough skins in collisions— but hitting another vessel at these speeds normally tore off parts and ended unhappily. This was incredibly precise wingtip ramming, or staggering luck twice in a row, and he was no longer undetectable. He had a vapor trail. He opened a comm channel. There was no point trying for a meld, after all. The Stealth X's comm system had seen more use today than it had in its entire service history. Face me, and let's finish it, he said. Ben or Luke? If it's Luke, then he's got new tricks. It could even be Jaina, if Ben's teaching everyone to shut down in the force. I don't care. Come about and head for the orbitals, said Luke's voice. You'll make it. Then land, and we'll talk. Kytus headed for the Anakin, wondering just how far Luke would go to force him to land. The odds were different now. This wasn't like Cavan. Kytus had a fleet right next door. Aren't you going to open fire? There was a flash of blackness in the cockpit as the pursuing vessel blocked the sun for a moment. Luke's presence faded back into the forest like a sunrise. If I wanted to kill you— I could have done it several times over by now. You think a stern talking to, deep programming, and the love of a good family will put me right again? I'm prepared to try. You'd be amazed. Kytus was drawing Luke deeper into the fleet assembly area. Luke seemed to be simply hanging a wing breath off his tail, a suicidal tactic for anyone else. You're going to have to shoot me down to stop me, said Kytus. I always learn from history. Try. Ah! Kytus struggled to correct the stealth X as the damaged starboard wing cannon broke away. The escaping vapor was speckled with round droplets now. Did you do that? Chunk! The port cannon ripped free. You could retaliate, said Luke and we'll both end up dead. Come about and head back toward Fondor. Kytus was coming up on the fleet auxiliaries with their replenishment conduits strung between ships. If he could alert his anti-air batteries on the frigates, he could lead Luke's stealth X between them and trust to the gunner's timing. I'm not your father, Luke, and I don't need to be redeemed, said Kytus. Luke reacted. 
It stung him. And Kytus actually hadn't meant it to. He felt the flinch. Mara told me that about Lumia. The name made Kytus flinch this time. She was right, Luke. Pinpoints of light picked out maintenance pods moving over ship's hulls. Kytus was preparing for a feint and a dash into the Anakin's hangar bay now. Luke was too smart to mess around in the heart of the G.A. fleet. Neofel must have done a deal. Kytus was being herded toward something here. He was being set up. Luke hadn't mentioned Mara's death. Odd, he either had something worse planned for Kytus, or he didn't think he was responsible. The axe waiting to fall kept getting bigger. Fett hadn't come after him either, and if one thing was certain, it was that he would find a way of getting at him. But not this time. Luke's stealth axe nudged him again from behind. How? Kytus couldn't see. Force push? Something metallic inside the fuselage shrieked. He had a sense of someone rummaging furiously in the drives, as if looking for a dropped hydrospanner, throwing fragments into the coils. He's ripping the thing apart. Kytus tried to block Luke in the force, and suddenly got an idea of just how much power Luke could muster. His seat shot forward, sheared off the runners, tipped to one side, and he hit the console at an angle before he could buffer the collision with the force. Something cracked in his chest. Pain flared, stopped his breathing. Then he was aware of brilliant white light coming right at him. In the moments before he managed to veer off to starboard, almost blinded, he got a glimpse of a stealth X's uneven outline with two grappling arms extended, and the sense of a Jedi other than Luke. They'd tried to cripple the stealth X and grab him, airframe and all, right in the middle of the fleet. Brazen. Incredible. He'd never allow anyone but his own apprentice to fly a stealth X again, not even an ordinary pilot. Luke was still close behind, feeling as if he were actually leaning on his shoulder. Kytus switched to raw instinct. He looped around, weaving between cruisers spaced at regular intervals. Someone must have picked him up on visual by now, surely— and then maneuvered to line up the auxiliaries with the Anakin Solo, accelerating. He'd either hit it right, or he'd crash. But if the other stealth X tried to take him at this velocity from a head-on intercept, it'd rip them both apart. Kytus aimed right at the fleet auxiliary replenishing a landing craft. It was crewed by civilians, merchant fleet, non-combatants. It had only a light cannon for self-defense. The long connection tunnel was actually an airlock extender, a quick and easy way to transfer supplies without docking shuttles, and there'd be crew working in it. Luke was right on his tail. Smashing through it would damage the stealth axe badly, but it would rip the tunnel apart, and there'd be deaths. Let's see who blinks first. Kytus realized nobody could see any of the stealth axes, Whatever fluid he was losing had vented completely. The auxiliaries couldn't even pick them up on collision alarms. Do it. The Anakin Solo loomed behind it. Don't. Luke could see what he was doing all right. I'm past caring, said Kytus, lying. You'll peel off rather than risk clipping that. Killing workers, Kytus thought. I'll live with it. The orange tunnel rushed up to meet him faster than he expected, and he jerked the yoke back. Nothing snagged him. He didn't feel it, anyway. He couldn't look back, but he felt Luke's moment of horror at a near hit, buying him seconds that he needed to shoot underneath the Star Destroyer and come back along its length toward one of the hangar decks. Anakin Solo, emergency landing, damaged Stealth X-1-1, open five alpha hangar. He could have sworn he snapped off the tip of a comm mast. He was holding the fighter steady as much by the force as by its controls, and trying to slow it with the force as well, because the braking burn wasn't enough. He had to drop into that slot just right, 
or he'd take the section out with him. I could have activated the transponder, let them track me for the last few seconds, but I can't pinpoint the Jedi. Too late. Kytus stopped thinking and felt. He was breaking with everything he had. Coming out of the blackness of space, the hangar lights were sudden and blinding. And then he realized they were sparks. He was skidding across the hangar deck. The bulkhead filled his view. The arrestor baffle caught him. He was flung against what felt like a permacrete wall. As the lights around dimmed and he couldn't see through the canopy any longer, he had a foolish moment of thinking he was dying. No, you've done that. Doesn't feel like this. It was the automatic flame-retardant foam coating the fighter. The airframe was completely still. He wasn't lodged in a bulkhead. He inhaled sharply, cursed a broken rib, and set about trying to heal it, eyes closed while he waited for the fire party to decide he wasn't going to explode and crack the canopy from the outside. After a few moments, the light level increased. The foam was dispersing and the canopy opened. Sir, I hope your insurance covers this. Say the right thing. The Jason Solo thing. Show them you're not a madman. I swerved to avoid a Jedi, Kytus said. I didn't get his number. Give me a hand, will you? They were expecting him to rage at them for some imagined shortcoming, he could tell. He felt their relief as he climbed out of the cockpit and slipped on the remains of the foam. When he looked back, the stealth X was a mess. He was quite upset by that. Quick coat of paint, sir, and you'll never know she had a prang, the crash crew chief said. Med droids on the way. At least I know who generated the Phantom Fleet, Kytus said. This counter-rumor could zip around the fleet, too. Sane, humble, even humorous in adversity. Next time I try to chase Luke Skywalker's pranks, confiscate my pass card, will you? They laughed. Good old Colonel Solo, one of the team, not the one who killed junior officers at all. He controlled himself sufficiently to limp back to his day cabin via the bridge where he found that the Jedi illusion story had preceded him, and closed the hatch before letting the pent-up rage escape like steam. He looked in the mirror, a few cuts, and the eyes of a stranger, yellow, but eyes he was getting used to. He could channel anger now. He would save its focus and momentum to take out Fondor. G.A. Warship Ocean, Fleet Assembly Area, Off Fondor Neothel listened to the chatter on the bridge, calf in hand. He said the Jedi created a force illusion of a huge fleet, targeted solely at him, one of the signals officers said. Oh, Jedi, of course. The junior officer of the watch was glued to the sensor screen, but still managed to roll his eyes in mock realization. Don't you just hate it when that happens? Neothel believed it, but she was still waiting to hear it from Jason's own lips. The absence of the Fondorian fleet was troubling her. The first wave of the Imperial Remnant had dropped out of hyperspace, and she was waiting for a calm from Pelion. She had made up her mind. She would seek a surrender, and if Fondor declined talks, she would disable the defenses on the orbitals to allow the ground troops to land and secure them, one at a time, and then move on to begin precision attacks on the planet's fleet bases. There was no point creating a wasteland. And if, when, the Fondorian fleet reappeared, they'd have to get past Pelion, too. And then there was Jason Solo. Luke would have to learn to shoot to kill. He really would. She wondered if she would have fired if she'd had a lock on Jason. She imagined her fingers curled around the yoke of an X-wing, and her thumb depressing the button, and wasn't sure that she would. 
But what do you do with a Sith? What do you do to restrain a man who has powers like Luke Skywalker, but no rules, no moral limits? It was hard to see him as simply someone who believed in benign dictatorship, but whose law and order policy sometimes got out of hand. His otherness disturbed her. She could barely remember Palpatine's reign, just his image everywhere, and Vader at parades on the Holonews. Occasionally. But she hadn't known they were Sith. She didn't even know then that Jedi existed. When she studied history at school, she learned about the Sith-Jedi wars by rote, but now that she could actually put it in a personal context of individuals she worked with, it had taken on a whole new meaning. She was a little alarmed by both sides. The mind influence was the most corrosive realization she'd had. How much of what she'd done was purely of her own volition. Luke could even deceive Jason into fighting a fleet that wasn't there. No excuses. You knew what that leak to Luke would do. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't examine every urge you get to see if it's really your own. Ma'am, Admiral Pelion for you. The signals officer patched through the comm. Visual, too. Gil, you missed the warm-up act, she said. Pelion filled the holoscreen all immaculately trimmed white mustache and charcoal gray tunic. She saw the positive reaction of the crew. He exuded reliability. So I hear, Shaw. It's all rather quiet down there, isn't it? I won't say it. If they have a surprise for us, we might have to find one for them. Have you had a chance to peruse my new battle plan? I have. Pelion said. Will it survive contact with Colonel Solo? Pelion could always lighten the mood if he put his mind to it. Shall we see if he's recovered sufficiently to meet us? Neathal asked. Your flagship or mine? Or even his? I'll tell him Bloodfin. He wants to keep you happy. Half an hour. I'm very conscious of the lack of even a Fondorian patrol. A great deal was said in front of the more junior ranks, and in most cases it wasn't politic to hint at disagreement with other commanders. But Neothel was putting distance between herself and Jason, and she needed them to know it. If Luke had warned her that he was going to attempt a snatch, she might even have been able to help him. But he seemed reluctant to involve her. She wondered when he might next reappear. If he didn't, she would have to go ahead with a hasty plan that had crystallized on the inbound jump. She would relieve Jason of command, and order the Anakin back to base. The exact timing would depend on the progress of the operation, but it would be before the withdrawal to Coruscant. With Pelion, she had enough firepower to enforce it if she had to. A third of the ship's commanders in her task force were likely to support her, and few of the others would actively oppose her. It was still a major risk in the middle of a war, but waiting until the war was over wasn't an option. Tahiri Vela now appeared to be the gatekeeper for comms to Jason, at least when he was off the bridge. Lieutenant, is Colonel Solo well enough to transfer to Bloodfin for a senior staff session at 2200? He's well, Admiral. Tahiri paused, and the link went quiet as if she was consulting him. We'll be there. We. She'd fallen into a flag lieutenant role then. The more scurrilous members of the crew assumed she was a new romantic interest, but Neothel had watched the dynamics of how Jason behaved with Ben Skywalker, and it was much more a relationship of gang boss and junior henchman. Tahiri would be his fixer, messenger— and possibly even spy. Possibly? Definitely. Jason knew how to lead troops instinctively, but his true calling was political games master. What's the estimate on the Stealth X? Neothel asked. We're a little short of them until Incom deliver. 
You might have to slum it with X-Wings. Operational in 48 hours. The workshop's remounting cannons now. Cannibalizing, no doubt. Are you going to be flying combat? No, I have orders to liaise with the Imperial Remnant. Ah, spy. I was right. Later then, Lieutenant. Neothel would have consulted Jason on contact with the Fondorian president, Shas Vada, but time was short, and that was the excuse she would give him. She kept an eye on the chrono while contact was made with Vada's office, realizing for the first time that being Supreme Commander, as well as Joint Chief of State, was an awkward mix when making diplomatic contact. Being asked to rejoin the G.A. could never be called exploratory talks, when the request came from the senior commander of a task force on war footing. Chief of State, said Vada, this strikes me as a decision already taken in search of a retroactive justification. He was right. They were going through the motions. President Vada, I can only ask again that you agree to rejoin the Galactic Alliance and contribute to the common defense of the member worlds. Having just reached some kind of economic recovery after the Yuzhan Vong, and as our economy is substantially dependent on shipbuilding and the defense industry, we're under no illusion that we're seen as anything other than another handy fleet resource for the defense of Coruscant. He was awfully pious, for a leader of a world that strip-mined every moon, asteroid, and stray pebble in the Tapani sector. I'll give you until 2359 to put the request to your cabinet and respond formally to me. I can give you our answer now. Nevertheless, I feel obliged to allow you that time. It was a warning and sometimes the cold wind blowing from the brink did sober people up. The fleet would begin the attack any time after midnight. There was no advantage of surprise left for either side at this late stage. Noted, Chief of State. Remember that we're no use to you, broken. Maybe there was some room for maneuver. She'd keep an eye on that. Jason Solo, though, was going to be disappointed if he didn't get his chance to show what firm government meant. Ma'am, said the comms officer, there's some HNE mobile broadcast units straying into the area. We haven't declared an exclusion zone. Shall I issue a warning? Tell them they might well be in crossfire at any time. They take their chances. One has already requested an interview with Colonel Solo. Apparently he's given them clearance to accompany the troop landings on the first orbital. He'd better win, then, said Neothel, or he'll be taking prime airtime to advertise how to repeat our failures at Corellia. And if he did, he'd be doing it on his own. Crew Compartment of Trakad, Ori Ramakade RV Point, somewhere near the Tapani Sector, 2200 hours, awaiting orders from Admiral Dalla. Will your brother know when you're around? Mirtagev asked. Jaina almost stopped chewing. It was the first time that Myrta had mentioned Jason, and as she could only want lethal revenge on him for her mother's death, it showed either tact or tactics. Mondo women didn't do tact. Jaina took in another slab of Ujalai and used the silence enforced by chewing to gather her thoughts. The cake was like a solid mortar mix made from nuts, syrup, dried fruit, and spices, cloyingly sweet. It was as much exercise as nourishment. She worried that her teeth would collapse long before the rest of her. Yes, he probably will, she said and he'd be baffled by the impressions he got back, to say the least. We're twins. They say that even non-Force-sensitive twins are linked across distance somehow. With Jedi, it's real. 
except he disguises his force presence, so I'd never know he was around. Myrta had the same eyes as her grandfather. She looked as if she were permanently assessing the risk of something bad happening, and whether she could shoot it or sell it. You could always follow the trail of bodies, I suppose. It was going to happen sooner or later. What did you say to someone whose mother had died under your brother's interrogation? Sorry didn't quite cut it. Somehow the fact that Aelin Vell had been a bounty hunter and assassin, ostensibly hired to kill the Solo family, didn't give Jaina quite the fuel of righteous indignation that she imagined when she was face to face with the human wreckage scattered by those casual decisions. It's okay. Aelin was just going through the motions, using Dad to lure her own father to his death. She wasn't after us, really, and she was hired by Dad's cousin to assassinate us anyway. It's not as if he hadn't tried before. Families. Aren't they great? If there was anything I could do to atone for him, I'd do it, said Jaina. I'll do what I can to stop him doing it again. I'm sorry, by the way, but you know that. So it's true he killed your Aunt Mara. It was freshly shocking each time. Jaina still couldn't see him going that far. But then he'd tortured Ben, thinking he was doing him good. If he did anything, he might not have planned for it to go that badly wrong. Was there a real difference between sick and evil? I don't know, Myrta. Think he's capable of it? I don't know him anymore. I don't even know where to start. Myrta leaned her head back against the bulkhead, arms folded. There were a dozen troops in the Trakat assault vessel, Jaina and eleven Mandalorians in full armor, all waiting for the order from Admiral Dalla that might not actually come. The other ten were members of Fett's elite special forces, the Ori Ramakade, Super Commandos, the troops who'd saved Kalula Station and her parents from the Yuzhan Vong. It was a very tangled social web. It was also sobering to tally the net score of incidents and realize that the Solos had done more lasting harm to Fett than Fett had to them. Ali Torishia Taldin, Myrta muttered. What's that mean? Family is more than bloodline, meaning that families are about who raises and cares for you, not who your birth parents are. Or, put another way, your real relatives can treat you worse than Chakarish strangers. Jaina could work out the meaning. She wasn't picking up much of the language, though. Every Mandalorian seemed to be at least trilingual, basic, Mandoa, and Hatties and they spent a lot of time with their helmets on, talking among themselves. Whatever language the Ten Commandos were using on their helmet comlinks, Jaina was only aware of the body language, hand gestures, and head movements. It was an animated discussion, conducted in apparent silence. The effect was unnerving, as if they had senses that she didn't, and she was missing the bigger picture. She wondered if they were gossiping about her. They radiated amusement. Aha! Uh -huh. It was always edifying to see your own characteristics reflected in others. The next time that some ordinary being treated her with suspicion, she'd think how her force abilities looked from the outside. Myrta turned her head and said something to the commandos. A stream of unintelligible words emerged from the helmets, followed by laughter. It's all they can think about, Myrta muttered. I'm glad it's only once every five years. What is? Galactic Bolo Ball Tournament. It's taken over the holonet. Wrong again, then. Jaina's misfortunes weren't as riveting as a sporting event. Life didn't center on her small circle. Another reminder that there was a wider world she seldom saw. Where's Fat? Slave One. Where else? The small Mandalorian flotilla 
included Fett's ship, the tank-like Trakad, and a squadron of gladiators and aggressors. The holochart set in the bulkhead showed other vessels idling at the RV point, a carrier, judging by the hatches, and a sentinel landing craft that looked heavily modified. The carrier was tiny, no more than a hundred meters long. Bevin? Jaina felt almost protective toward him. He seemed to pick up Fett's pieces far too often. Didn't see him embark. Babuir told him to stay behind, either to placate Medrit or to keep an eye on Babuir. Myrta did a quick little shake of her head. I mean, Grandmama, it's the same word in Mandoa. I mean, Sintas. At least Bevin wasn't going to get himself killed following Fett's whim. Jaina always had a stake in her missions, so it was hard to imagine how soldiers would take risks like this for credits or out of some loyalty to a man who simply hired them out. She stopped short of judging them, though. She'd seen the state of Mandalore, and she'd never had to worry about where the next meal was coming from. How did you manage to hate a man you'd never met, Myrta? Jaina could sense the emotions between Myrta and her grandfather pretty clearly. Myrta longed to love him, but seemed battered by constant disappointments, and Fett was trying hard to get it right, bemused by failure. Did your mother even remember him? You didn't even know, Sintas. I grew up hearing how Fett had abandoned Grandmama and Mama, and that she wouldn't have been struggling to pay the bills or having to take dangerous bounties if he'd taken some responsibility. Yes, but to hunt him down to kill him? For years? Most folks get a lawyer. Mama had a bad time as a kid, moving from place to place, always getting in fights because she was different. Myrta shrugged, but didn't elaborate. She even married a Mandalorian to improve her chances of finding Babuir. My father. Wow, said Jaina. That was dedicated hatred. She didn't ask why Myrta had followed her father's culture, or why she hadn't worked out earlier that Aelin was a little obsessive. I'm sorry. And Babuir wasn't what I grew up expecting, some womanizing thug blowing his fortune in cantinas. He was just this... wasted, austere, lonely man hard to even like, and yet I found I was proud of him. Myrta let out a long breath and reached for her helmet. It was a cue that she'd had enough of bearing her soul. Jaina counted it as a plus that she'd even bothered to talk, let alone in those frank terms. I still love my brother, but there's nothing left to like about him, Jaina said. Love's a very separate thing. It has an independent life of its own. Well, if you have to earn love on points, it's not love, is it? It's approval. Jaina peeled a chunk of Ujalai stuck to her finger and decided the syrup would make great gasket sealant. One of the commandos, the tattooed man called Carid, took off his helmet and cocked his head on one side in an ah come on gesture. Hey, plan the celebration you'll have after your marriage. What's the point of surviving a mission if you're going to be this depressed? That was Mondo sympathy. It's a fet thing, Myrta said. I bet Orade will teach you how to laugh. You'll get the hang of it. Myrta seemed to manage a twitch of a smile at the mention of her betrothed. The minutes ticked away. Jaina had the sense of being in the engine room of an ancient seagoing ship, surrounded by pipes and hydraulic systems, rather than drifting imperceptibly in space. A scraping sound made her look up at the deckhead. Buchese, said Carid. Myrta sealed her helmet, and he looked past her at Jaina. Put your breather on, Jedi. That's someone docking up top. Just in case the seals don't hold... Fix them with this, Jaina said, holding up her last wrapped chunk of Ujalai. Everyone laughed, and she heard them this time. 
I'm always happy to be test aircrew in a totally unproven vessel. It'll hold, said Rams Aramar. Time was when Mondoade rode war droids into deep space. No fancy hulls. Raw vacuum that far from your shebs. He indicated a tiny gap between gloved thumb and forefinger. That's how we won an empire. You going soft or something, Karaka? Oh, I know. We were tough then. We'd go two weeks without breathing. And half a dead pygmy Borat was enough to feed a whole clan for a week. Carid folded his arms across his barrel of a chest and stretched out his legs. If any of our babies couldn't lift a best god by the time they were weaned, we'd harden them up by catching them a full-grown Trandoshan and making them kill it with their pacifier and eat it raw. Ah, those were the days. He belched. Pardon me. We're just too cultured and sensitive now, you know? Jaina bit her lip to stifle a laugh. One of the overhead hatches opened, and Fett slid down the ladder to land among them. "'Ducks with Slave One just fine,' he said, hooking his thumb in his belt. They really were testing the trocad on the job. It didn't seem to phase any of them. "'We got mission details now.' "'It's a go, then?' Jaina asked. "'No.' But we know what we have to do when we get the signal. Fett passed around data chips. Latest floor plans and layouts here. We'll either be taking out power grids to disable cannon batteries on the orbital yards as needed, or falling back to Pelion's flagship Bloodfin to defend it if he gets in trouble. Pelion? Even in a little toy turbulent? It was a woman under the helmet then. That must have been Isko Talgal. Bevin spoke of her in hushed tones. What's going to put a dent in that? Dalla's keen that someone should look out for him personally. Does she know something we don't? Dalla has a contingency plan for everything. Somewhere she's briefing someone to take out the Mondos if we don't behave. That's why she's so hard to kill. Fett smelled faintly of jetpack fuel and antiseptic. Smells were more noticeable in the cramped compartment. My personal orders. If you run into Jason Solo, you leave him. Unless you really need to kill him. No hunting, no trophies, no avenging the Mandalore. He's Jaina's when she's good and ready. Or else me and Bevin have wasted valuable time on her. Got it, Mandalore, Carid said. Jaina wasn't sure if it was a Mandalorian courtesy, or just that Fett wanted her to share some misery by way of general payback. She let it pass. What do you want me to do? You all seem to know what your roles are. You're the ace pilot, Jedi. Fett jerked his head in the direction of the aft bulkhead, as if there was something behind them. Spare Besu leak in the carrier. Up for it? Jaina felt a pang of excitement, and then instantly guilty. It seemed wrong to find any small pleasure in life so soon after Mara's death. She'd been the same after her brother Anakin was killed, as if feeling anything other than permanent grief was somehow betraying him. I'd hate to think anyone I left behind couldn't fully live again. I have to get past this. She thought of Mara having a good laugh about Jaina edging past five-year-olds with blasters, and seized the chance. Can I at least get a look at the controls first? she asked. It's hard learning on the job in combat. We can test cross-tech into the carrier at the same time. Fett wasn't joking. The Trakhad pilot brought the vessel down on the deck of the carrier and settled it flush against a hatch. 
the trochod's belly hatch opened. Jaina, feeling like a bug tipped out of a box, jumped down to the deck five meters below, easing her landing with the force. Four dark gray wedge-shaped fighters sat on the hangar deck, a tight fit, and the familiar scent of hot drive, lube oil, and coolant was reassuring. She stood admiring their lines. It was a pilot's machine, all right. Fett climbed down rungs set in the bulkhead, boots clanging as the spikes in the toe caps caught the metal. Myrta. Fett never raised his voice, not even when he called out to someone. You too. Leave her to me, Babuir. Myrta walked up to a Vesulik and pressed something on her forearm plate to open the canopy. Have we got time to get aloft for a few minutes? Knock yourself out, Fett said, and climbed back up the rungs to vanish into the belly of the trochod. Two-seater, Myrta said. Up you get. You're driving. You're qualified on these? If you mean can I fly one? Yes. Myrta was remarkably agile, even in armor, and was up on the airframe and lowering herself into the co-pilot seat before Jaina had a chance to worry. Only qualification is not killing yourself. We're not great form fillers in Keldabe. The canopy clicked into closed position, and the cockpit was suddenly muffled against the sounds outside. Myrta, wedged right behind Jaina's seat, pointed out the drive ignition button. Push it. Jaina pressed the button carefully with a cautious fingertip. The Besulik made a little ack, like a living animal's cough, and then the airframe shivered as the initial throaty rumble of the drive rose in pitch to a steady, singing, pure note. If you're nervous, Jaina, Myrta said, remember I'm the one putting all my faith in you. Yeah, no pressure. Jaina followed the hand signals of a Mandalorian in bronze armor to roll back and moved the yoke intuitively, surprised when the fighter responded as she expected. The hangar deck turbo lift lifted. She watched the cross sections of decks pass the cockpit as they rose and heard airtight hatches hiss and snap closed beneath them. Eventually, she was looking up at star dappled space. She was ready to take off. Nothing to crash into, Myrta said. Her arm snaked past Jaina's cheek and pointed at the various instruments. Almost X-wing panel layout, except the weapon systems are this side. Take her out, Jaina. I'm a Jedi. I can fly anything. Full domestics back? Jaina asked. Export, and that still beats what you fly at home. Jaina let vague familiarity take over her hands, and her force ability to sense position and every little nuance of the Besulik's handling did the rest. She was clear of the small flotilla before she realized it, and getting a sense of how tight the turns could be. It felt wonderful. It was like any well-designed, lovingly crafted tool. It felt like an extension of her body, not a platform designed around the weapons with grudging space left for the being who had to deliver them. Easy to be seduced by it, isn't it? Myrta said. She meant the Besulik, that was clear, but Jaina thought of the ease with which she slid toward darkness and how easy it was starting to feel among these people. How natural to be learning to treat her brother like a bounty. She wondered where the line lay between being open to new ideas and too easily betraying the old. It's perfect, Jaina said. Myrta wasn't as hard to read in the force as her grandfather. The sense of agitation hung in the cockpit. You think a Jedi healer would really be able to help my grandmother? Jaina thought of Gotab, and why he'd found Mandalore as irresistible as this fighter was to her. She knew he wouldn't welcome her poking around in his business. Can't do any harm. I'll find one. Thanks, Jaina. She realized she'd ceased to be just Jedi, and even Solo, and was now Jaina.
for some reason, that heartened her even more than not being shot on sight as a spy. Chapter 13 Town We No, I'm not dead. And yes, I've still got your research material. I don't plan to sell it off. Don't make me change those plans. Cohen A. No, I didn't forget. And you know I found what you were looking for. I just don't need three million credits that badly. Which is still my price, by the way. Extract from queued text com messages, awaiting transmission from Boba Fett, Mandalore, via Arcania and Camino com nodes. Imperial Star Destroyer Bloodfin. Task Force Assembly Area, off Fondor. Kytus refused to let his recent brush with Luke rattle his composure as he stepped through the hatch of Bloodfin's hangar, Tahiri at his heels. He'd been duped with a brilliant Falanasi illusion, and had his stealth axe almost ripped from under him. That had left him reeling, but not for long. He realized that it wasn't an indication of his own vulnerability. It was a benchmark revealed to him as part of his destiny. Luke had come after him. That showed how desperately urgent it now was for the Jedi to stop him. Luke was pulling out all the stops. The illusion, however masterful, was the best that Luke and his entourage could do, or else they'd have used it to defeat him there and then. The attack on his stealth axe. That was the best Luke and his wingmate could do, too. They couldn't stop him or grab him, even with chunks of his fighter missing, and they didn't have what it took to kill him, militarily or emotionally. Luke was the greatest Jedi Master, and he'd just exposed the absolute limits of his powers. A suicidal gamble in any war. No. No, the Force had laid out the evidence for Kytus, and all he had to do was look at it from the right perspective. Kytus truly knew his enemy now, and he knew that Luke's best shot wasn't good enough. And neither is yours, Admiral. Here she comes. You seem in a positive mood, Colonel, said Neothel's voice from some way behind him. Good to see a spring in your step, so soon after being scraped off your own deck. Kytus followed an imperial aide through the maze of passageways into the citadel of the destroyer, the most heavily protected sections that were the heart of the warship. It was a much smaller destroyer than the Anakin Solo, an unfamiliar layout, with lower deckheads and narrower spaces. When he stopped outside the compartment designated for the meeting, he studied the ship's badge on the bulkhead. "'Thank you for your concern, Admiral Neothel, he said, the shield depicted a four-legged fanged creature with cloven hooves like daggers, a blood-red frill raised like a mane along the length of its arched neck. Neothel paused to look as well. Think of all the extra work that would land on my desk if anything happened to you. I heal fast. The animal was caparisoned in ancient battle harness, trampling a figure its own rider, judging by the matching leathers. How ungrateful! A beast trying to destroy the master who guides it safely through the battlefield. Or unseating him for using the spurs too much. Neothel inhaled, as if she were savoring the chemical smells of recent work on board. Lovely thing, a new ship. Pelion emerged from the compartment creaseless and composed, and fixed a steady, dark gaze on Kytus. It was their first encounter since Kytus had entered military ranks. Our eponymous animal, the Bloodfin, Pelion said, most apt. I thought it was just a simple marine predator that was only a threat in its home waters. A borrowed name, Colonel, because they both share this splendid red appendage. 
Pelion ran his fingertip over the glowing red pigment. Kaidas felt the old admiral's curious blend of disciplined anger and enjoyment. We once used these blood fins as cavalry mounts, because they were ferocious fighters in their own right, with a much greater range than you might imagine. They remain a reminder to us that we should all be careful of the dangerous creatures we ride, because we have to dismount sooner or later. If we are cruel or careless, the beast may even throw us, and once the rider falls under its hooves, it will devour him. The silence hung like a weight for three beats. I'm glad we have speeder bikes these days, Tahiri said. Kaidas went into the meeting, unsure whether Tahiri just couldn't follow the subtext, or if she was much more arch and sly than he realized. He decided on the latter. Once the business of agreeing on plans for the engagement began, personal barbs were temporarily sheathed, and everyone concentrated on the task at hand, which was the isolation of Fondor and the containment of any fleet assets it might still have on its surface. Kaidas examined the hollow images carefully. It was hard to tell from reconnaissance imaging whether the vast numbers of vessels and assorted craft on Fondor, one giant manufacturing site, in effect, were operational or customer's orders. In the absence of the mine net containing surface-based threats, this is a time-consuming task, Kaidas said. I suggest placing third and fourth fleet fighter wings inside the ring for recce and rapid response to counterattacks from the surface, and a destroyer and frigate flotilla to hit whatever dares raise its head. Meanwhile, we devote the rest of the two fleets to taking out the orbital yard's own defenses, and then land an assault force to secure them. The Imperials will be on the outer ring to counter the inevitable reappearance of the Fondorian fleet. Pelion stroked the first knuckle of his forefinger down his mustache, nose to lip, as if lost in thought while he studied the holochart. The aim is still to take the yards in one piece. Yes, said Neothel firmly, looking to Kaidas, even though Pelion was asking. Which, as I'm sure you've made allowance for— means holding the yards long term, which means we also need to hold Fondor itself long term, quite apart from neutralizing its fleet, or else we'll be under siege ourselves on those orbitals. Pelion held up three fingers. He glanced at Tahiri. Three distinct battles in one, two of them possibly a semi-permanent commitment— Unless we can perform a mass lobotomy on the Fondorian government and people overnight, and get them to love us. Kaidas felt the trap creak, but saw no pit beneath. Ordinary beings often made those mistakes. He wasn't prey to uncertainty. If he changed his mind, it was due to dynamic risk assessment. If you're saying we can't do this— or that the commitment is too much for the Imperial Remnant, then say so. Most expeditionary wars involve entering places where we're far from welcome. That's what wars are. Pelion was still stroking his mustache. I'm just saying that subduing a civilian population is much harder than smashing a fleet. Not if you project sufficient power, said Kaidas. Pelion didn't blink. Which force are we talking about? The unseen one available to you, or the one that goes bang? Conventional force. Bombing civilian populations can be a desperately slow way of breaking their will, actually. In my very long experience, 
Most don't give in until they're standing in rubble, and there's not even a stick left to fight with. In the shorter term, they just dig in. It's their home. They've nowhere to retreat. Kytus ignored the lure of an argument. They had different priorities. Kytus wanted Fondor broken as an example to everyone of how serious he was about forging a united galaxy capable of responding to those yet unknown but very real threats like the Yuzhan Vong. But Pelion was looking at a working asset that the G.A. or the Imperials could claim. Neothel probably favored that, too. It was small scale, and, in galactic planning terms, short term. How very typical. Neothel was very quiet, and she hadn't said a word about Jedi stealth exes wandering around at will in the fleet assembly area. Any commander would have been in a flap about that, unless they thought it was a problem that didn't have their name on it. I'm not stupid, Admiral. Thoughts? said Kytus, looking her way. I've often fought the urge to reduce a planet to molten slag myself, Neothel said, unmoved. Probably for totally different reasons to you, Colonel. But I agree with Gil. Holding what we seize is going to be a drain on resources, unless Fondor shows some pragmatism and rolls over. Let's give them an extra reason for doing that, beyond annihilation. Such as, said Pelion, make it worth their while. They rejoin the G.A. and play by our rules, and allow a token force to remain for a while to make sure they mean it, and we give them special status, guaranteed G.A. work for their yards and factories in perpetuity. That's not unlike their status under the old Empire, as I recall, said Pelion. Handy hyperspace lane just for that, too. Well then, Neothel said, we already have a tested plan for making that work, don't we, Gil? An economic occupation is always better than a military one. Kytus kept a careful eye on the unseen, unspoken negotiation going on right now between Neothel and Pelion. He could see the deal shaping, and that it wouldn't include him. Unlike mundane beings, Sith were never shocked by that. They expected and welcomed it. Let's fine-tune our strategy then, Kytus said. We isolate Fondor as planned, begin securing the orbitals, and then see if they're more open to suggestions after we've softened them up for a few hours. Agreed, said Neothel. Remember that there's a surrender deadline in place. I agree, said Pelion. Kytus felt he needed to keep a closer eye on the two of them, but that was what prospective apprentices were for. He had a battle to win. Would you object to Lieutenant Vela remaining in the blood fin as my liaison for the duration of the engagement, Admiral Pelion? Of course you're welcome to send a liaison to the Anakin Solo as well. Pelion's mistrust was clear to Force Senses, but he smiled convincingly enough for the mundanes. You could use a comlink, he said, but she's much more charming. No, you don't think that at all, do you, Pelion? Kytus quite enjoyed the intellectual challenge of these confrontations— Polite and banal to the casual listener, but composed of layer upon layer of double meaning and double intent. He felt Tahiri bristle a little. That was good. She worked better when she was annoyed. She escorted him down to the hangar, 
leaving him with a force impression of a mask held firmly in place. How do I liaise? she asked pointedly, lips barely moving. Observe. And what added value can I bring that a remote holocam can't? If Pelion interferes with my plan in any way, then you stop him. Kaidus's whisper was just a breath. The moths are far more willing, but he whips them back into line. Do you understand what I'm asking you to do? Tahiri still wore that deceptive, I'm earnest and really quite dim expression, but the glittering black shards of her calculating mind were right there in the force. She was a testament to the transformational power of incentive. I think so. Some deaths, some sacrifices are necessary, however callous they may appear. Kaidus just made sure she'd got the full meaning without his having to spell it out. But only if they prove necessary, remember. I understand. It's ugly, but... I understand. A last piece of bait. Place it carefully. In the end, we're fighting for a galaxy where the Anakins of this world don't have to give their lives. That's why we have to think the unthinkable. Tahiri's edge wavered, but she recovered almost as soon as Kaidus felt it. I think living in the past is a dangerous habit, actually. I'm doing this because I think an orderly galaxy is our best defense against falling to an enemy like the Vong again. Kaidus left her standing in the passageway, hands clasped behind her back next to the badge of the bloodfin devouring those who forgot how dangerous an animal it was. He mulled over her parting shot all the way back to the Anakin Solo, and realized that she was warning him that she knew how he was manipulating her fixation with his brother. So did she really believe in Sith government being the best defense against traumatic war in the future? Or was she even more ambitious than he had ever realized? It didn't matter. She had that Sith sharpness now, and it was an instrument he was destined to use. Two of the bridge chronos, one set to local time, one to galactic standard time, crept forward to 2359 GST. One comm channel on each flagship's bridge was kept open for Fondor's president, but the deadline came and went and all Kaidus could hear was faint static. Ocean, Bloodfin, and the Anakin Solo were linked on audio, still waiting. Neville walked slowly around the bridge, glancing over shoulders at tracking screens and sensor displays. Well, I wasn't expecting a response, Neothel said, almost as if she was talking to herself. All ships. We are now at battle stations. I expect this will now be known as the Second Battle of Fondor. I shall be operating from this command information center until further orders. Kaidus was occasionally aware of the most subliminal of sensations deep inside his skull that hinted at intense activity in hyperspace. Over the last day or so, it had been intermittent. He interpreted it as a fleet moving from place to place, dropping out of hyperspace to pause briefly before jumping again to avoid detection. The Fondorian fleet was taking a walk around the block, he thought, occasionally pausing to take a look to see who was still loitering in the neighborhood, and if they had their back turned. The Anakin Solo moved on Fondor. On either flank, vessels from both GA fleets moved into formation, and one battle group, with its X-Wing squadrons streaking ahead of it, 
broke out of the larger formation to slip past the ring of orbitals. Kytus felt around him for the Jedi, not picking up what he expected. He knew they were here because Luke was, but he couldn't sense how many or where they might be. He assumed the worst. Maybe as many as a hundred. Maybe the majority in stealth X's. But Jedi or not, numbers and big ships still counted against them. These days, no naval architect made construction mistakes like the kind that would let a single fighter take out a war machine the size of a planet. Luke Skywalker's days of dumb luck were long over. Kytus cast his worries about the Jedi aside and visualized his ships and their commanders like a grid, a mesh, a network, like the minds he should have had in place now. These were competent commanders with well-trained crews, and they only needed a little nudge to embolden them into even more decisive action. He found he didn't need to control them. All he needed was to be hyper-aware of where they were at any point in time, their state of mind, and if they needed a push to overcome hesitation caused by having a slower, limited, sensor-dominated perception of the changing situation in theater. Ocean was where he expected her to be, to port and a little astern of him. I can keep an eye on you, however busy I am, Admiral. He could see the sensor screens ahead of him and around the bridge, but it was the mental image he was building that was more vivid, and in moments it was almost an overlay on his physical field of vision that he found hard to distinguish from what he could actually see. Neville turned to him. Long range, sir. Fondor's ground defenses are scrambling. Sensors picked up a hailstorm of fighters scattering out into the planet's orbit and Kytus concentrated his touch on the minds of the commanders about to encircle the planet. The first wave of X-wings streaked between the orbitals, targeting the defensive cannon emplacements on the yards as they passed. The wave of frigates and destroyers split horizontally to send one group under the orbit of the yards in a loop toward Fondor's southern pole, and the other mirroring it to the north pole. With the X-Wings keeping the Yard's defenses busy, the warships regrouped inside the orbital ring. Fondorian fighters swung around to engage them like a flock of garbs turning as one bird. Steady, said Kytus. Push through. Push through. Damage reports were now trickling in, most of them minor ones from overloaded shields, and they were diverted to the automated system to collate and estimate the impact on the fleet's effectiveness at any given point. But Kytus didn't need detail. He felt X-Wings wink out of existence, each one a pang in him, and he felt the ships in the right place, the right moment. Fondor's planetary defenses hadn't opened up yet, although the ships were in range. The yards weren't there to defend the planet. Their armament was for their own protection. There was an odd, aching lull in the battle going on in Kytus's mental chart, and for a full minute he cast around waiting for stealth X's to fountain out of nowhere and harry his vessels inside the orbital ring. He'd feel them. Whatever tricks the Jedi had, however undetectable their fighters, he would feel their racing pulses and adrenaline as they began their attack. Luke might be able to hide, but not all of them. The flotillas were through, scanning the surface of Fondor for cannon and turbo laser aimed at them, waiting for enemy targeting to try to get a lock on them and blip their sensors. There should have been the start of a bombardment by now. Nothing. Neothel cut into the bridge comlink. Stand! Kytus felt something then, all right. He knew what it was a moment after it pressed like a weight behind his eyes. It was the sudden surge of drives, tension peaking, thousands upon thousands of beings exploding into action. It was the Fondorian fleet. In the slow-motion way of thoughts in battle, 
he had time somehow to wonder why sensors weren't showing him ships popping out of hyperspace and targeting weapons all around him. Then he saw why, with his own eyes on the monitors. The orbital yards had come alive in an instant, destroyers lifting clear of docks, smaller vessels forming up around them. Kytus felt the precision of the maneuver without even needing to see the rapidly changing transponder icons on the holochart. Half of the ships focused on the GA elements now stuck between Fondor and the ring, and the other half turned their attention to the rest of the task force beyond. The Fondorian fleet, or a very large part of it, boiled out of the yards like cag bugs pouring from a broken drain. The sensor scans went wild. Why didn't I feel them before, at such close quarters? Jedi. That's where they were, putting all their effort into blocking his senses, no doubt persuading themselves that they were defending the civilian workforce or the orbitals. That fitted. Not rebel enough to come right out and fight side by side with Fondor, but pious enough to aid their... Incoming! Brace, brace, brace! Neville's voice was unnaturally calm, as it always was. But despite shields, the turbo-laser volleys that struck the Anakin Solo were enough to shake the bridge and fill the viewscreen with brilliant, blinding, white-gold light. Kytus took it in his stride. This was meant to be, to put him in the right frame of mind to win. The bridge around him distorted a little, and the color seemed to leach out. But he recognized his anger and grabbed the reins to make it serve him. Unlike the Bloodfin's unlucky rider, he wouldn't fall and be devoured by it. He reached out to his commanders and imbued them all with a little more aggression, a little less willingness to play by the rules of engagement. Neville, looking at Kytus's face, seemed frozen to the spot. Ah, oh, my eyes have changed. They'd have to get used to that. The vague sensation of ships streaking in hyperspace had gone now. Captain, Kaida said, at least we know where they are, and why I didn't sense that they were waiting for us. Second Battle of Fondor Combat Information Center, CIC, Galactic Alliance Warship, Ocean. Neothel stood with both hands braced on the holochart table in the CIC, dismayed. The removal of Jason Solo would have to wait. Fondor was putting up a credible fight, and it was turning into a long slog, longer than she'd expected. The mine network would have made life so much simpler. But she'd taken her decision— and now she had to deal with it. Admiral Macon, stranded here with her because the battle was too fierce for him to transfer back to Sarpentia, drummed his fingers on the edge of the table as he moved around it, examining it from every angle. And I said we'd offer them terms after we softened them up a bit. Admiral Neothel. Jason's voice had an edge to it. I intend to break this stalemate before we lose too many ships. I suggest we disengage and regroup. We will not run. I said regroup. And then what? What kind of assault will get us any farther than we are now? The calm went silent. They watched the Anakin Solo's blue icon moving steadily through the three-dimensional plot, making for Fondor. Flagships did not rush into the thick of the battle and fight like frigates, but maybe Solo hadn't got to that page in the manual yet. He's not a team player, is he? Admiral Macon said quietly. Colonel Solo! Neothel rarely knew which way Jason would jump in a fight, and he was getting more unpredictable every time. Colonel, can you hear me? There was the faint chatter of static. Yes, Admiral. Please confirm your position and intentions. 
I'm advancing. Yes, I can see that. Why? To bring this to a quicker conclusion. Neafel looked at Macon. The veteran Moncal commander made a gesture that indicated he wasn't convinced of the firmness of Jason's grasp on the situation. Colonel, I really think you should fall back and concentrate on managing the battle, said Neafel. The Anakin Solo didn't deviate or decelerate. I can do that from here. Just keep the Fondorians as busy as you can. I'm going to target Origin City. The ground batteries, you mean? Can you identify targets a little more precisely, please? I mean Origin City. As in capital, commercial capital, strategic target capital. Wait one. Neafel switched the calm through to Bloodfin, cutting Jason out of the circuit. Gil, can you follow this? Yes. He'll have to get the planetary shield down first, and we've got our hands full with the Fondorian fleet. So he's on his own. If he didn't have a ship's company of decent beings with him, I'd be rooting for the Fondorians to do us a favor, she said. He treats that ship like it's his stealth. This fighter race mentality infuriates me. You can't stop him. And we have our hands full. I've just seen your sitrep. Yes, Ja. Two destroyers and eight cruisers. Even we notice those losses. GA blue icons were clustered within the inner cordon as they'd rapidly taken to calling the space between Fondor and its orbitals. The other side, the outer cordon, showed amber and blue icons, GA and Imperials, scattered more loosely in clusters, star destroyers attempting to target each other, while frigates and the rest of the battle group around each of them tried to shield them. Another blue icon, a frigate, vanished from the plot and appeared on the tote board as lost. Sometimes that happened simply when they lost power to certain systems. Neothel hoped for the latter. Macon's frustration was getting to her. Unable to fight in his own ship, he was trying to be useful. He put on a headset and listened to another comm channel, eyes closed. Cha, he said. I know you're busy, but have you actually listened to this? The fourth fleet elements inside the cordon? There were too many ships for her to even begin to monitor voice traffic from individual captains. No, should I? Yes, it's... odd. Macon didn't usually talk like that. He was precise and specific. Neothel almost dismissed it, but relented and listened in on the same comm channels. The mood and tone in the command center of a warship, even in a tight spot, was a lot quieter and more focused than holodramas depicted. Under fire, it was intense, and voices did get raised. But what she heard was not typical of her navy. One captain was urging cannon teams to blow the Fondorians apart in extremely graphic and profane terms. She winced. Who's that? Tarpaulin. Is he drunk? June Tarpaulin? Never. She didn't even realize he knew words like that. He was old school, very formal. That can't be him. Work through them all. They're all doing it. It's like they've all gone collectively mad. Well, more like they've all had a few ales too many, and they want to take on the galaxy. And I don't mean incompetent, either. Neothel was starting to worry. The more she listened, the worse it got. Commanders she'd known for years, human, moan cal, Sulliston, all species, seemed to have taken on more reckless and aggressive personas. It was no time to dissect this with Macon. But she thought of the things Luke Skywalker had told her about Jason dabbling in the darker side of the Force— Jedi could carry off some extraordinary sensory manipulation. 
she would have bet her pension that Jason could, too. I'd use the phrase, fighting mad, she said. She was cut short by the shipwide calm. Incoming, brace, brace, brace. Neothel bent her knees and grabbed a rail to buffer the shock. The whole CIC fell quiet, apart from the faint hum of electronics. But there was no shiver from a missile or cannon round hitting the shield, so they breathed again. Destroyers like Ocean were well armored and shielded, but nobody was taking anything for granted with an enemy that had produced the galaxy's most powerful warships and weapons before the Yuzhan Vong War. In the CIC, there were no external viewscreens. The only images of the battle that weren't translated into sterile graphs, numbers, and moving points of light came from external holocams on every ship, or from cockpit cams. Neothel didn't want to avoid the reality. She felt she was breaking faith with her crews if she couldn't look at those balls of flame and twisted sections of hull plating spinning off red-hot into space. But to keep fighting these days, she had to find some distance. The small suffering dragged her away from the bigger picture. Then movement on a screen caught her eye, and she couldn't avoid it. A forward view from a cockpit, as a fighter crashed into the Fondorian ship it had already ripped into with cannon fire. A sudden zooming image of a Fondorian crest that was leaking flame. I wasn't like this when the war started. Just as well the Imperials signed up, Macon said quietly, as they watched the Anakin Solo's inexorable progress into the inner cordon. We'd have been sliced and diced by now without them. Good old Gil, Neothel said, still shaken. But after this, who'll be left for Jason to sign up to make the numbers? Anakin Solo, Fondor Inner Cordon The Anakin Solo was in a hurry and plowed between two orbitals on a direct course for Oridin. A wave of fighters broke from an attack on the cruiser Armistice, pounding away with turbolasers at a yard that was venting gases into the atmosphere and headed for the destroyer. Balls of white flame flared and died in the viewscreen, gone in an instant, and Kytus couldn't tell, with his eyes at least, if they were fighters exploding or strikes on vessels. He didn't need the tracking screen to feel the ships. He was fully battle-aware now, sharing his channeled anger to embolden the commanders in his fleet, and able to shut out anything that was irrelevant to the situation at hand. If Luke tried any more stunts with illusions, he wouldn't get far. The adrenaline and pure white rage looping back to him from the individual commanders made his throat tighten. It was almost like a back-pressure effect that the passion for the battle that he was channeling into them gained power and momentum, and siphoned back into him as a changed and magnified thing that he felt he had to vent from his chest or scream. He was out of breath. He hoped nobody noticed. It might have looked as if he were panicking. Sir! Neville seemed to be agitated by the battle link. He looked as if he was trying to shake it off, like someone fighting to stay awake. If he'd only given in to it, he would have felt much better. Like the others, Kytus could hear, could feel, totally caught up in combat. Sir, I'd appreciate it if you'd share your plans for breaching Fondor's shield. Because with the power we've got available, we're going to be hammering away for hours to weaken it. Can I suggest we divert Dewback to help us out? It won't be necessary, Kytus said. He had to get this energy out of him. It was a weight crushing his chest. Alternative power source, you might say. I'm going to get them to drop the shield. Stand by concussion missiles. I see. Neville's tone said that he wanted to take this on faith, but he was struggling. Is this like... Captain... I know you're troubled by what you saw happen with Tebat, and... 
I regret my behavior, but I'm learning to use combat powers way beyond those of the Jedi, and I wasn't fully in control of them then. I am now. Keep monitoring the shield, and as soon as you see it drop, set ten concussion missiles to airburst over Oridin, and two over the shield generator plant. Kytus made an effort to sound detached and normal. It was hard to keep his voice steady. Don't fear me. Very well, sir. Neville said it in as matter-of-fact a tone as if his commander had asked for a cup of calf at an inconvenient moment. Kytus sat down in one of the command seats and watched the disc of Fondor gradually filling the viewscreen until it had no sharply contrasted frame of black space left. His lungs demanded air. The cumulative effect of his commander's heart-pounding aggression needed out now. He could no longer pick out the individual crew and their stations around him in the Anakin Solo, just a complex tapestry of emotions. And that was the state of near blindness that he needed to push his way into the minds of strangers many kilometers away on the planet beneath. The dam burst in him, but it found a river channel. Kytus saw what the Fondorians operating the shield facility might see. He had no idea what the actual location looked like, but he didn't need to waste his strength projecting his consciousness to actually observe. Any imagined scene would do to focus him as the torrent of anger and raw nerves of a hundred or more commanders poured back through him. He pictured the shield generator plant, the control room, imagining it much as any other power plant in the industrialized galaxy, a wall covered in readouts and status lights and rows of consoles around him where other workers kept an eye on the integrity of the shield and ensured that a constant power level fed it there would be a message system, possibly an illuminated board updating staff on the security alert level, too. The exact details didn't matter, he knew, as long as he could imagine enough about what was happening in their minds to be able to latch on to some breeze of a thought in the Force and slip into their world. It was like listening for a particular noise or vibration when tuning a speeder drive. He always knew which sounds were normal and which however faint, however close to the threshold of his hearing, shouldn't have been there and indicated a problem. Once he heard that sound, it was the only one he could hear, blanking out all others. Kytus dropped into that white noise of the feelings and thoughts of billions on Fondor and heard the one repeating note out of kilter with the rest. He focused. In seconds... It filled his head to the exclusion of all else. He was aware of solid, real beings moving around him on the ship, but he was now more aware of the shield generator facility five kilometers east of Oridin and the minds of the control room team. There were more of them than usual. He could feel that. There was a sense of having strangers around, as if they'd called in extra staff and were running emergency operations which fitted a facility that probably ran on standby with droids and a caretaker crew most of the time. The fleet needs to shelter. Kytus concentrated on projecting an impression that the GA fleet and its allies had been driven off, and now ships needed to return to base under the protection of the shield. There was urgency in it because many of the vessels were damaged and needed to land before atmosphere vented or hulls gave way. Open up. Let us in. He flooded the operators' minds with an urge to get the ships to safety as soon as possible. All kinds of worries and concerns about family members who might be on board, a burning sense of saving people, of pulling out all the stops. Now. Drop the shields. We're going to crash. Let us through. For pity's sake, help us. Shields down! It wasn't Neville's voice, but that of the weapons officer. Kytus was still drifting in that fog of minds, drowning in their panic and urgency, 
and not here with the ship that was going to unleash their worst nightmare. Conk section! Fire when ready! Titus tried to snap back at the moment the airburst sent a blinding, searing shockwave across the packed city. But he was a fraction too late, and he caught a moment of pure animal terror that took his breath away. He jerked alert in his seat, wanting to complete a scream that wasn't his. He caught it in time. If he'd screamed, well, the crew thought he was crazy anyway. On the monitor, he could see a fireball spreading and debris billowing up into the atmosphere on a plume of rolling smoke. Now he needed other GA vessels to turn toward the planet and press home their advantage. He wondered if he could even move. He was drained, and for a moment he couldn't even grip the arms of his seat. Sir! Kytus looked up into Neville's face, suddenly reminded that the Quarren once had a son, but Kytus had forgotten his name. And I had a daughter. She's lost to me now. It was a sentimental thought, totally at odds with being a living weapon. He suspected it was an echo from being in the minds of people who feared the worst for their own loved ones. Sir, Admiral Neothel is on the comm. Tell her to wait. We need to hit Fondor hard now, before their fleet closes in on us. The colors were coming back. The bridge looked familiar again. Kytus's head was clearing and he could see the overlay in his mind again, the biggest cities on the planet, and the infrastructure that he would need to cripple to bring Fondor to its knees. It was like being in a pleasant trance, not fully in the present, but aware, and unwilling to snap out of it because it felt so still and perfect, as if everything in the galaxy suddenly made sense and had an answer. He was vaguely aware that the captain had darted away. He was probably stalling the Othel from another composition so he could gripe about Kytus unheard. No matter. He could gripe all he wished. Take us in, Kytus said to the helm officer, close as you can. Chapter 14 Officer of the Dex Log, Galactic Alliance Warship Anakin Solo. 1300. At Action Stations. 1330. At Action Stations. 1349. Escape Pod Launched from Bank 9 Alpha. Captain Kral Neville Missing. Presumed Unauthorized Absence. Galactic Alliance Warship Ocean. Off Fondor. Jason wouldn't take Neothel's calm, but she wasn't sure she'd believe what he told her anyway. She focused on the information she had, provable stuff flowing back from the battle. The holochart changed before her eyes. One moment, the inner cordon was a tangle of blue and red transponder icons, and the next, the red icons were separating out fast and heading for the planet. She could hear the voice of Captain Tarpaulin in her headset, as if he'd woken up sober and hadn't a clue what he'd been up to last night. He was apologizing for his language in a confused tone. G.A. ships were still locked in battle, but as Neofel switched from ship to ship, the contrast between the manic mood of a few moments earlier and the normal level of grim tension during combat almost felt like calm had descended. Tell me this isn't a feint, she said. If they're playing dead and he's fallen for it, we're borked. She didn't use the word often, but it was a blessed release right then. She got ready to pull her ships out just in case, trying to check again who was where, who was still in one piece, who needed urgent assistance, who had no propulsion or had jettisoned escape pods. Jason had effectively split off from the fleet. If Fondor's scamming us, Macon said quietly, they're taking the special effects a little too seriously. He touched Neothel's arm to get her attention. Look. 
some X-wings had penetrated Fondorian space far enough to get detailed aerial reconnaissance of the ground. Visuals were confusing. Some showed steam roaring high into the air from the shattered tunnels that ran under the whole of Fondor's surface. Others were just thick, dark smoke, spreading, filling the frame like thick, folded fur. And it was hard to work out what was happening until she switched to a thermal image. And that was much clearer. Oridin, was it really Oridin? Was burning. It was a ball of searing temperatures that cooled towards the edges, with irregular projections as if a firestorm was being fanned farther. That was exactly what she was seeing, the aftermath of a massive airburst. Fondor certainly wasn't putting that on for a show. When she looked to the other screens, Jason's task force was taking advantage of the loss of shielding to pound other Fondorian cities. But Fondor still had a fleet flying, and the battle was intensifying even if the planet was in dire straits. Bloodfin, this is Ocean, she said. There was no response on the personal encrypted link. She tried the bridge channel. Gil, are you still there? Clever trick, Pelion said. His tone was wary. He had company this time. I have Lieutenant Vela here and she's been explaining some of the basics of the Force to me. Jason's destroying Oridin. I'm calming Vada and offering terms. Are you asking for my opinion, or telling me? I'm Joint Chief of State, and I don't think my colleague is in a position to negotiate, seeing as he's busy fighting his ship. She could stop this now. She could stop this and end the day with some ships left, and Fondor wouldn't look like the Yuzhan Vong had just left again. She turned to the flag lieutenant she was usually assigned in Ocean, Vio. Flag! Get me the Fondorian president! Surrenders were normally forced from a stronger position than hers. This time the G.A. had lost an arm, but the enemy had lost both legs so she was still ahead. She strode back to the bridge as fast as she could without breaking into a run, scattering crew members. They couldn't have known what was going on. It was hard enough for officers in the CIC to piece together the picture, so anyone tied up in single tasks elsewhere knew next to nothing, other than from disjointed scraps that filtered through at remarkable, if careless, speed by word of mouth from deck to deck. Shas Vada took a little longer to respond than she'd expected. It was the first time it had crossed her mind that she was lucky to raise him at all, because there was every chance he'd be based in Oridin. But he was alive. The holoscreen image showed him in a harshly lit room that could have been an emergency planning center, with people milling around behind him, many in administrators' uniforms. "'Admiral,' he said, we're on backup generators here, so make the most of this comlink. The power grids out in six cities in the Oridin region. Oridin itself. Well, I'm sure you can see the results of your handiwork. We can stop this now. Neothel bristled at the thought of being tarred with Jason's brush. But it was all rather academic to someone in Vada's position. Surrender now. We both recall our fleets, and I personally guarantee you that Fondor will get permanent special economic status, and will aid you in disaster recovery as soon as you say the word. Vada considered her in silence for what seemed like a long time. The bridge crew were occupied with the incoming data and intelligence coming in direct from the fleet and via the CIC, but a couple of officers paused to watch the impromptu negotiations. Wars turned on small, personal events like this. What about Solo? Vada asked. Is he going to go along with this? I'm not asking his permission. Forget the United Front. He's too tied up with your fleet at the moment to talk, so I'm acting unilaterally. 
It took Vada another minute to answer, during which he was interrupted by an aide who showed him a datapad. Whatever was contained in it, it wasn't good news. We surrender, Vada said at last. Call off your ships. I'll call off mine. He turned and said something to someone behind him, and looked years older when he turned back to face her again. Give it a few minutes to reach all ships. Ceasefires can be ragged, as I'm sure you know. Neothel waited and as soon as reports started coming in of Fondorian vessels breaking off attacks, she opened the comm to every bridge in the fleet, and that included Jason's elements around Fondor. Tough. He wants to play frontline commander, then he doesn't get included in the diplomacy. All Galactic Alliance and Imperial Remnant vessels cease fire immediately, she said. Cease fire! Fondor has surrendered! There was always a time lag while cautious commanders double-checked the signal, and gunners and pilots, caught up in the life-or-death adrenal blur of combat, were told again to stand down. It was hard to come to an immediate halt. The Imperial ships seemed to be waiting for confirmation from their own officers, but Pelion's voice came on the link ordering the ceasefire, and their fleet fell silent. At this distance, without seeing the damage and casualty reports coming back from battered ships, Neothel could pretend that the sector had returned to a peaceful calm, and that everything could go back to normal. The only ships still moving on the screens were the Anakin Solo and its accompanying frigates. Neothel was anxious for Fondor not to get jumpy. She let Vada hear the voice traffic. Anakin Solo, this is Ocean. Respond, please. What are you doing? Jason's voice wasn't his usual controlled facade of irritating reason, as if he were explaining something to the very dim. He sounded as if he'd been woken up from a deep sleep and was annoyed about it. You can't stop now. I've accepted Fondor's surrender. They've stood down their ships. Unless you can render aid to the planet right now, Jason, withdraw and return to the assembly area. We broke through. He paused. I broke through. She could hear him snapping orders at someone and it seemed to be a demand to find out why his ships had obeyed her order to cease fire. So he was on his own now. I will not accept this. We have to seize our advantage. You're letting them regroup. They've surrendered, Jason. And we've all got pretty much the same rules of engagement across the civilized galaxy. Surrender means cease fire. Neothel wasn't just obeying interplanetary conventions, of course. The Fondorian fleet hadn't gone home and disarmed. It was there, nose to nose with her ships, and could start the battle again at a moment's notice. Fondor had everything to lose, but the G.A. had ships at stake, too. They'd already lost half the Fifth Fleet recently, and Fondor was not the only enemy. I refuse to stand down, Jason said. I intend to carry on fighting. There was a pause. Neville? Where's the captain? Find him. I'll have him. Neothel had no other option, but it was one she felt almost glad to take. There was an inevitable cleanliness about it. Colonel Solo, she said, if you don't honor the ceasefire, I'm relieving you of duty. An admiral outranks a colonel, remember, and I will order your ship to be disabled. There was another pause. She'd never expected him to say yes, ma'am, anyway. I don't recognize your authority, 
Stand down, Colonel. All GA vessels, this is your Chief of State ordering you to fight on. All Imperial vessels, under the terms of our agreement, I insist that you rejoin the battle. Neathel was being carried along by events, but the next words that left her mouth were going to seal many fates. Could the Imperial ships even hear Jason? All GA vessels! Colonel Solo is relieved of duty! Poor Captain Neville. He was in the worst position of all. He'd have to take over the Anakin. She had a sudden cold splash of realization that she should have had before she got on that comm. If Jason could breach a planet's shield with his influence, there probably wasn't much that his crew could do to defy him. She was faced with the real possibility of having to shoot down the Anakin Solo. Down. There was no up or down in space but she still had a feeling of falling. And where was Neville? On the chart, a battle group of amber icons began to move toward Fondor. Some of the Imperial commanders had heard and heeded him at least. Pelion's voice boomed over the bridge comm. The Imperial fleet will withdraw immediately and respect the ceasefire. Wyvern Battle Group, resume your position at once. The Amber Icons slowed to a halt. We now take our instructions solely from Admiral Neothel. Ma'am, said the comm officer, hovering at her elbow. Shasvada's defense secretary is on the comm link, asking what you expect her to do if the Anakin Solo opens fire again. The Anakin Solo was silent. She could only imagine what was happening on that bridge. And no Fondorian ship could be expected to sit and take Jason's barrage to preserve a ceasefire. Tell her I won't regard self-defense as a breach, she said. But if Jason Solo opens fire first, then I'll have to take him out. Imperial Star Destroyer Bloodfin off Fondor. Command Center. This beggar's belief, Moff Rossett said. The GA's falling apart in front of our eyes. He rapped his knuckles angrily on the transparoplast screen showing the positions of ships. This is their highest level of command and political decision-making, screeching at one another in the middle of a battlefield about to slug it out. And we're committing Imperial citizens' lives to defend their interests? In the hope they'll keep their promises? Are we mad? Pelion considered what he'd do in the awful's position, because he was walking a knife edge himself. Grand Moffs and some leaders of the Council cliques had gathered in Bloodfin to pick over the warm remains at this bizarre half-time interval. Pelion knew that some of the moths would rather obey Jason, but they'd seen sense at the last minute. They had to come home to Bastion sooner or later. They knew what the consequences would be if they escalated from merely fantasizing about ousting him to actually attempting a coup. If they made a move now, they'd have to mean it. I admit, they're not impressing me with their cohesion. Pelion said. He was conscious that he had Jason's eyes and ears in the compartment with him. But we withdraw, and we wait. Now's the time to concentrate on getting rescue parties deployed, and to see which hulls we can salvage. Tahiri Vela watched silently. She reminded him increasingly of the villips that the Yuzhan Vong had used as communications channels— living creatures like disembodied eyes that saw and heard everything, bonded to their users from birth like hatchling Nuna. Out of all the repellent organic technology of the Yuzhan Vong, that was one of those he found most disturbing, even compared with their living weapons. 
It was the sensation of being spied upon. It was really no different from a comlink, but because it was alive, it somehow made his flesh crawl. The things mimicked their user's voice, and could even shape themselves to look like the speaker's head, and he half expected to hear it to spout Jason's voice and her features to transform into his. The little Yuzhan Vong ritual scars on her forehead did nothing to take away the feeling. He stared at her until she moved away to the far side of the compartment. Solo can't retain power after this, Grand Moff Seralt whispered. He's totally discredited now. Is Neothel going to honor the Borlias Bill Bringy agreement, though? We won't know for now, Pelion said. Moffs always flew straight for the fresh carcass, however much mayhem was going on around them. Pelion's priority for the next few hours was simply to preserve the fleet and worry about spoils later. Chances are that she will, because she's a pragmatist, and she needs our muscle. First things first, though. Moff Keel, ah, Jason's new lever inside the Moff Council, didn't take the hint. They're in disarray, and Fondor is still restorable, even if it's crippled in places. I'd trade a couple of B-list planets for this. Keel couldn't even stay loyal to someone who was encouraging him to be disloyal to his own head of state. Pelion savored the irony, and hoped that Villip Tahiri overheard that little snippet. They're not in disarray, he said. The headless body of the administration twitching out there is one thing, but they still have fully operational warships all around us, with rules of engagement, and if anyone here tries to pull a stunt like moving in on Fondor, without even a plan, you fool, then it won't end well. Without a plan... Pelion was pretty sure that some conversations had gone on in back rooms about contingencies like that while the old man's back was turned. I'm very clear what we do now, and you will do it. Fondor has surrendered. The fighting is over. We do not take aggressive action now. The G.A. has achieved its objective— and all it has to do now is to sort out who's actually running it, while we have a calf and lick our wounds. Do you understand me? He didn't underestimate Keel, or how many other cliques in the council the man could enlist. There was a small army of moths out there, in ships of the fleet, or back home, or right under his nose here, and only one Admiral Pelion. He held the Empire together with the complex net of personal loyalties, the Moff's collective awareness that he was usually right, and a rarely administered but effective dose of retribution for those who didn't play the sensible game. Without that, all he had to enforce his word was his Imperial Service Blaster, not even a massively lethal one. Power was a nebulous thing when you examined it, just like Luke Skywalker's phantom fleet, in fact. I said, Moff Keel, do you understand me? Perhaps not just a blaster, though. Pelion did have his backup, but Admiral Dalla wasn't needed yet, certainly not for the primary engagement. There was a lot to be said for keeping his powder dry. He had a concealed personal comlink permanently open to her anyway, so she could hear what he was doing minute by minute, and she was monitoring the battle, ten standard minutes away. At least she'd gained useful intelligence from being an observer. The command center staff went about their business, occasionally glancing Keel's way, 
because most of them had seen Pelion smack a wayward moth into line before, and there was no novelty in the spectacle. Pelion never raised his voice unless the ambient noise level required it. In this quiet part of the ship, slow emphasis alone made his point. Tahiri watched as if she was straining to hear. Yes, Admiral. Keel backed down. They always did. I was just thinking outside the box. I'm all for creative solutions, Pelion said. But thinking like that can put you inside a box all too easily. Now let's see what happens next. This was an odd interlude for Pelion. On one side, he could see the urgent business. On the other, the G.A. was frozen for the moment, which was as urgent a problem in its way, but there was less he could do about that. The vessel state board was a worrying tally of too many red lights in the tidy ranks of green that showed ships as operational or with minor damage. The red-lit list showed several of the Empire's largest star destroyers badly damaged, three with only emergency environment control and drifting, and some of the fighter squadrons had taken 30% losses. The Medrunners were working at maximum capacity. If fighting flared up again now, they'd be caught in the middle with the salvage tugs. Nobody in his navy was going to get killed after surviving an attack. He swore it. Yes, let's take a breath and come to our senses. Sir, the Anakin Solo is moving. The midshipman at the long-range scan plotted a projected course from the GA destroyer's movements. The scale of the scan made it look as if the Anakin Solo were making full speed, but the huge ship was simply edging ahead. The young officer tapped his earpiece. Getting quite tense in ocean, sir. He's powering turbolasers again. Tahiri was slinking around now, still silent but checking out the status of the GA fleet, and, maybe Pelion was imagining it, getting worried. Here she was, stuck with the obstinate Imperials, while her master tried to dig himself out of the pit. "'What's he waiting for?' Pelion asked her. "'He never struck me as afraid of Neothel. Can't he snap her head off with a thought or something? Can't you?' "'Colonel Solo has exceptional powers,' she said." She was blinking rapidly. Was she acting dismayed? I don't. Is he recharging himself? Must take it out of you, bringing down a planetary shield single-handed without the aid of a decent Death Star. Her slight flinch made Pelion bet on that being closer to the truth than he'd imagined. He'd watched thousands of personnel under stress. He was sure he knew the real thing from an act. I would think his crew are finding it hard to respond to the order, she said. They're personally loyal, but it's also true that on the battlefield a full admiral outranks a colonel. Solo's got so many titles— it was probably hard to respond to an order from Neothel when your C.O. could throttle you without leaving his seat, too. Must be confusing. The midshipman turned sharply, one fingertip against his earpiece. At the exact moment, one of the sensor scan operators snapped, The Anakin's fired! Then reports flooded in. Fondorian cruiser Prosperity's taken a direct hit on the bridge, sir! Looks like several enemy vessels responding. Fondorian fighters, ocean for you, sir. Pelion took the comm, audio only. He hoped Dalla was paying attention. Cha, what's going on? Sorry, Gil, but Solo's not responding to reason. And I can't rely on his commanders to follow me. 
I'm going in now to put some buffer between him and Fondor and stop him the hard way. I need your help. A pause. Wretched shame that he's taking so many good crew down with him in that ship. Understood. This was the inevitable cleansing Pelion thought might be a longer time coming. It was as good a time as any. He turned to the moths and gestured to the comm officer with a finger to open the fleet-wide channel. All ships identify GA vessels not responding to Admiral Neothel and engage any that attack Fondorian targets immediately. We will honor this surrender as long as Fondor does. There was a ripple of uncomfortable breaths among some of the moths. Are we clear in our purpose, gentlemen? Yes, Admiral, said Keel. Pelion turned for the hatch. A private conversation with Dalla seemed a good idea. Then he'd call Rides to his cabin and discuss what to do with Keel when the fleet arrived home. I'll be in my day cabin for a few minutes. It's my age. He swept past Tahiri and strode down the passageway. The order for action stations was echoing through the ship, and everyone was closing up for duties, making him feel almost a footnote to events. He slipped into his cabin and secured the lock, catching sight of himself in the mirror on the locker hatch and straightening his collar. Dalla can hear all this anyway. I just want to hear her take on this. She's more at the Jason end of the ruthless spectrum. Pelion wondered if he simply wanted to hear a friendly voice, and took his comlink from his tunic. At least it'll be over sooner rather than later. Then the hatch opened. He'd locked it. Tahiri Vela stepped in head slightly lowered as if she was sorry to interrupt him. Sorry, sir, but I had to speak to you. Pelion felt his nape prickle. He'd have to factor in anti-force user security in the future, just in case, if such a thing could be made. There's always knocking. Sir, there are lives on the line. If you let the G.A. tear itself apart— Everyone loses. I'm not letting it do anything, Lieutenant, he said. I'm giving practical support to an ally. If Colonel Solo is deposed, the G.A. will revert to its indecisive self and there'll be chaos. I'm afraid I can't agree with you, my dear. But then I don't have to. Loyalty is a fine thing. Don't think that I don't respect that. But Jason Solo's the chaos, not the cure. Pelion stood, expecting her to try some feminine charm. The comlink to Dalla was still open. She'd be finding this amateur routine very amusing. Is there anything else? The moths will break off if you tell them to. Tahiri took a step back. I witnessed the influence you wield. Moff Keel was ready to defy you, but you just put him back in his place. I can feel things in beings that even you can't see. I've no reason to refuse Admiral Neothel's request. Subject closed. Tahiri pressed her lips together and sighed. Mild annoyance, possibly joking— but the G.A. issue officer's blaster she drew from her belt was quite serious. Please, Admiral, just do it. She flicked the safety catch off and aimed it at his chest. Her voice had a harder edge and lower tone now. Call off your fleet and give Jason Solo a chance. He needs to win at Fondor. Win. Destroy its capacity to threaten the G.A. again. It's a practical matter, 
but it also shows the rest of the galaxy how high the stakes are for them. Ironic. Jason Solo would have found Alderaan's demise within his ideology. Pelion wondered what Leia would have made of that. No. Pelion calculated whether he could draw his weapon before she could fire, if she would fire. But she was a Jedi, and a third his age. A horrible certainty gripped his gut. For a few moments, all he could feel was the sensation of intense cold flooding his thigh muscles. He'd felt it before, under fire, when he knew how close he was to annihilation. But he was also used to working through that reflex. I won't ignore a surrender, and I won't enable the bombardment of civilian centers afterward, and I will not lend the Empire to a petty despot. You know you're going to die, said Tahiri. Pelion was past the adrenaline ice stage and into the phase of letting his body and training take over to resolve the threat. It was a shame he was just a little too old now to do it with a display of physical force. He'd make his last punch count, though. I'm ninety-two years old. Of course I'm going to die, and quite soon. But it's how I die that matters to me. Please, get out of my cabin. Last chance. Tahiri leveled the blaster. All you have to do is call a halt. The moths obey you. My son died to defeat the Yuzhan Vong, and Jason's as set on destroying everything I hold dear as they were. Pelion knew death, all too closely glimpsed for too many years, and the end that he'd most feared was slow decline. He could feel death most days lately, tapping to get his attention like an anxious bird at the window. Now the bird was gone, and the dread with it. It was the cleaner death, standing alongside him again now, the one he knew from combat, the one that he preferred, and few ever got to choose the way they left the world quite like this. He grabbed the privilege and opened his comlink. Pelion to fleet, he said. Tahiri paused, probably expecting him to cave in to her threat, like she would. Life mattered more to her than how it was lived. Fleet, this is Admiral Pelion. I order you to place your vessels at the complete disposal of Admiral Neathal, and take down Jason Solo, for the honor of the Empire— The blaster bolt hit him square in the chest, and flung him back against the bulkhead. The pain was so fleeting that he was sure he was already dead. He'd always expected black oblivion, not this numbness like getting a crushing kick from a faulty power circuit. Tahiri leaned over him, eyes wide, the smell of blaster and burned fabric clinging to her. He wasn't dead yet. Raj, I never had that talk with you. No, don't come running. Wait and fight another day. You can't keep saving me forever. So that's Jason's new Sith Order. Pelion whispered, actually quite surprised that this was what real dying felt like. He was having trouble breathing. A tight band gripped his chest, and the pain was suddenly excruciating. Wiping out civilians from a safe distance, and getting a child to kill an old man— 
Just make sure you can dismount from that bloodfin of yours. Tahiri looked concerned. Behind her, Moff Keel leaned through the hatch, tilted his head to stare at Pelion, and walked slowly away. I can save you, Admiral, she said. It's not too late. The heart's a resilient muscle. Go. Rot somewhere else. Villip, he whispered. There were boots in the passageway outside, not running, more shuffling around, waiting impatiently. Tahiri's lighter step faded as she walked away. Is he gone? said a voice that he didn't recognize. Not yet, said Keel. I'm not going to touch him, so we're totally clean. The cabal of Keel's moths. Pelion whispered, Keel, hoping Dala could still hear him and add another moth to her list. Admiral Dalla's fleet would be a lovely surprise. Pelion wouldn't spoil it for the moths by letting them hear a distress call to her. He managed to fumble for the comlink and place it on the floor. But it was a struggle. He reached for the nearest hard surface and drummed his fingers. Rap, 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 brr, rap. Pelion's pain came crashing back at that moment like a tidal wave that had hung motionless for a split second. And yes, he'd been right all along. It was black, black oblivion, after all. Chapter 15 Star Destroyer Chimera to Slave One Fet, Change of Plan I need you to seize a Star Destroyer for me. Before you ask, yes, I know that'll cost extra. Message from Admiral Dalla to Boba Fett, awaiting orders ten standard minutes hyperspace jump from Fondor. Anakin Solo, inside Fondorian space. Titus felt stronger now, but the raw energy of the battle link with his commanders built up and discharged into the minds of the Fondorian shield technicians, hadn't yet returned. Exhausted, he had to rely on the natural skill of the commanders who'd rallied to him. Two Fondorian frigates circled the Anakin Solo, pounding the shield generator dome. He was also sick of hearing the awful's repeated signal to all G.A. vessels. All ships! Colonel Solo no longer holds command! You are to pursue and disable the Anakin Solo, or, if necessary, Traitor, he whispered. Traitor, traitor. His voice rose to a snarl. Traitor! Shut that calm down, Einendrar. Look at her. She thinks she's a martyr, a hero. Kytus jumped up and stalked to a holochart showing the close view of Fondor. G.A. ships loyal to Neothel were formed up with the Fondorian navy, blocking Kytus's fleet by forming a defensive barrier between Fondor and its attackers. She's spending our lives to shield the traitors. She's throwing away Alliance lives. What does she think? That Fondor's going to make her a national hero now? They'd better, because she's never setting foot on Coruscant again. Never! Einendrar paused and waited for him to return to his seat. Yes, sir. The Anakin Solo's executive officer now filled the breach left by Captain Neville. He was doing his best, but it wasn't enough. And when Kytus found Neville, he was another traitor who would die. Sir, there's— Neville's betrayed me too, hasn't he? There's one escape pod missing, and Captain Neville can't be found. But Kytus considered just jumping to hyperspace 
and fighting his corner from Coruscant. But that was just fatigue talking. He had a fleet here, and the battle wasn't over. Save your time. I don't feel him on the ship. Sir, the Imperial Remnant... The fleet is turning toward us, and Lieutenant Vela is calming you. Kytus was too thinly stretched to read much from her in the Force. Was the Remnant rejoining the battle to finish him off? He groped around for a sense of danger, but the carnage and chaos of the engagement drowned out all detail. He was under fire on all sides. Lieutenant, go ahead. Sir, Admiral Pelion is dead, and the Imperial Remnant is rejoining your forces. She said it calmly, as if it were a routine thing to have achieved. A subdued ripple of approval passed around the bridge crew. Kytus veered between prizing this loyalty and knowing that they had no choice but to fight, seeing as the Anakin was now the prime target and they were stuck in it. But they're still here, and Neville isn't. Kytus gestured to Einendrar to take over and move to a comm station where he wouldn't be overheard. Did you finish the job yourself, Tahiri? I... I shot him, sir. You've probably saved the Galactic Alliance. I didn't feel much of a savior... He was just an old man. But Kytus noted that she had done it anyway. No sentimentality. No weakness. How do we get you back on board in the middle of this, Tahiri? It's going to be difficult. We'll do it. You're still in Bloodfin, yes. You'll be safe there for the time being. I'm stuck in Bloodfin. The crew mutinied, and the commanders are trying to regain control. We're on emergency power. Environment control only. Tahiri seemed to lose her detachment for a moment. We were taking fire from other Imperial ships until the Moths called it off. They've transferred the flag. But the senior Moth commanders are all stranded here. I'll come for you, Tahiri. The crew can't hold those sections forever. When the fighting's over... They'll be able to send any number of ships back to storm Bloodfin. And perhaps not be too careful who they blast when they try to get the Pelion loyalists out. I'll still come for you when I can extract myself from this. He could feel her now that he focused. She was unhappy, not afraid, full of doubt, but not about getting out of Bloodfin in one piece. Are you ashamed, Tahiri? Are you ashamed because you killed an old man? Tahiri didn't answer for a moment. It's not quite the heroic role I had in mind. But you did it. Yes. Tahiri, in the long term, it's easier to kill a powerful enemy than it is an apparently weak one. If you bring down a giant, you're a hero. If you kill something weak, even if it has to die, then you endure contempt. Being willing to be despised, to serve the common good, that's the mark of a true Sith. You're going to make a fine apprentice for me, Tahiri. Oh, I'm official, then. Tahiri had a way with Bathos that he thought was simply banality, but she seemed to use it as to diffuse situations she found too awkward. Then again, she might have been subtly mocking him. You may call me Darth Kydus. I shall be known only by my true name— from now on. Yes, my lord. And I'll come for you, Tahiri. I won't abandon you. The tide had turned. 
Kaidus sensed another cog turn, shifting every part of the whole machine of existence. The galaxy was an altered place. The majestic power of an imperial fleet joining his loyal ships felt like the rush of energy in his veins from eating a sustaining meal after a long fast. There was something else, some other harbinger of great mechanical power and energy, but it was hard to pick it apart from the growing excitement of a fleet about to throw everything it had at the enemy. Sir, the senior imperial commanders want your orders, Einendrar said, as if he'd repeated it several times before and got no response. Let's give Neothel the fight she wants, then. Three Imperial cruisers moved in to open up a furious barrage on the frigates harassing the Anakin, catching one in a cross-stream of turbo-laser fire that ripped through its top solar fin. Titus thought he saw Ocean train her cannons on him, but it was a ship of the same class, and other Imperial warships attacked it with the same pack tactic— subjecting its shields to a punishing combined stream of firepower that overloaded the defenses. Kaidus saw the moment that the shield failed. The hull was peppered simultaneously in twenty places at once as small cannon fire from Imperial assault fighters suddenly passed through and made devastating contact. He had the G.A. on the back foot. It was numbers. Always numbers. And now he had more. Where are you now, Jedi? Don't want to get the stealth X's scratched, do you? Ah, uh, said Loxon, still at his post after all these hours. Sir, more ships dropping out of hyperspace. Kytus turned, eager to see what else the Imperials had thrown into the battle. What's that? He didn't recognize the vessel and it didn't carry the Imperial livery. An auxiliary? A fleet tender? Ships began popping out of hyperspace in flares of white light, and as the transponders began kicking in and the sensors pinged others, Kaidus knew the Jedi were back with one of their mind games. He was on the receiving end of another elaborate Jedi mind assault, or at least his crew were and now he hoped everyone understood how very real the Falanasi illusions were in the hands of a master, how they registered with all the senses, and even censors, if the illusionist was powerful enough. It's Skywalker, Kaidus said. Try to filter these apparitions out from the real threats. It's hard, but that's how he wants to decoy you, to get you firing carelessly. Oh, you're kidding me. Clearly, Loxon and another junior officer, Dove Horlow, were seeing what he was. So this was a large-scale illusion registering on many minds, not just projected at one like his had been. Did someone raid an aerospace museum? What the stang is that? Steady, said Kytus. It looks real. But beware. None of the ship's transponders registered pennant codes on the system. There was only so far that Luke could go in embroidering this fantasy then, and the two young officers tried to identify the vessels by class alone, as if it was some cadet instruction at the Naval Academy. There were now two Crusader cruisers, a Victory-class Star Destroyer, and a squadron of TIE Fighters. A Venator and two Republic-class ships dropped out at exactly the same moment like a choreographed party surprise of the very worst kind. Sir, it was very convincing. It was exactly like the previous attempt, except more imaginative, and the feeling of real mass and power was detectable now. I think... I think this might be real. Get me the senior moth, and ask if those are his militia forces. The motley fleet kept growing, falling out of history into Kytus's here and now, 
and their weapons were real. The sensor ops team was flat out trying to assess the battle elements ranging against them. Fearfeck! Those are assassin corvettes! How many more? I thought the scimitars had gone for scrap by now. This is crazy. Where did all these crates come from? An assassin broke out of formation, blinding white power streaming from its cannon. A GA carrier moving X-wings into position exploded. The whole aft section swallowed in a ball of expanding light. It was no illusion. Loxon seemed to have had enough of humoring his commander. That's really dead, sir. Sorry to argue, but that's real. It's absolutely real. I'm losing concentration. I've got to stay sharp. Where in the name of the Force did these come from? Yes, it is. So come about and ready torpedoes. Flaring into existence like the avenging swoop-hawk that the Jacipri sages said would herald the end of the universe— an Imperial Star Destroyer was now on a ramming course for the Anakin Solo. It had an identifiable pennant code. Sir, it's I to— Oh, that can't be right, said Dove Horlow. Someone's doing a psyops job on us, real metal or not. Kytus took a slow breath. He recognized it, too, but this time he believed. She was never confirmed destroyed. It was a vessel that had been flagship to the legendary admirals of modern history, and fought at some pivotal battles. The veteran ship was looking a lot tidier than it had at the Battle of Bastion. It—no, she—was fully restored. Chimera, said Kytus. Sir— Someone's emptied the whole galactic junkyard and then some. Kytus felt such focus and long-suppressed venom in the Force that he almost thought he'd detected a Sith. But this was mundane darkness, simmering long-nursed grievances, longing for justice, diffuse longing, any justice, a piercing shaft of sorrow right through it. The sensation would have fascinated him had he not been more preoccupied with how much trouble was in his path. "'You know what we girls are like,' said a slightly rasping, patrician voice over the open calm. "'We just can't throw anything away in case it comes back into fashion years later.' "'You have me at a disadvantage, madam.' My apologies, Colonel Solo. Where are my manners? This is Admiral Dalla, flag officer of the Maw Irregular Fleet, and I ask that you stand down and leave Fondorian space now. I knew she was back on the list, but the moths need to improve their intelligence gathering. As Chief of State of the Galactic Alliance, I'm afraid I can't do that. Kytus summoned his overstretched battle meditation skills. Flight. Stand by, five seven and five nine squadrons. As you please, sir, said Dalla. More fleet. Patch into Admiral Neothel's combat information center and give the lady a hand. A moth's voice came over the comm, unhelpfully late. We knew Pelion had recalled her for something underhanded. Good afternoon, you insignificant little man. The satisfied polish to Dalla's voice was tarnished by some pain and regret, though. Kytus heard it. This one's for Gil Pelion and Legius. Chimera opened fire. The battle with Dalla's scrapyard fleet had begun. Mandalorian Boarding Party Assault Ship Orar 
approaching Imperial Star Destroyer Bloodfin, accompanied by Trakad. What would you like to be today? Orade said, scrolling through the list of spoof transponder codes for the assault vessels. Hopelessly lost Nalastian freighter? Fuel Bowser? Death Star? HNE Combat Broadcast Unit, Carid said. Nobody swerves to avoid them, but they're not tactical targets. Plenty around, and they get in stupid positions. Fett had to admire Dalla's timing. Imperial ships that had been protecting Bloodfin from predatory strikes while the battle raged inside her now had urgent problems of their own with the arrival of the Maw fleet. A lot of trouble to go to for a few moths, Fett said. He now had a link to Bloodfin's mutineers. He thought that term was a delicate legal point if their admiral had been assassinated. Raj, what's your situation? We've rigged the drives and weapons to blow if anyone tries to border, Raj said. Once the troops breach our bulkheads, we're finished. We're not equipped for close combat down here. As long as you don't try to repel us, we'll be fine, Fett said. Who have you got on board? The senior moths on the flag officer's staff. And their boss is Keel now, I suppose. The rest of the moths with command status are still with their ships. So you left the B-team moths at home. Well, I'm not fussed if I remove them dead or alive. Can we breach the hull and let in some nice cool vacuum without killing you? No, they'll be in the command center. The citadel's hardened anyway. We've activated the fire control bulkheads to seal off the compartments around the citadel. If you go in via the replenishment hatches, that'll put you much closer to the command center, and you won't have to fight for every meter if you run into company. And you've got a Jedi on board, Jaina said quietly. Tahiri Vela. I think she's forfeited her lightsaber now, Solo, said Fett. I meant that she might be extra trouble. Bloodfin was effectively dead in the water, with all weapons and propulsion offline. It was just a matter of getting to her without attracting too much attention, then boarding, and then neutralizing the troops who were trying to regain control of the ship. The moths were stuck in a metal box. They either had to find some way off the ship, or regain control before Neothel, Dala, or even the Fondorians blew her out of space. Jaina was subdued. It was a bad deal with Pelion. She had a look in her eye that said she could easily have been a woman who'd embark on a bloody vendetta if the Jedi hadn't educated that natural human reflex out of her. I shouldn't have let you hear Dalla's recording, Fett said. But when you're hunting scum, Solo, recognizing the voices is part of making sure you kill the right barve. I'm not squeamish, she said. Myrta, helmet in her lap, gave Fett a look. It could have been leave her alone, or even try harder. It was still a man you'd known for a long time, he said, and a Jedi killed him. It's bad enough that Tahiri did it, but it's hard to think of anyone waiting outside a room until someone's dead. Fett saw her point. He tried to work out how many beings he'd killed. No, can't even guess. Have to check the archived accounts. Give it up. And he couldn't remember leaving someone to die the way Pelion had been left. The barves should have finished him off cleanly. He didn't much care for the moth class anyway, and Dalla had made clear what he had to do. Nobody was familiar with the Remnant's new turbulent class pocket star destroyers, but Dalla had transmitted a deck layout and its two hangar decks opened at the stern. Fett located the replenishment access. Raj, where are the troops? As far as we can tell, apart from the ones pounding us, we've positioned them at the main exterior hatches. They were relying on the frigates to prevent boarding. 
I think Bloodfin just lost top cover. And look out for Jason Solo. He's probably planning to extract Lieutenant Vela. Good luck, Fett. Fett turned to Jaina. Added complication. He'll be facing the same challenges that we are. I can't locate Jason in the Force, but I can find her, so she'll be his transponder. You think he'll come for her? If it's not too much trouble for him. Carid leaned across Orar's console to the chart and put a marker on the Anakin Solo. Not that he'll bring that alongside, but it's comforting to keep an eye on him. Rige, Fett said, stand by. Orade, you join Zeramar in the Trakad. Orar was a little under forty meters long, and in the shoal of ships, ten, twenty, thirty times larger, she was a small target to pick up visually. A transponder trace showing her to be an HNE broadcast unit getting way too close to the action in this chaotic battle meant that by the time anyone checked what she was doing coming so close to Bloodfin's stern, it would be too late. Trakad, even smaller, trailed behind her. Orar crept along the port side to settle over the replenishment hatches and clamped herself to the hull. The belly hatch of the assault ship opened, and they were looking at an aperture not quite two meters wide. It was a poor access point and a good place to get trapped. As soon as Fett slid into the hatch and put his glove on the metal, he could feel distant vibrations from something pounding away inside Bloodfin. Someone was trying to smash through a hatch. Fett hoped the engineers and weapons techs could hold back the shock troopers a little longer. The replenishment hatch opened onto a storage compartment with access to the main deck of the destroyer. Jaina emerged from the hatch in the middle of a stream of armored troops, a small figure in gray with a lightsaber hilt in one hand and a blaster in the other. I'll locate Tahiri, she said. The ship was in semi-darkness, lit only by dim green emergency lighting in most passageways. With visor enhancements, Fett and his troops could see a lot more. Jaina shot off down the passage with all the confidence of someone in broad daylight. Fett found that if he thought of Jedi as having built-in armor and HUDs, then he didn't find them quite so unsettlingly different. It's not about their powers. It's about their attitude. The powers. I can cope with those. Kubariat, the Jedi agent he'd worked with in the Vongese Wars, had been reassuringly matter-of-fact about his abilities, and hadn't had any qualms about using a blaster when the situation demanded. It might not have made any difference to the outcome of a fight, but Fett was better able to see what he was doing. He had trusted him more. Fett and Carid reached the hatch that opened directly onto the command center section. Jaina was already there, flat against the bulkhead. "'I'm sensing about thirty beings in there,' And definitely a Jedi, she said. They've barricaded themselves in. The only way they're getting out is via the same hatches we enter. Let's do it, then. And she'll probably have sensed me already. Fett didn't specify it. Once those hatches were open, he and his troops would kill everything that moved inside. If Jason Solo wanted to extract his apprentice, he would have to do it fast. In three, said Carid. One, two, go! A stream of concentrated blaster fire took the hatch off its clips, and it fell into the passage beyond, wedged on the combing like a safety ramp. Fett laid down covering fire, as six of his Oriramakade rushed in and dived on the deck, firing from prone positions and meeting a returning hail of blaster bolts. The moths weren't going down without a fight. Fett plunged into the smoke and stabbing bolts of energy, suddenly realizing how much more punishment his Beskar armor plates absorbed than the old Durasteel ones. In the noise and chaos, 
with even his HUD display sometimes overwhelmed by the volume of flashing blaster fire, he was unnerved to see Jaina Solo, a small woman by any standards, deflecting bolts with a lightsaber and with nothing but a gray fabric flight suit for protection. He'd have to remember to tell her one day how impressive it looked. For the time being, all he could register was the direction of incoming fire, and Jaina, cursing loud enough for him to hear over the crack and slap of blaster discharge, saying that Tahiri had vanished. Galactic Warship Ocean, off Fondor Chimera cut a swath through the battlefield and headed straight for the Anakin Solo, firing turbo lasers. They always say that Dala tore up the strategy books. Neafo was still assessing the strength and firepower of the eclectic fleet that had just fallen into her lap. Her immediate guess was that she now had thirty percent more hulls than the Moff Jason fleet, as she now thought of it. She looks as if she's going to ram him. I'd get out of her way, Macon said. Several other commanders in Jason's fleet must have had the same idea. They broke off attacks and headed for the Anakin Solo. There were now six warships converging on the Chimera, and the Athel tried to guess Dalla's strategy. One advantage of having a completely unexpected and diverse fleet suddenly emerge in theater was that it plunged everything into chaos, and each commander had to pause and take stock. But that included Dalla's allies. It was crowded space. Neafel had an impression of an ancient maritime battle on Naboo, when ships had been packed too close together to move or fire safely. Yes, she's going to turn as late as she can, said Neafel. Even so, I wouldn't be the frigate on that bearing there. Did she say more irregular fleet? She did. One destroyer bearing down on Chimera's port beam appeared to be targeting her bridge, and a cruiser was on an intercept course from starboard. Chimera opened fire on both simultaneously, with apparently little effect, and held her course. What was that, VL? Neafel asked. Turbo laser? Unknown, ma'am. This isn't the time to admire what she's had done in refit, but I haven't seen anything like that. Censors, tell me what Chimera's got by way of armaments. I just hope this isn't some massive bluff, and she's just scrambled everything from the breaker's yard, because Jason will sense that very fast. Neafel, still monitoring the developing collision, moved to watch one of the holocam feeds from the remotes nearest the Anakin Solo. Chimera was letting smaller vessels take pot shots at her, which her shields shrugged off, and then she simply targeted the same two vessels that she'd returned fire upon moments earlier. Neafel waited for signs of impact. What she saw instead was the hull of one ship deforming and then simply bursting apart like a bag of grain meal, with no accompanying explosion. The aft section was intact but there was a large enough hole in the hull to span five decks, maybe more, and expose compartments to vacuum. It was an oddly silent, unfit end for the cruiser. It rang a bell with Neafel. Oh, I think Dalla's brought some of her toys with her, Macon said. He'd been watching in silence. Yes, I do believe she has some novel weapons. Neafel calmed the Maw flagship. Ocean to Chimera. Thank you for your assistance. Are you armed with unconventional weapons? Ocean, confirm that. We have metal crystal phase shifters, among other things. MCPS weapons altered crystalline structures. An area of the unfortunate destroyer's hull had simply fractured under the stresses and started to break up. It was as good as a laser strike, but penetrated shields. Thank you, Chimera. 
Dollars dusted off some of the research projects from the Maw installation, Macon said. No telling what she's got now. Well, I think we should be telling someone, because that would dent my morale somewhat if I were the enemy. But Dalla was sending her own unspoken messages around Jason's fleet. Other destroyers were leaving ruptured, dead GA ships in their wake, with a weapon that conventional shields couldn't counter. Jason surely had to be able to detect what Neothel could, and more with his force senses, and he would know that he was dealing with tactics and weapons he'd never faced before. And the Anakin Solo was now exposed. The battle group ranged around it was being picked off, in an eerily peaceful but equally lethal way. No spectacular explosions breaching hulls, but large voids from crumbling altered metals that had lost their strength. There was no way of telling how many ships had MCPS, but that was all part of the tactic, the uncertainty. GA and Imperial vessels were literally bursting open all across the Fondor Theater, and any sane commander with one of Dalla's vessels approaching would wonder if he was next. Neothel chose her moment to calm all ships, hoping that those who'd rushed to Jason's side had kept open their links to the flagship. Commanders of the GA 3rd and 4th fleets, who have chosen not to accept my command, she said, this is your opportunity to rejoin the legitimate forces of the Galactic Alliance. Power down your weapons and withdraw now to the designated fleet assembly area. I will not, repeat, not, take disciplinary action against any commander who withdraws now. Neothel sat back and waited to see who would rally to her. And she kept her gaze on the Anakin Solo to see what Jason would do. Chapter 16 Call me paranoid, but after we've dealt with the most immediate problems... I suggest we devote some resources to finding out where Dalla is based these days, and where she's laid up all the technology from the Maw installation. She might be a welcome sight now, but who's to say how she'll feel about us in the future? Admiral Macon to Admiral Neothel G.A. Warship Anakin Solo, off Fondor so she thought she could play that game, did she? Sir, we've got no countermeasures for whatever that is. Commander Einendrar darted from sensor screen to sensor screen, checking the data scanned from stricken ships. My guess is that it's a phase shifter. Kytus stood at the main bridge holochart, meshing what he could physically see with what he could sense. Dalla's fleet seemed to be everywhere, like a cloud of insects. But if they all had phase shifters, then they weren't using them. He could sense something else, too. Jedi, but not close. Not in the battle. Not coming after him. But I didn't sense Luke before, did I? Identify which of Dalla's ships has it, and concentrate fire on them. Titus said, Break off the attack on Fondor. Throw everything we've got at Dalla. And I mean everything. Even ships responding to distress calls. Sir, we've got a lot of damaged ships, and even X-Wings out there that we need to respond to. One of the sensor team looked up from her screen. Sir, the loyal defender has issued an order to abandon ship. They can't maintain hull integrity. Compass Star is going to her aid. And that was his other dilemma. Badly damaged ships tied up other assets in rescue operations. I could leave them. No, he couldn't. Nobody would fight on if they thought there'd be no attempt to rescue them. Morale was critical. And not even Kytus could shape the minds of an entire fleet to feel positive about abandoning their comrades. 
This might be a prudent point for a tactical withdrawal to regroup, said Einendrar. Reassess the situation. Kytus usually heard retreat when someone said withdrawal. But he was now outnumbered, and the addition of Dalla's unorthodox weapons probably amounted to being outgunned, too. Pulling back and gaining some breathing space was suddenly an attractive idea. But he wondered if he was reacting to exhaustion, and maybe an aggressive push now would turn the battle in his favor. What shape are we in? Half the fleet has taken some damage, and we've lost more than thirty vessels, sir. Titus was losing. If he delayed, he could lose most of the fleet. It was humiliating to run, but it was one battle of many, not the whole war. It still stuck in his throat. Commander, identify an assembly area and order ships that can jump and that aren't responding to emergency signals to do so. Loyal commanders only for the time being. He was now fighting a battle on three fronts. Not only the ad hoc coalition ranged against him, but a weapon he wasn't yet equipped to resist, and a traitor urging his ships to mutiny. And we'll see who's the legitimate voice of the Galactic Alliance. Two could play that game. If Neothel had any sense, She'd be as reluctant as he was to slug it out over Coruscant. All ships. This is Colonel Solo. Admiral Neothel is acting illegally, and I call on you to remain loyal to the Galactic Alliance. Signal your intentions, and stand by for orders. What are you going to do, sir? Einendrar asked. If they're loyal... Give them a second RV point to jump to, Kaida said. Then we'll see what Neothel's got left. If we retain fewer than we hoped, it'll be a good time to withdraw. If we get more, we pull back to Coruscant, and Neothel's left high and dry. We lose Fondor, but we can still fight that another day. Ships can't jump until they've cleared the orbit of Thanet. Then tell them to move. Yes, sir. And stand by a rescue runner for me. All the Anakins are deployed. Kytus was about to demand that one be turned back, but he had an alternative that might make extracting Tahiri a little easier. Get me a med sprinter, then. We've got more calls on medivacs than we can— Lieutenant Vela is trapped in Bloodfin, and I won't leave her. Nobody will fire on a med sprinter. Get me a med sprinter and a corpsman's uniform. Einendrar looked as if he was about to ask how Kytus planned to get on board Bloodfin, but he just mumbled, Very good, sir, and calmed the hangar deck. Kytus would work out the details when he reached Bloodfin. There would be an opportunity to remove the wounded, or he would create one. Comms, how are we doing on responses? He asked. How many loyal commanders do we have? About two-thirds now of all GA ships. Good. Send them the RV coordinates. Kytus could sense Tahiri now. She was in trouble. Bloodfin. What's happening there? We've lost the comm from the command center, sir, but they were on emergency power anyway. No. Something's happening. No sign of enemy action against her. The Imperial forces seem to have abandoned her since they transferred the flag. Maybe the mutineers had taken the ship. There had to be casualties. There was no sign of an opposed boarding. Either way, he had to make his move. Commander... You have the ship, he said to Einendrar. I'll notify you of my location when I've extracted Lieutenant Vela. Withdraw the fleet to Coruscant, and if Neothel attempts to return with her traitors, repel them. G.A. Warship Ocean, Fondorian Space Stang! 
several heads turned, even in the middle of a battle. Neafel never cursed aloud. Hardly ever, anyway. And for the crew, it was an indicator of very bad news. My apologies, she said, fuming inside. Some of our comrades have decided to leave the party early. On the holochart, ship's icons winked out of existence, and every sensor, tracking screen, and holocam view showed the fleet thinning out. Some vessels that had been under Jason's command were still there, along with rescue and medivac tenders. Dalla's fleet cruised among the dwindling number of ships like Firaxa's sharks let loose in a shoal of Machi, and the garbled comms that she was picking up showed that even the so-called Maw Irregulars were having trouble working out who was on Jason's side. The Imperial ships were easier to identify, and were taking much of the fire. Some conventional ion cannon and turbo laser, some phase shifter. If the phrase fog of war applied to any moment, then this was it. I think this might well be called a mixed blessing, Neafel said. But for the time being, I'll concentrate on the fact that Dallas saved our necks. Neafel was now in the bizarre position of having beaten back Jason's combined fleet, but losing her hold on power. She stared in dismay at the modest tally of ships loyal to her on the screen, with Macon leaning over her shoulder. I really thought that he'd bitten off more than he could chew this time, she said. How has he managed to hold so many ships? Charisma, terror, and the natural tendency of beings in uniform to follow procedure. Macon shook his head. Asking crews to choose between two joint leaders is going to end in a split one way or another. Anyway. What are we going to do? Chase him? Fight him for control of Coruscant? Because we'd need Dalla and some additional hulls to make that happen. And invading the capital with another planet's forces would be a step too far politically, I think, even if we could pull it off militarily. Neafel berated herself for not thinking that through. But would it have made any difference? The moment Jason refused to honor the surrender, Neafel's course of action was decided for her. She couldn't stand back and let that happen. If she'd followed him meekly, she'd have lost a lot more than a job. No, I'll give him a headache instead, she said at last. We'll withdraw to another base and set up a GA government in exile. Provide a rallying point for his enemies, and we know he's got a growing collection. That'll split up the G.A., unfortunately, and perhaps we'll end up with some unappetizing bedfellows. But it beats playing Jason's game. There was still the Jedi Council, of course, but Neothel had to keep her distance. It was a case of mutual interests but she couldn't commit her forces to Luke Skywalker's control, and she doubted if he'd give his Jedi pilots to her command. And where were they? The stealth hexes were around. Jason's undignified and narrow escape was proof of that. But working out what they were up to was another matter. Jason was pulling back. She'd risk opening comlinks and see if any Jedi answered. Ocean to any stealth X. Please respond. She waited. Come on, Luke. I know you're out there. Stealth X 5 5 to Ocean. Master Skywalker, you're not in our way, so I won't get in yours, but a heads up would be appreciated. Understood, Ocean. We were keeping Jason's ships off the backs of Fondorian emergency responders. But they seem to have somewhere more interesting to go now. Mind if I ask if you had anything to do with the concealment of the Fondorian fleet? We did our best to protect unarmed civilians working in the orbital yards. That's borderline when it comes to Jedi ethics, 
is it not? Our objective is to stop Jason with minimal loss of life. Luke swallowed audibly, as if framing something he found difficult to say. I very much regret what happened to the mine layer crews. I thought Fondor might tackle the threat differently. And this man flies a fighter. He's fought real battles. He destroyed the Death Star. I'll never understand the Jedi. And this is all my fault anyway, for spying for him. We all have our regrets in war, she said. And what looks like today's merciful solution turns into tomorrow's suffering, Master Skywalker. We're all part of that web of events. Indeed. My intention now is to set up a GA government in exile, because we can't beat Jason on Coruscant, not without outside aid, and I'm not sure that's prudent right now. Ocean, where will you go? Where can you go? It was an excellent question. The nearest GA fleet base, or at least a base that wasn't hostile to the GA, was Nalastia. Nalastia. Not ideal. Fondor would have been handy, but we appear to have worn out our welcome. Commit some rescue teams to the planet, and I'll see what I can arrange with President Vada. Stopping Jason ignoring the surrender might have bought you some points with him. And you're no longer the official G.A. War could suspend all logic and common sense. It wouldn't have been the first time in history that enemies had found common cause midstream and become allies. Neothel grasped at the straw that would give her crews the best chance of survival. I'm very grateful for your assistance, Master Skywalker, she said. I'm sure you'd do the same for me, Admiral. And look where it got me. One day, Neothel knew she would be unable to keep it to herself any longer, and she'd have to unburden herself to someone about leaking the mine layer's movements. And you, Luke Skywalker, how will you square it with your conscience? Now wasn't the time to ask him. She'd left port as the Joint Chief of State, and now she couldn't go home. Not until, or unless, Jason Solo was deposed. For some reason, the hundred mine-layer crew weighed more heavily on her than the thousands lost in this battle. Resilient reports that they've recovered Captain Neville, by the way, ma'am, said the comm officer. He asks if he can join Ocean. Neville. One saved out of so many lost. Tell him permission granted. Neville's wife didn't have to lose both a son and a husband within weeks of each other. Neothel grasped it as one bright moment in a day of dark. Med Evac Speeder, Approaching Bloodfin the battlefield was a scrapyard of debris from a hundred ships and more. Kytus picked his way between slowly tumbling chunks of ship, ranging from hatches and torn sheets of plastoid panels to whole sections bigger than his own vessel. The battle was over, leaving desolation in its wake. But Tahiri was alive. He could feel her. And he could feel Jaina. Of all the people he'd lost, in the sense that they were monochrome images from another life, that they would be vividly relevant and full color again if he could only change back into the person he'd been, Jaina was the one that troubled him most. He had been certain that it would have been Alana. He made a conscious effort not to think of his daughter, and it worked. Mostly. But it was his twin who haunted his thoughts— and that, perhaps, was inevitable. So she'd come after him, too, to finish what Luke had started. Yoon Harla, the trickster goddess of the Yuzhan Vong, 
who would have derived satisfaction from seeing the two battling twins of their religion made flesh. He reached out in the forest to locate Jaina, the only way he could detect the location of her stealth axe. She would never feel him now that he was hidden in the forest, and she would never open fire on a medevac vessel. But he stayed alert. Bloodfin drifted, apparently intact, ringed by debris that wasn't her own. Two Imperial cruisers circled her at a distance, almost the last of the Remnant's fleet to leave the area. The Med Sprinter's comlink burst into life. Medivac, this is Gold Fortress. We have a security situation in Bloodfin. Please keep clear. Kytus eased slowly toward Bloodfin's stern. This is Medivac 1014 from Colonel Solo's Galactic Alliance 4th Fleet offering assistance. We're aware of your problem. Where's your boss, 1014? Banged out in a hurry, didn't he? Give me time to talk to Bloodfin and persuade them to let me take off any wounded. In a corpsman's uniform, Kytus was pretty anonymous. Even if folks knew a face, they tended to be poor at recognizing it out of context. A little mind influence, a little push here and there, and he could walk in. I'm a medivac, for goodness sake. They're not savages, mutiny or no mutiny. Have you still got comm contact? Negative, medivac. We're waiting. They've rigged the ship to blow if anyone tries to board her. Let me try. The comlink fell silent for a few moments, as if Gold Fortress was considering the proposal. Okay, Medivac, we've sent a signal indicating that you're standing by, but we don't know if anyone's receiving. Last we heard, troopers were holding the hangar area. So you take your chances. You're obviously not a boarding party, but they might shoot first and worry about ID later. I do this all the time. Kytus said soothingly, I can calm people down. Or make them want to fight to the last trooper. But you don't need to know that right now. Your best bet is to dock with the emergency access on the upper hull aft of the tower, and hope common sense prevails. Make sure you're all lit up, Doc. A shattered X-wing rolled slowly across his bow, as he moved closer to Bloodfin, and a slab-sided vessel of a type he'd never seen before drifted without power on the port side of the destroyer. Kytus picked up a waft of life and anxiety in the force. One of Dalla's museum collection, no doubt. But where had she hidden all this when the Maw installation was cleared out? He'd have to locate that little sarlacc of nasty surprises sooner rather than later. Tahiri, I'm here. Help me out. Concentrate. She was alive, but under stress. He could almost feel her heart beating out of her chest. She was under attack. Kytus aligned the med speeder with the rescue access hatch, yellow and red chevrons glowing in his landing lights. Chapter 17 this will be a difficult matter for me to square with others, but I would be prepared to offer Admiral Neafel's fleet safe haven. At a time like this, when Colonel Solo clearly represents the greatest threat to Fondor and the rest of the galaxy, uniting against him is the most important thing. He may well be back to finish the job he started, and if he doesn't, then I would like to commit the forces we have left— to finishing him. Shas Vada, President of Fondor, to Luke Skywalker Imperial Star Destroyer, Bloodfin Mandalore, we've got company. Fett paused to adjust the audio in his helmet comlink with an eye blink. Blaster fire spat around the compartment, cracking the air apart. Can you deal with it, Orade? The Trakad was the right vessel at the right time. Even without manual systems, it was ideal for playing dead. 
Med Sprinter Docking Top Rescue Hatch. How caring. Fett was getting tired of waiting for the moths and the platoon of shock troopers defending the next compartment to give up and die. Clear. He lobbed in a small stun grenade. No debts. Keep the place in one piece if we can, and instinctively flinched at the stupefying blaze of light and noise, even though his helmet buffered it. Then he hosed the space with blaster fire. Courageous medic, or some scumbag abusing the non-combatant flag? They'd better be medics, or they might end up in need of surgery themselves. Leave it to me and Rom. Myrta backed along the bulkhead, blaster raised, and stepped past Fett to check the compartment. The ship's defended heart was like a nest of boxes. That was great, as long as you weren't trying to get out. Somewhere aft of them they could feel sporadic thumps through the ship as troopers tried to smash their way into the center section. Did you fry the locks on the hatches to the hangar deck? Fed asked. Yes. Myrta listened at the next barricaded hatch to the moth's last stand. I hate being interrupted when I'm working. We can crack it later if they still want to fight. Carrot and Vevut unrolled a strip of detonite to make a frame charge. You reckon they'll cave in when we demoff this crate? Maybe. Fett calculated for a moment. Twenty Mondos in Bloodfin. About thirty standing by to follow them and take the troopers trying to batter their way into the engineering area. The Imperials might have had a lot more troops but that counted for little in a confined space where they couldn't actually use them. They're log-jammed. Carid and Vevut waved him back, and he took cover with Myrta. The whoomp of the exploding charge left the hatch hanging open. Vevut ripped it to one side with a crush-gaunted hand, and fire spat out the hatchway. If Dala hadn't wanted the ship largely intact— this could have been over by now. A volley of bolts struck carried in his Beskar chestplate and smacked him against the bulkhead. He made an animal grunt of annoyance. Ah, I love it when you boys get saucy, he wheezed. Fed heard the shunk of his gauntlet vibroblade. Come here and say hello to your uncle Carrid. Carrid dived into the opening with Vevut and Fett behind. It was an adrenaline-fueled blur, as it always was, and Fett was aware of Vevut getting a face full of white armor. The troopers must have shoved the remaining moths into the next compartment to shield them. The spaces were so cramped now that it was hand-to-hand -hand fighting, with not even enough space to raise a rifle. Displays and sensor panels crashed across consoles like barriers, he tasted singed plastoid when he inhaled. He needed to smell his environment, helmet filters or not, and he would have been blinded by smoke if the HUD hadn't picked up other wavelengths. He jumped onto a collapsed panel to vault over it, and it split beneath his boots, catapulting him forward onto a shock trooper. The man shoved his sidearm into Fett's belly and fired. The impact of rapidly expanding superheated air was like a gut punch, but Beskar really was worth the extra weight. Fett smacked down hard with his vibroblade into the gap between chest plate and underarm, feeling it lodge and then penetrate. A blaster bolt that wasn't his cracked into the man's helmet in a blinding flash of light. The trooper stopped struggling. Babuir, said Myrta, trying to haul him up. Where's the Jedi? Jaina Solo was tough enough to look after herself. But if she'd managed to get herself killed, he'd be furious. That wasn't in the plan. He scrambled to his feet, then heard a thud and turned. Jaina dropped down out of what looked like a ventilation duct. Tahiri, she said. She's gone into the shafts. Schematic says that's an emergency exit route. Last resort. You busy, Mandalore? Carrid yelled. 
he seemed to forget that he didn't need to raise his voice in a helmet. He usually preferred fighting without one. Or we'll just mop up this bunch on our own, shall we? On my way, Fett said. Solo, can you get her? I need her blocked off somewhere along the route. I'll do it. Myrta adjusted her helmet. I'm small enough to pass through in armor. There's a med sprinter docked topside, Fett said. Just a hunch. But do those ducts join up? Myrta checked her datapad. Yeah, there's a space a little under two meters high, running the underside of that hatch. I reckon Tahiri calmed a ride home. Maybe you should use the flamethrower. Let's not, said Jaina, looking up at the deckhead. She shut her eyes as if listening, and coughed. Fearfeck, next time I'll make her wear an environment suit. I can feel her, but I can't feel anyone outside on the hull. You can sense that? When I really concentrate. She took a deep breath and coughed again. Might be a medroid. Might be someone who can vanish in the Force. And I can guess who that'll be. I didn't need the Force to know your brother would come to collect his villip, said Myrta, and dragged a seat across the deck to climb up to another ventilation grill. And if I get to him first, your training's going to be wasted. I said, we leave the scumbag to her. Fett lunged to grab Myrta's ankle, just as she hauled herself into the trunking. He couldn't think of anything that would express his sudden fear for her. He tried. Don't get killed now that I've bought your wedding present. She shook her leg free. Get a refund. Jaina gave him a sympathetic shrug and bent her knees, bouncing a little as if she was going to jump. She did. She vanished up the shaft, and there was no sound of her crashing into anything. Yeah, clever. The noise of close quarters fighting had now given way to more distant sound transmitted through the ship's decks, the faint vibration of some serious pounding taking place. The blast-proof bulkheads and hatches in the engineering sections seemed trooper-proof, too. Fett turned to see Carid's head stuck out of the hatch. Don't get all envious. You can do that with a jetpack. Now, Mandalore, we're about to open your surprise. So, if you wouldn't mind hauling your shebs in here... I shouldn't have brought her. Or Orade. Don't go soft on me, Fett. I need someone to dance on my grave. Carid was a good man, but Fett missed bevying on ops like this. How many have we got in there? Fett picked his way through the debris to another hatch, one with double doors. The schematic said this was the inner sanctum. His terahertz penetrating radar showed bodies moving around, just a dozen or so now. As far as he was concerned, it was a stupid design for a warship. But then he didn't fight the way Imperial navies did. I reckon they'd have a good twenty to thirty moffs and their lackeys in a flagship, Vivut said. I count fourteen dead so far. Well, they don't look like they're leading their troops from the front. Let's drill out the rest of the maggots. Vivut and Fett crouched in the cover of a console ripped from the deck, squatting ready to spring forward as soon as Carid blew the hatch bolts. Fett felt no pain. He knew he'd feel like a wreck tomorrow, but right then he was immune, buoyed up on urgency, adrenaline, and long practice. His body knew what needed doing, even if his brain kept trying to tell it that he was too old for this nonsense, and that he needed to worry about his granddaughter. You didn't give a Mott's backside about her mother for decades, and now you worry about the kid. There was no logic to the things that went through your head when you thought you might die. And every time he drew a blaster, a little voice said that this might be the last time he did, 
even if he never believed it. Cover! yelled Carrid. Volume! Fett sighed, ears ringing. Whoomp! The hatch doors ripped apart. Fett's stream of blaster fire preceded him as he jumped over Carrot and burst through the hatch. They were fresh out of troopers inside, and he didn't care if he was dealing with armed moths or not, because his hand didn't have time to factor that in before it carried on firing. He waited for the noise to stop. Blaster, exploding transparaplast light fittings, shouts, cries of pain. He'd heard folks say that Mondos were totally silent when they attacked. But then they never heard what went on inside the helmets. Carrot had his vivid stream of invective running the whole time, and he never seemed to use the same profanity twice. Vevoot muttered to himself. When they got hit, they yelped. Fett couldn't recall making any sound apart from what was forced out of him by being winded by a blow or a fall. "'Well, index for them,' said Carrot. He aimed his blaster while he checked for any still alive. Five men. Maybe there were other officers, but not here. They'd reached the core of the citadel. Fett looked up. "'No.' I didn't think they'd be that dumb. There was a decent-sized hatch above his head. Nothing so small as to need an undignified scramble to pass through. A panel of controls was inset into the deckhead next to it. Fett lifted his arm to poke the panel with the muzzle of his blaster, and it ratcheted open, releasing a ladder that extended to the deck and came to rest on two feet. They don't go down with their ship, then. He directed his penetrating radar by tilting his head, and his HUD showed that the shaft rose vertically, then branched off at forty-five degrees. If the schematic was right, the angled shaft would come out in a larger passage just under the emergency hatch. Sounds of twanging metal said that the shaft was either buckling with heat from a fire or someone was hitting it. Boots on rungs, probably. Why do people always run away from us? Carrot said. Let's go ask them, said Fett. Imperial Destroyer Bloodfin Emergency Route Beta-1 The Star Destroyer was riddled with shafts that reminded Jaina of sinuses in a skull. She emerged at the top level, sweating. It had to be the top. She ran along the passage at a crouch, looking to either side, and couldn't see any more openings. She didn't have a sense of any concealed hatches either. But if Jason was there, he'd know she was too, even if he couldn't pinpoint her exact location. Myrta. Where's Myrta? Ben had once said to her that he used the G.A.G. helmet comlinks because the force was all well and good, but he needed to send and receive complex information in apparent silence, and the force was pretty poor at that. Jaina wished for a helmet, just for a moment, to communicate with Myrta. In the end, she didn't need to. She found her squatting with her blaster leveled ahead. Jaina dropped down, too. Myrta's hand signals were actually very clear. Three or four contacts ahead. Then she drew a T-sign in the air with her fingertip, to Hiri, and shrugged. She's in there, Jaina breathed. It was as quiet as she could make it. I feel her. The schematic didn't show everything, apparently. Myrta lifted her left forearm. Blaster held one-handed in her right, just like her grandfather, so Jaina could read the data pad housed in it. Jaina could see a hatch in the deck of the passage that wasn't shown. They bolted past it at a crouch, peeling the soles of their boots from the surface to avoid noise, and then they came to a corner. There was a slow, rhythmic scraping sound, like someone unscrewing a metal container. What happened next felt completely natural. 
Myrta pointed to the front and side, then to Jaina, and then to herself, and indicated forward. She'd give Jaina covering fire as she rounded the corner. Hey, I'm getting used to these people, Myrta signaled. One, two, go. Jaina shot around the corner, and even though she was in Myrta's arc of fire, she felt complete confidence. But ahead of them, Tahiri, struggling to release something in the deckhead, clinging to a ladder, wearing a bright yellow environment suit, clearly didn't. She let loose with a volley of blaster bolts that Jaina deflected with her lightsaber. The fire hit Myrta's plates. Jaina had never been close enough to someone in those circumstances to worry about what happened to deflected bolts. But now she knew. Myrta swore loudly and returned fire. Tahiri fended off the shots with her own lightsaber, and then Myrta just went crazy as far as Jaina was concerned. She ran full tilt at Tahiri, yelling some curse at her at the top of her voice, something like, Gar Shabika! Myrta shouldn't have been able to beat a Jedi's reaction time, but she did. She cannoned into Tahiri, and the impact lifted the Jedi bodily. It had to be the pure shock of seeing this ball of armored, cursing fury coming at her, not caring if the enemy held blaster, lightsaber, or ion cannon that rooted Tahiri just long enough to get hit hard. She lashed out with the lightsaber. Jaina could see Tahiri through the faceplate and knew she would never forget her look of horror as the blade of energy simply failed to slice through Myrta's body. My lightsaber doesn't work. For any Jedi, it was a shocking, naked moment. Jaina was only a split second behind Myrta, but it felt like minutes. She found herself on autopilot somehow accessing that blind violence that Bevin had shown her, that absolute focus. And for a moment, for long enough, it shut down every warning about the dark side. There was no anger, only her body taking over, and a voice inside saying, You can't kill Myrta. She's getting married. Her mom died. She's found her grandma. It felt like perfect logic right then. Jaina swung at Tahiri like a madwoman. Myrta rolled clear, and there was the shunk of a vibroblade. She ducked under the flashing lightsabers, taking a fair few accidental hits, and Jaina saw it unfold in that odd, slow motion of desperate combat. Myrta's blade connected with Tahiri's leg and dug into her thigh. Blood spurted. She'd hit an artery. Her blaster went spinning across the deck. And then there was firing from behind, and boots running. Tahiri fell back, clutching at her leg. Jaina twisted to see what was coming her way, and there it was. Three, four men in brownish-gray uniforms and caps running toward them. One turned to fire behind him and got a bolt in the chest for his trouble. The rest opened fire on Jaina and Myrta, and it was clear they wanted to get where Tahiri was going. Tahiri herself was second priority at that moment. Jaina slashed at the flying bolts. Fett, Carid, and Vevud came pounding up behind the moths, and the firefight sent Jaina spinning on instinct alone, following her lightsaber. She felt the breath of cold air behind her. Metal rasped. Tahiri had dislodged whatever had jammed the hatch, and when Jaina turned, she saw Tahiri scrambling through the deckhead. There was blood everywhere on the deck. Myrta was on her knees, clutching her throat one-handed. "'Your Shabla brother!' she gasped. "'He's up there!' The moths lay dead. Jaina felt Jason then. He was throttling Myrta to let Tahiri escape into the docking tube above the hatch. Jaina put every scrap of strength she had into breaking Jason's invisible force chokehold on Myrta. She saw it like a black chain and visualized the links flying apart just as Carid shot past her and scrambled up the ladder, followed by Vevut. 
that skidded to a halt and grabbed Myrta by her shoulder, as if he thought the blood on the deck might be hers. I'm okay, she said. If he's hurt you, I'll break my own rule and take a long time killing him, Fett said. Don't worry, Myrta rubbed her neck. I got my own, Jedi. Then the hatch above them slammed shut. Fett took a couple of steps up the ladder and hammered on it. Let me up there. He hammered again. It must have been the airlock. They could hear nothing. Carid, open the hatch. Now! Leave the scum! You too, Vevoot! But there was still silence. And then Jaina could feel scraping vibrating through the hull. Med Sprinter Belly Hatch Docking Tube Tahiri Kaitis could see her in the dark tunnel of the tube, through the transparasteel viewport set in the outer hatch. The tube was five or six meters deep, long enough to extend through the multi-skinned hull and into the airlock beneath. He opened the hatch. It was a simple manual opening, the kind that flipped back on itself. Tahiri, come on. I'm stuck, she said weakly. You've only got a few meters to go. Jaina. He could feel Jaina very close. Come on. I'm... I'm bleeding. I'm trying to hold it together. Where? Fi. The blood's just pumping out. My suit's caught. Femoral artery. She'd be dead in a couple of minutes. He could force lift her. Here's a trick we can learn you, son, a voice below snarled. Breathe vacuum. We can. We're well armed. It goes like this. There were Mandalorians below Tahiri, in the tube. A power tool began whining, and Kytus smelled metal being ground. Air rushed past him whipping small scraps of flimsy down the tube. They're cutting open the docking tube. I've caught my suit. Kytus could see Tahiri now, the blood-soaked leg of her environment suit bunched up in one fist, maybe to seal the cut, maybe in some futile attempt to stop the hemorrhage. My suit's caught on something sharp. Tahiri didn't scream, but Kytus felt her terror and heard little gulping sounds as she struggled to release her suit from whatever had snagged it. She was ripping it as she pulled. I could stop the bleeding. I could seal the breach. I could pull her clear. He could force-push their attackers or grab her to free her or snatch the cutters but that would just open the rip in the docking tube, too. He couldn't do it all. He was still exhausted from the effort of the battle link and bringing down Fondor's defenses. No, I am not omnipotent. And he could pull up into the body of the med sprinter to save himself and leave her to die. But he needed to hear he. Don't you dare die on me. Kytus slipped into the tube, catching onto the handholds. Grab me when I'm in reach and hang on. He'd force jump when he had hold of her and pull free of the docking ring. It was fine. He could do that. And then something above made the med sprinter shudder. The tube creaked and strained at his end. The hatch slammed shut overhead. He was shut in a docking tube that was venting atmosphere, with a dying woman beneath and some psychotic Mandalorians bent on suicide. They've got vacuum-proof suits, Tahiri said. It had never crossed Kytus's mind to wonder how Mandalorian armor and their undersuits worked. It was obvious. They were like trooper suits. The battered and archaic appearance masked the best technology that could be built into armor. If I push hard, 
I can open that hatch again. The air wasn't venting as fast as he'd feared. The men below were using some kind of powered saw on the tough material, and the aperture they'd managed to create was small compared with the volume of air rushing to escape. Kytus dropped down into the tunnel, and something grabbed his leg. He thought it was Tahiri, but it was a gauntleted hand, and it hurt. It was crushing his ankle. Someone grabbed him around the waist, too. But that was Tahiri, he hoped. His ankle twisted. That was not Tahiri. Hi there, Jason. I feel like I know you already, you Hutun. There were only so many competing elements that even a Sith Lord could handle at once. Kytus had to choose. And fast. Chapter 18 What's a Hutun? A coward. Physical coward. Moral coward. Any kind of scum without the spine to stand their ground or do the right thing. We don't have a word for hero. Being prepared to die for your family and friends or what you hold dear is a basic requirement for Amondo. So it's not worth a separate word. It's only cowards we had to find a special name for. Baltan Carid, explaining the finer points of Mondoa and Mandalorian culture to Jaina Solo over a Bouchegal, a large ale. Docking tube, med sprinter, clinging to the hull of Imperial Star Destroyer Bloodfin. I can't leave Tahiri, but I might not get out of here alive, either. Kytus was staring into the Mandalorian's face now, or at least his helmet. There were no eyes to fix on, just a T-shaped nothing set in a pocked and scarred violet metal visor. It seemed to go on for minutes, but it could only have been seconds. The man had a tight grip on his ankle. The muzzle of his blaster was in Kytus's belly. And then the man didn't fire. Kytus didn't even need a second. A fraction's hesitation was all he needed to get free. It was a trick that had bought him time with Mara. Not a full illusion, but enough to check someone at the reflex level. The face of a loved one, even though they knew the identity of the enemy they were facing. He had no idea what might stop a Mandalorian. He opted for Aelin Vell's face. "'Doesn't suit you, Darjati,' said the Mandalorian wearily, and then simply held his blaster to Kytus's kneecap as Tahiri clung to him in the tangle of limbs and weapons. "'Ah, Fett, you spoil sport. I have to have some fun.' He fired into Kytus's leg. Then he just let go. The agony was suddenly somewhere else. It wasn't happening to Kytus at that moment, but to another Kytus a long way away. He put his last, best effort into force-punching the hatch overhead, not pushing, nothing so refined, and bursting it open. At the moment he did that, he pushed off hard with his uninjured leg and rocketed through the docking ring into the sprinter with Tahiri clutched to him. The next thing he knew he was on the med sprinter's deck, Tahiri sprawled beside him. He slammed the inner hatch controls, and the hull sealed. He needed to get clear. Whatever had smashed into him outside was going to pursue him. But Tahiri needed help now. He concentrated everything on holding that blood back, every force trick he could muster, and scrambled for clamps and dressings and fluid lines. She was unconscious. He expected to feel a barrage of cannon fire just before his ship broke up, and he had a few final seconds of feeling that he'd fought in vain. But he was still in one piece, and nothing was hammering on the hull. He couldn't understand why he had several clear minutes. He was certain it really was that long, 
not the effect of adrenaline and panic on his brain's time perception. And nothing had happened to him while he put a line into Tahiri's arm and pumped plasma into her as he put a proper compression dressing on her thigh. He'd managed to get the suit stuck in the dressing, too, but she wasn't bleeding out now. And he was still alive. It really was his destiny. Nobody could be that lucky without a reason. Kaitis hit the automated controls as he stumbled past the pilot's console and sent the med speeder shooting vertically away from Bloodfin's hull. It's okay, Tahiri, he said, centering himself again. We're both going to live to fight another day. It's our destiny. Imperial Star Destroyer Bloodfin Leave him, Fett said. Orade, back off. I said he was Jaina's, and I mean it. Orade's voice came out of nowhere. Jaina realized she could hear the comlink from Myrta's helmet as it lay on one side on the deck. Yes, Mandalore. You can't blame a boy for trying, though. Let me go after Jason, Jaina said. He's hurt, he's tired, he's got an injured apprentice. In what? Fett said. The Besulik? Great. And then what do you do when you catch him? You're not ready to do what needs doing. We'll make you ready. Fett had hold of Myrta's shoulder as if he was going to shake the daylights out of her. Instead, he just reached out to touch her hair. A couple of awkward smoothing gestures that suggested she was burning his fingers. It struck Jaina that he might never have stroked his own daughter's hair. It was disturbingly poignant. True to type, Myrta bristled, and Fett shoved his thumb in his belt. The brief attempt at being grandfather and granddaughter had evaporated. I'm fine, Babuir, Myrta said. Me and Jaina... We're a good double act. You're a maniac, Jaina said. Tahiri could have killed you. She had to get past the best car first. And anyway, you got her. No, you got her. You severed an artery. Well, that's for killing an old man. Jaina tried to imagine how Myrta felt being so close to the person who'd killed her mother and not being able to get at him. Jaina was now in a world of unsettling emotions post-combat, of feeling the rush dissipate and thinking of who might have been killed and who might have done the killing, and an odd urge to find everything both funny and terrifying at the same time. Fett cut in. Let's get back below. In case it slipped your minds, we've still got a few troopers to calm down. He cocked his head suddenly, as if he was listening to calm chatter. Okay. Talgal says she's done that. It would be nice if someone told me when they were storming a hangar deck. The hatch overhead opened, and Carid dropped down with Vevut, the pair of them hitting the deck with loud thuds. Carid lifted off his helmet and shook his head like an animal shaking water out of its coat. I enjoyed that he said, all smiles. No offense, JT, but kneecapping your brother made my day. It surely did. If the Mandalore hadn't been such a spoil sport and made me stop, I'd have enjoyed putting that bolt in his... Vevut slapped Myrta's back enthusiastically. Condosi, now that's a daughter to have in the family. Does Orade know you can stab like that? Myrta grinned at him and shoved him in the shoulder, all rough Mandalorian affection. I can cook, I can dig trenches, I can stab a chakar. And she laughed. It was quite transformational. She was a different woman. She seemed far more at ease with her father-in-law than she ever did with her grandfather and Jaina wondered if seeing that hurt Fett. 
Fett just shook his head and walked off down the passage, stooping slightly because there was so little headroom. Jaina and the others trooped after him. Somehow it felt much harder to climb back down those shafts now the adrenaline had ebbed. They picked their way out of the citadel and into the ship itself, suddenly finding crew everywhere, and shock troopers in white, some, not all, being herded at blaster point along the main passage. Others, helmets under their arms, were talking to crewmates as if nothing had happened. Clearly not all of them felt obliged to die in a ditch for the mops. They might well have been more sympathetic to Pelion after all. What a mess, Fett said, head turning in a slow scan as he seemed to take in Bloodfin's sorry condition. The ship was a mass of scorched paint and buckled hatches. It looked like every vertical surface had been damaged somehow. Brand new ship. Disgraceful. Could have been much worse, Carid said defensively. We were pretty careful under the circumstances. If Dalla starts bleating about the paintwork, she can shove it. I think she's got other issues, Fett said. I'm going to find Pelion's body. We're not savages, after all. Jaina trailed after him at a discreet distance, knowing he could see her in his helmet's 360-degree vision, but not wanting to crowd him. She let him enter Pelion's day cabin and stood back to wait. But then she heard him talking to someone. The lighting was returning to normal all around the ship. Machinery whined and hummed as systems came back online. It's a dirty deal, Rige. Is Dalla coming? Yeah. I'll leave you two to sort this. Rige's voice sounded shaky. Well, this crew will serve her, out of respect for the Admiral. We'll settle the score for him. Jaina edged forward. Fett was talking to a man in his thirties, in naval uniform, a lieutenant commander, and there was a body under a blanket laid on the couch. Jaina noted the immaculate boots protruding. Poor old Pelion. This was hardly the first person she'd known well, lost touch with, and then next seen as a casualty of war, but it seemed a terrible thing to reach such an age and then be killed, alone and betrayed. Rige nodded politely to her. Fett came out of the cabin and walked slowly away. Jaina caught up with him. After all those years, she said. What a terrible thing. It's war, Fett said. I meant that if you reach your nineties, you should have a reasonable expectation of dying peacefully at home. Fett sounded as if he'd snorted. Not Pelion. He died well. Men like that don't want to fade out quietly. Jaina wondered if Fett had that kind of end in mind. She couldn't imagine him sitting on a porch in Kaldabe in his dotage. Myrta's handy in a fight, Jaina said. Why am I trying to be sociable? I hope you're proud of her. Fett shrugged, still walking. She's a fighter. I know. I learned a lot today. I even found myself doing a bevine. You know, red mist, crazy, swinging away like a maniac. He'll be delighted. Doesn't it bother you that you've let me learn so much? She asked. I know a lot about how Mandalorians fight now. So what have you really learned, Solo? Fett recoiled his fiber cord line. It vanished into a housing on his armor, and it didn't seem possible that so much cord could fit in there. It reminded her of a conjuring trick. Our weapons? Everything from a besulik to our bare hands. Our technology? We're still using tech four thousand years old. Our secret headquarters? We're everywhere. Our numbers? We don't even know. How to assassinate our leaders? 
We don't need any. If I got shot tomorrow, they'd all regroup and carry on without me. The only secret we have is how our metal workers forge Beskar, and we're not even reliant on that. Jaina shrugged. When you put it like that, it's zero. Everyone can see how we win, but it's another thing to do it. I was saying thank you, actually. You're welcome, Solo. By the way, did you know your brother can change his appearance in a fight to look like someone else? No, Jaina said. Jason liked his illusions, though. It didn't surprise her. I'll keep that in mind. Thanks again, Fett. If he walked much farther, he'd end up treading vacuum. He was trying to make some space to think in. She could tell that. And he left Jason for me. Jaina pondered that for the rest of the day. Aft Engineering Flat Former Imperial Star Destroyer Bloodfin Dala walked along the row of bodies, looking as if she were carrying out a parade inspection on troops who just happened to be lying flat on their backs. She paused a couple of times to put her weight on one polished boot, the other leg extended gracefully for balance, and leaned over slightly to frown at a name on a badge. Keel's coup days were over. One moth earned a closer inspection and an exploratory prod with her boot. That's one of the misogynist parasites I wanted to kill personally for Legius, she said. Fet, I'm disappointed. Shab, we always forget to check ID when folks open fire on us. Carrot lifted his helmet and wiped his forehead with the palm of his glove. We'll fix our quality control process, ma'am. I can stand him up again, and then you can put a round in him if you like. Dalla said nothing and didn't take her eyes off the moths, but stepped back and patted Carrod's helmet with unerring accuracy as he held it in one hand. Fett understood her, even if the comment was veneered in a joke. Ten percent discount for killing the right barve too fast— at the wrong time. You're a gentleman, Fett. Come on, we'll leave the sanitation crew to their task. Let's keep this ship immaculate for poor Gil. So Bloodfin was her ship now, another toy taken from the squabbling boys who wouldn't let her play the last time. She walked along the passageway with the confidence of ownership, but she didn't go into the day cabin where Pelion had been murdered. Instead, she carried on through the ship and down a couple of decks to the wardroom, where small clusters of gray uniformed officers were sitting around small tables talking in low voices. They looked like men, they were all human males, which no doubt made Dalla bristle, who'd suddenly realized what it meant to be exiled a long way from home. They jumped to attention when they spotted Dalla. She pressed all their admiral-on-deck buttons without even trying. As you were, gentlemen. She gave them a little nod and a hand gesture that said not to bother with protocol right then, and settled herself in one of the more luxuriously upholstered seats in a private corner. There were blaster burns everywhere. So that's the new Sith approach, is it, Fat? Shooting a man Gill's age, after all the years of service he's given the galaxy? Do you think the Jedi can get rid of them this time? Fett thought of Jaina Solo, stuck with the dilemma that removing Sith the permanent way meant becoming like them, at least for a short while. Expedience messed up those high-flown morals. If they do... They'll only come back again. Swing of the pendulum. As long as you've got Jedi, 
You'll get Sif, said Dala. One begets the other. Fett tried to recall his history lessons, the sort that Mandalorians knew even if nobody else did. Yeah. Gets tiresome. Come on, Fett. You did all right out of Vader. Sith paid Mandalorians for millennia. We had a war with them, too. And guess who didn't win? It's a cycle of sectarian brawls. Everyone else gets hit by the flying bottles. I've done my bit to remove the problem, but they just keep coming back. Folks say the same about Mondo's. Dalla examined her nails, deep in thought. A steward darted out from behind the counter with drinks on a tray. A real human steward and a real Ionite tray, because the Imperials were particular about that kind of thing. Dalla nursed the glass for a while, but didn't drink. Fett didn't touch his at all. I think there can be a third way, she said. No Jedi Council. Keep them in their box, away from politics, and certainly never arm them. Ordinary barbs running their own affairs? You crazy woman, Dalla. It'll never catch on. She fondled the glass again, and didn't put it down this time. You have a better idea? No. But arrogant stupidity doesn't always come bundled with midi-chlorians. It's everywhere. So who succeeds Jason Solo when someone finally drops him down a reactor shaft come the glorious day? Because it won't be that poisonous little vongbait Tahiri over my dead body and hers, of course. Fett didn't like many beings in the galaxy. He was indifferent to ninety-nine percent, and most of the remainder were on his target list. But he could manage a scrap of approval for Dalla. She talked his language. You sound like a woman who cares what happens in the core, he said. If I did, you're the resident Jedi countermeasures expert— would you be too retired to do some consultancy work for me? Fett indicated his forearm plate, a weapons platform in its own right. The flamethrower needed servicing, he noted. Consult this. I'm always negotiable. Seriously? If you're ever in the position where you need a place to lock up your Jedi... We can do you a good price on Beskar restraints, and we'll always have the troops to make use of them. Let's keep that in mind. Dalla raised her glass, and Fett thought she was going to make some informal deal, but she indulged in a little sparing sentimentality, and he approved of that, too. To Gil Pelion the last of the Empire's true gentlemen. Safe harbor, my friend. Fett just inclined his head. The galaxy liked its heroes better dead, when they didn't hang around doing inconvenient things like shaming everyone else and setting glittering examples. Or being fallibly mortal. The worst thought he'd ever had in his life was that if his father had survived, he might not have lived up to the dead paragon that still shaped his every waking moment. It was one of the few missing pieces he didn't want to track down, and he still hadn't found time to shoot the barve who'd planted and watered the doubt in his head. So what if Django Fett wasn't the holy Fen Shisa? He was my dad. He loved me. And I loved him. 
That's enough of a hero for me. I forgot how effective your iron can be against Force users, Dalla said, dragging him out of his thoughts. You'd be amazed what ended up at the Maw installation when the Emperor's closets got cleared out. Dalla never disappointed. She was solid granite, always on the ball, always looking for the angle, even when she could have relaxed her guard. Fett liked being kept sharp. I always wondered what the Empire did with the Beskar ore they strip-mined out of Mandalore. Found they couldn't make it work the way your people could. That's what they did. Fett enjoyed the idea of all that Beskar needing Mandalorian expertise. Yeah, you need to ask a Mondo metalworker, and ask him nicely. I'm glad we understand each other, Fett. Crystal clear, Dalla. Mind if I visit your fine, but challengingly rustic world? Come and have an ale at Myrta's wedding. I've got a son and a granddaughter. Where did the years go? Fett almost asked where she'd found time to have a family, but the way years just collapsed on themselves, and how you woke up one morning to find you were suddenly fifty years older than the last time you checked, reminded him of the looming task of coming clean with Sintas. Better go find my tame Jedi, he said, sliding his untouched glass toward her, before you give me back our iron to make a box to put her in. Jaina was pacing the silent hangar, completely in a world of her own, swinging her lightsaber, deactivated, in some drill or other. He wasn't sure if it was unalloyed good news to see her getting on with Myrta or not, but it beat having Myrta rip herself apart dealing with the sister of the man who had killed her mother. Jaina stopped and looked up at Fett on the gantry. Come on, he said, and trotted down the durasteel mesh ladder. Time for bounty hunting class. Aren't you whacked after today? she asked. No. Fett checked his fiber cord line, coiled, ready to fire and trap, and flexed his fingers. If I don't hand you back to this space bum smarter than I found you, he'll just brag about being my nemesis for another forty years, and then I'll have to shoot him to shut him up. Just remember to shoot first. And she almost grinned. Almost. Jaina Solo was okay, he thought and she couldn't help being a Jedi. Fett thought of a Jedi agent called Kubariot, and wondered if he had a granddaughter out there somewhere. Okay, he said, waiting for her lunge. Come and get me, Jedi. Office of the Chief of State, Coruscant, four days later. Routine, salaries paid on time, nightly holodramas, predictable prices, was the anesthetic that had kept Coruscant docile in Kytus's brief absence. He inhaled the familiar scent of carpet, warm datapad plastoid and fresh-brewed calf as his office doors sighed apart and he limped to his desk. I could have shot her, of course. If the debacle of the Fondor operation had been the Force's patient way of removing the offal neatly, making her a traitor and Kytus a wounded hero defeated by treachery, then he was prepared to concede it was another necessary source of pain. He took off his gloves and laid them on the desk. Shoot her, and people would have called him a despot. Lose ships and personnel— both the destroyed and the stolen, and Kytus could return with some honor, with the same end result. It was all illusion. If Luke Skywalker thought his Falanasi conjuring was fine sleight of hand, 
He didn't understand the power of presentation. The new admin droid glided in. I've prepared a digest of the non-urgent matters that arose during your absence, Chief of State, it said, placing a neat stack of data pads on the fine desk that used to belong to Cal Omas. I've taken the liberty of clearing Admiral Neoffel's office and transferring all defense business to this department. Two matters for your diary today. The appointment of a new Supreme Commander, and Senator Gassil would like to see you. Oh, I'd forgotten him said Kaidus. The senators who were left after so many defections and secessions from the G.A. seemed to huddle together for comfort, forming protective herds in committees. They talked. Droids listened patiently, interpreted creatively, and then just did what Kaidus told them to. It was a therapeutic arrangement. Many government departments were now overseen by droids, Kaidus liked their efficiency and an absence of ambitious self-interest. Does the Security Council still sit? I believe so, Chief of State. Quarterly. Hence the Senator's wish to see you. Very well. He's waiting for me to summon him. Now would be ideal, then. Get it all out of the way. I've got a tight schedule this week. I've thinned out the diary a little, sir, said the droid. I anticipated that you might be tired after the events of last week. Excellent. That really was most impressive. I appreciate your foresight. How is Lieutenant Vela? Recovering well, thank you. Kaidus found a cup of calf poured for him, piping hot, and settled at the desk to skim the data pads. The galaxy was calming down. He could feel it. The vista from the window caught his eye and distracted him for a moment. The transparasteel wall of his office was full of Coruscant as it always should have been, canyon towers and orderly sky lanes full of patient traffic, jobs, peace, ample food. The vague echoes of the Yuzhan Vong occupation visible in some of the alien vegetation and the more recently constructed buildings that had filled yawning gaps left by destruction, seemed to haunt the citizens no more now than the Lahag early occupation of Harbanande, which left the Har worlds full of exquisite architecture that attracted tourists with no real memory of the suffering and misery inflicted centuries before. There was a point where the past stopped nagging to have a voice in every daily decision and simply became history. The droid had collated media coverage of the past week, too. Kaidus shuffled through the pads to choose one digest to play on the larger desk screen. He skipped through the battle footage and the studio analysis of who failed and why, irrelevant, all history already, and his eye was caught by a headline from one of the scurrilous gossip holozines, not one focused on the sleazy private lives of Emotodrama and Holovid stars, but one of the more pretentiously political versions that mixed satire, really very funny, he had to admit, with real news, savagely written. Jason's Game of Happy Families Joint Gangster of State Kaidus was used to the steady stream of attacks about the removal of Cal Omis and indefinite emergency powers, but it was all talk in the fringe media. Citizens did nothing about it and got on happily with their lives. This story opened with the coup and went on to list actions against members of his own family. The attempt to court-martial Jaina, the arrest warrant on his parents, and the rift with Luke and the whole Jedi Council. Then there was a reference to the death of Luke Skywalker's wife on Cavan at a time when Jason Solo was away from Coruscant, juxtaposed with the death of Aelin Vell, dubbed Fett Jr., Cal Omas, Dur Gedjan, and a much more direct line about his involvement in an alleged fatal assault on Lieutenant Tebut not being investigated by the fleet or CSF. Kytus laid his cup down on the desk and read the summary again. He found he was actually upset by it. No, offended. Hurt. 
None of it was actually untrue. He explored his feelings, surprised that he could be stung by such a minor episode in a turbulent, painful life, just chatter from beings who didn't count and who couldn't affect his destiny. But that's not how it happened. It wasn't like that. The report made him look like a common gangster, a thug who had seized power and then went about removing anyone who offended him or stood in his way, like some hut crime lord. Titus wanted to calm the Holocene and tell them they'd got it wrong. He was serving the common good. Gangsters were driven by wealth, by lust, or by some sick desire to see people cower. He wasn't a criminal. He didn't deal in drugs or rob anyone. He'd done what he had to do, because nobody else was willing to tackle the anarchy or stand up to the old power elites. Did they think he could change the galaxy by asking people nicely to stop being monsters to each other? All those things had to be done. Mara, Lieutenant Tebut, I didn't kill them for personal reasons. They were part of the path I had to take to be worthy of this office. How can you understand what a Sith has to do? How can you apply laws to us? Your ordinary laws weren't meant for us. Who would make the tough choices if they were hidebound by conventional law? Had anyone protested about Luke Skywalker bringing down Palpatine? The rebellion broke every law in the book and killed many people, but citizens were ready to accept that because change was needed. Titus was only doing the same thing, and yet he was vilified for it. He was wounded by the blindness around him. Why could they not understand? He wasn't explaining it clearly enough, perhaps. He slammed his cup down on the desk and calmed the droid. Tell Senator Gasil I can't see him today. Tell him we'll reschedule. The droid's voice was even and patient, not a hint of disapproval in it. Sir, he says the Security Council must meet within the next week, because it's a legal requirement that they convene a minimum of once every three months, and he must have your input. Kytus could feel his perspective changing as if the office was a hollow image being adjusted to monochrome and its depth of field distorted. His desk appeared to recede into the distance, bleeding color. Well, if that's all he's worried about, just get the law changed. Sir? I set that up months ago. The amendment to the Emergency Measures Act— had everyone forgotten how he'd stripped away all this bureaucracy? Memories were short, it seemed. The clause I used to change the law and arrest Cal Omis. I can change any law I need to, without taking it to the Senate. Just use my administrative powers. Change it. Go on. Remove the whole section about any requirement to hold meetings. Simple. Yes, sir, said the droid. Like HM3, the excellent legal droid who had spotted the loophole for Kytus, he didn't fuss over right and wrong, only what was definably legal. And Kytus decided the law. It was a legitimate government responsibility. And he was the government. Oh, and get Captain Shevu in here, please. While Kytus waited for Shevu to arrive, he took deep, calming breaths, seeing the color return to the room and its proportions revert to normal. I don't meditate much these days, do I? Action had to be his meditation. He had so much to do. Tahiri would have to shoulder more of the burden. She was a Sith apprentice now, and that meant work. 
Titus had been planning to summon the editor of the Holocene to his office and demand a full retraction and a new article explaining the truth of his actions. But the longer he waited, the less pressing it seemed. Did anyone who mattered read the Holocene? Had it started riots? No. All that really mattered was that the few key people around him understood his burden. Shevu, for example. Kaidas changed his mind. He wouldn't ask Shevu to send a GAG squad out to arrest the editor, and so guarantee that the hack would listen to Kaidas carefully. It was a tawdry errand for a man who'd done a fine job of keeping Coruscant safe during the last year. A pot of calf, then, and time to catch up on policy. Kaidas had missed having Shevu at his right hand during the battle. Valuing loyalty was something his grandfather had understood well. But Kaidas was also aware that subservience wasn't necessary. A little honest contention was far more important. The doors opened. Shevu, looking carefully unemotional as always, walked in and stood in front of the desk. Welcome back, sir. His quiet dislike was tangible. Eventful few days. Kaidas gestured to the chair. Are you surprised about me, Athel? Shevu sat down. Not really, sir. Just the timing. Better that than trying to oust me while I was off planet. Yes, I can imagine that would have been messy, sir. He was telling the absolute truth as he saw it. Kaidas could feel the solid certainty in him. Look. Kaidas said, offering him the holocene. Just thinking about the report triggered his anger again. Look at this ungrateful nonsense. Shevu looked at it quickly, in a way that said he either didn't want to read it, or had already done so, in detail. But he was a former CSF officer. He'd have read it. Do you want me to take action, sir? If you'd asked me half an hour ago, I'd have said yes. So you'd prefer to forget it. The allegations are pretty strong. But then it's a satirical holocene, known for that kind of lurid story. Oh, I'm not disputing the facts, Captain. Really? Chevu flared a little in the force, a white-hot burst of surprise. Kaidas realized few of the man's superiors could ever have been totally honest with him. They would have to prove the accusations if you pressed the issue. It's just that they don't seem to understand why I took certain actions. They make me sound like a criminal. Kaidas clenched his fist in his lap and let out a breath before feeling in control again. Back in his own skin and not watching himself from the outside. They're only saying what I hear crew whispering in the mess, saying that I've killed a lot of people, and that I wasn't on duty when Mara Skywalker was killed, and that they wouldn't put it past me to assassinate even my own aunt, like one of those lunatic inbred Irmenu emperors. That's what they say isn't it? Shevu was never one to show apprehension. He sat with his hands clasped in his lap and met Kaidas's gaze straight on. Does that worry you, sir? Do you think it should? Well, they seem to have sources within the fleet and other departments. I despise disloyalty, too. But is it worth chasing gossiping clerks? when we have admirals handing battle plans to the Jedi Council. Depends on the effect on morale, sir. You sound just like Neothel. Command is all about harnessing the troops' willingness to suspend sensible self-interest and put their lives on the line when everyone else is running the other way. That's morale. You're better placed than anyone to feel what your troops really think of you. A lesser man would have agreed frantically with a capricious supervisor. 
afraid of saying the wrong thing. But Shevu wasn't intimidated. Kaitis still sensed wariness, but also a powerful sense of certainty, like a permacrete slab. This was a man who knew his own mind and wasn't afraid to stand up and be counted. And as he hadn't fled like Neothel, that meant he was here because he wanted to be on Kaitis's team. He understood justice, too. Do you want to know how it happened? Kaitis asked. Shevu pursed his lips as if embarrassed. Do you think I need to know? After all, I was involved with Gedjin. It's not like I'm going to be shocked by this. I'm not a lunatic or a common criminal. I didn't kill Mara in cold blood. And I care what you think of me, because I see all reasonable good beings when I look at you. You're my gauge of how ordinary people see me. I'd like you to know, Kaidas said. Shevu might not have understood the complexities of Sith prophecy. If he did, Kaidas suspected he was too rooted in the physical world to give it any credence, but he would see why Kaidas had no choice. If I'm not burdening you. No, sir. I knew that Mara or Luke would come after me sooner or later, for taking their precious son as my apprentice. Kaitis knew Shavu liked Ben. There was no point explaining why Kaitis had once thought he might be forced to kill him. Do you know what I mean by apprentice? I'm a Sith Lord. Oh, it felt good and clean to be able to say that openly. Shevu didn't recoil. Do you know what a Sith is? We're Force users. Is it like the old-fashioned wing of Jedi philosophy, sir? That's an excellent description. Yes. We're more inclined to bring law and order than the Jedi Council. Shevu's expression said it was an academic point. So did she come after you, sir? She vowed to kill me in front of witnesses in the Senate lobby. Oh. Two Bith senators, Haas and Fola. And she was as good as her word. I was leaving the Hapes Cluster when she ambushed me in her stealth X, and we ended up on Cavan, where she pursued me into the abandoned tunnels and tried to kill me. We brawled, actually brawled. She brought down the ceiling, and she was like a madwoman, complete blind rage. I had lightsaber, blaster, and crush injuries, and the only way I could stop her was to use the poison darts I keep as a last line of defense. Kaitis had omitted some detail about Lumia, because it wasn't relevant, but the rest was completely true. Mara had ambushed him, had tracked him into the tunnels, had tried to kill him, not arrest or detain him, but kill him. Shevu looked shaken. Well, at least I know why Ben changed his mind about serving in the guard now. Everything Mara had done was about Ben. Kaitis had such high hopes for the boy. But Lumia had been right, after all. Ben didn't have the stomach for the fight. He didn't have what it took to be a Sith. Kaitis wished he could talk to Lumia now that he knew so much more, and that meant that he missed her. He never thought he would, but she'd diverted Luke Skywalker's focus from him, however temporary that might eventually prove to be, and paid for that with her life. It was a heartbreakingly noble act. He had to live up to that sacrifice. I miss her. And 
I miss Alana, but I have to forget her. It really wasn't personal revenge, Captain, Kaida said, concentrating again. That's for small people. It was part of my path to Sith Ascendancy. That must be very distressing, sir, Shevu said. Kaidas felt some deep, raw emotion in him that he couldn't quite place, but it was pity, in a way. Being one of your family? Yes. I'm putting it out of my mind as best I can, because we were very close once. Shevu adjusted his jacket in that awkward way of someone who wanted to end a painful conversation. Try a police tip, sir. When we're faced with something horrible, something disgusting, a terrible crime, we try to forget what we feel about the perpetrator in case the anger distracts us and makes us careless. You know, cutting corners to get the guy. Maybe losing the case in court because of that. So we focus on the victim. We find the pity. Pity keeps us going. We want to give the victims and their family justice. Closure. Think about that sometime, sir. That's very helpful, actually, Captain. Kaidas hadn't thought much about how non-force users might use techniques just as Sith did to channel their emotions productively. Given that Shevu didn't like him, the advice was touching. A recognition that they both had dirty jobs to do. A mutual respect. By the way, I have a title now. Darth Kaidas. Would you mind using it in future? Shevu's expression was now unreadable. Yes, sir. He seemed to be trying out the name under his breath. Do I still call you sir? Jason knew it was a lot to take in at one sitting. Shevu had absorbed it quite well, all things considered. Technically, it's my lord, Jason said. But sir is fine on duty. He glanced at the chrono on the wall feeling a lot more positive than he had for days. The debacle at Fondor was a temporary setback, rapidly receding into the past. He had the Imperial Remnant at his side now, a shadow of its former glory, but still a massively powerful force to be reckoned with. And Shevu understood him and his motives. Kaidas smiled at him as he got up to leave. You know, Captain... I feel the hand of history on my shoulder. I really do. Chapter 19 Ben, I'm so very sorry. You'll hate me if I don't send you this, and you'll hate me when you hear it anyway, so better that you have the evidence than not. It's going to be hard to listen to, my friend, like recorded interviews with suspects often are. Their reasons for what they do, well, they make sense to them. That's all I can say. I can tell you that it took everything I had to keep my reactions under some sort of control. Here's the bad news before you play the recording. His factual account of what went on at Cavan matches the physical evidence. Calm me if you need anything else. I'm always here for you. Captain Lon Shevu, G.A.G., in an encrypted calm to Ben Skywalker, following an interview with the suspect. Former Imperial Outpost, Endor Ben had spent an hour working himself up to playing the holler recording Lon Shevu had risked his life to get. Han and Leia had found a new, safer location for the Jedi base, now Ben stood in the center of the stark room that had been his quarters, all the fixtures and equipment crated for the pullout from Endor. The rickety folding chair had gone. He was sleeping on a G.A.G. issue bedroll, 
with just his mess tin to eat from and a basic hygiene kit. But sitting on a comfortable seat wouldn't have changed a thing. Sooner or later, he would have to move off that spot. He'd have to walk down the dusty passage, picked clean of anything that might be a clue to where the Jedi Resistance had gone, and say to his father, uncle, and aunt that he had things he needed to show them. Here's Jason, Dad. Here's Jason telling my buddy how he killed Mom, and why he had to do it, and why he isn't a bad guy. Ben willed himself to move. It wasn't that he couldn't, not like some weird psychiatric paralysis, but he knew that the moment he shifted his weight and began walking, the short journey would end with showing his family, his poor dad, that awful, awful conversation between Jason and Shevu. The image wasn't good because Shevu had been forced to use a holocam with an aperture like a pinhead, just so it would sit on his tunic unnoticed. The sound was perfect, though. Shevu risked wearing the wire, as he called it, because Jason was so used to G.A.G. officers carrying surveillance kits that nothing like that struck him as unusual. Ironic. The Jedi danger senses that Jason had, the ability to sense weapons and threats, had proved pretty useless to him in the end, because he was constantly surrounded by war and deceit, saturated in it. He'd grown too used to it all as background noise to be filtered out. Do I wish I'd killed him now? He wouldn't have been able to spew out this garbage to Lon about his duty and how much he cares about the galaxy. So just as well I didn't. Ben checked himself. When he had thoughts like that and bile literally rose in his throat, he concentrated on his father and asked if he thought ugly thoughts. It did the trick, usually. Ben forced himself to pass beyond impotent, furious grief. Move. Now. Ben walked. He went to find his father first. On the lower floors, the local Ewok tribe had hauled in temporary furniture so the Jedi and their support staff could have some creature comforts while they waited for the final preparations to be completed. Ben found Jag and Zack in the former briefing room, with their boots up on a rough plank table about knee-high, chatting in dejected tones. Hi, Ben. Jag gestured to the seat next to him. You coming in or what? Are you all right? No, he's not all right, Zack said. I could feel him seething two floors up. Ben needed to take a run at it if he was going to do it at all. No offense, guys, but can you leave? Please? Yeah, but are you sure we can't help? Zek sat up straight and shuffled himself to the edge of the seat. Whatever it is? Actually, you could go find Dad, Uncle Han, and Aunt Leia for me. Tell them I've got stuff to show them, and they all need to see it together. He thought of Jaina, a little later than he should have done. And Jag, can you try to get hold of Jaina? I need to set up a comm so she can hear and see what I show everyone else. Both men shut up right away. There was no more gentle ribbing for Ben these last few days, no attempt to play older brother when he looked so ground down by events. They responded to his officer voice, as Jory LeCouf had called it, and knew he was serious. Jory didn't have to die either. He didn't, Jason. You made me carry out the Gedjin assassination to make me just like you, and Jory was only some detail, one of the small people. Ben didn't want anyone else dying for him. All this? All over me? He set up a table so he could lay out evidence on it, and stand the comm link where it could best transmit the session to Jaina. He simply couldn't face having to repeat it to her. Everyone would think he was doing things by the book, and presenting the same case to everyone like a professional would. 
but the real reason was that he could only hold it together long enough to do this once. He could hear Leia's voice getting closer outside, saying how it would be handy for seeing more of Alana, which he took to mean the new location for the base. When she walked through the door, she stopped in her tracks for a second. Han nearly piled into the back of her. Hey, sweetheart, she said. Whatever it is, we're all here, and we're going to listen to you carefully, okay? It's not me talking, Ben said. The evidence can do that. Han, hands on hips, blew out a breath, then walked up and hugged Ben with one arm in that half-embarrassed male way. Luke came in a few minutes later with his hair disheveled as if he'd been running. Ben shunted the data pads around the tabletop. Plenty of time, Dad, he said quietly. Just waiting for Jag to track down Jaina and get a stable comm connection. Then we'll start. It struck Ben that he'd just pointed Jag at the Jaina issue, and never thought what Zek might feel about it. Take a seat. He couldn't turn and face them all yet, so we must have shuffled those pads and charts a dozen pointless times before Jag came back, brandishing a live comlink. He set it down where Ben showed him. Can you see all this, Jaina? Ben said. She looked as if she was standing in a storage room. Behind her, the walls were covered with shelves loaded with cans and boxes, and the doors were slightly parted. Noisy conversation and the clinking of metal and transparasteel wafted through. A restaurant, maybe. I can see all of you and the table, she said. Okay. Ben had to warn them. This isn't easy to hear. I'm going to show you the physical evidence first, and then a recorded conversation. I'm going to show you things that link Jason to Mom's death and then what he told Captain Shevu about it. Remember that folks sometimes confess to things they haven't done to look tough or to get attention. So compare the physical evidence with what Jason says so you're sure what's true. I'm not going to say what I think. I'll just show you what I've got. Ben took a breath. Oddly, it was easier from this point than he had expected. Using the data pads and projecting the images onto the screen they used for small holocharts, he showed them a copy of the GAG Stealth X log that proved when Jason had left Coruscant, and when he'd returned the vessel to the hangar. He showed them the logs for Mom's flight. He showed them the charts, with Mom's known movements in Hapen space, provided by Hapen ATC, and Tenel Ka's note confirming when Jason had arrived at the palace and then left. He showed the forensics droid, cracked open, and explained how he and Shevu had used it to collect trace evidence from Jason's stealth X. When Ben got to the data about his mother's blood-contaminated hair, he caught his father's eye, after managing to avoid it so far, and then he nearly wavered. The locket. I've still got it. Dad needs that back. But Ben carried on through the recordings he'd made at Cavan showing Mom's body and the surrounding crime scene, to his own brief, detached statement that Jason Solo had found his exact location, even though he had no beacon, made no comms, and was shut down in the force. Then, he played the conversation between Shavu and Jason, and sat back in silence. He couldn't watch this time and just stared into his lap at his clasped hands, hearing Uncle Han inhaling every so often, as if he was about to cough. When he risked a quick glance at Dad and Aunt Leia, both of them had adopted the same posture, right arm across the waist, right hand cupping the left elbow, left hand loosely held to lips. The recording ended. Nobody said anything for a while. It was Jaina who jerked them out of it. Ben, she said softly. 
Pen, can you transmit that recording to me now, please? I need some time to study it. Yeah, sure. Sure. It was an excuse to stand up and occupy his hands while he thought of something to say. Aunt Leia, always the one who said the perfect thing at the perfect time and got everyone organized in a crisis, walked up to him, turned him around slowly by his shoulders, and just held him in silence. When she drew back, there were tears in her eyes. Ben had never seen her cry before. Thanks, Ben, she said. You did a good job, and you did it right. Ben hung on long enough to send Jaina the recording, and then just had to get outside. He scrambled up one of the nearest trees to a platform that had been part of an Ewok walkway into the forest, and sat with his legs dangling, staring out into the haze over the valley. Whether it was a few minutes later or much longer, Ben couldn't remember, but he heard someone climbing the creaking ladder of twisted vines. Then his dad sat down next to him, letting his legs hang over the edge of the platform, too, but with a little less ease, as if his knees were stiff. Ben leaned against his shoulder. They ended up propped against each other, just looking out across the forested slope and watching the day run out of things to say to itself. They didn't talk, either. There was nothing to add, and both of them no longer needed words anyway. It was a flame and garnet sunset, spectacular even by Endor's standards. Bralson, near Keldabe, Fen Shisa's memorial. Jaina knew she should have calmed Fett and told him she was going to be late for their training session. He'd be annoyed. He never got angry, but his annoyance was bad enough, and she was professional enough to get a grip however bad the news, and simply tell him she might be a little distracted today. Instead, she ended up here, under Fen Shisa's imagined scrutiny, cross-legged on the turf with a data pad playing a nightmare in her lap. She replayed Jason's sweetly rational, polite explanation of why people had to die half a dozen times, before she found that she didn't get a pang of recognition when she saw his face, and his words sounded like an alien language, in the way that all words did when you repeated them incessantly. He did it. He really did. Shisa was always a magnet for the ladies, said the voice she was dreading. He's got better luck dead than I have alive. Jaina didn't look up. At least it was some kind of humor, not a dressing down at a time when she wasn't really up to one. Bursting into tears in front of Fett was out of the question. Sorry, Fett. Should have calmed you. I had wasted time to my invoice. He squatted back on his heels, with his arms loosely folded on his knees. It seemed to be a comfortable way of sitting in armor. Jaina wanted to explain what had made her bolt up here for solitude, but showing Fett the recording was probably the quickest and easiest way of getting the message across. Was she betraying her family by showing him the solo's lowest ebb? Would he gloat? She wasn't sure how she'd react if he did. Right now she was just as raw and emotionally devastated as if Jason had died. Her Jason had, of course. Before I show you this, she said, holding the pad out to Fett, it's going to make you mad because it's my brother. And however callous you look, you've got to be devastated by Aelin's murder. Fett took the data pad and thumbed the controls. First time anyone's called it that. Clear cut. Unarmed prisoner. Unarmed interrogator. Don't go all reasonable on me. Jason killed your daughter. I don't do reasonable. 
Sure you want me to see this? Jaina hadn't expected that consideration. But maybe he was even more unfeeling than she thought. Gloating took some emotional attachment. Even his lifetime of Jedi hunting seemed to lack the passion and triumph of full-blooded vengeance. Yes, she said. Tell me what you see. And remember that what he says is corroborated by forensics. Jason telling the truth? Well, well. Fett's tilt of the head suggested he was mulling it over. Then he flicked the key and squatted absolutely motionless while the conversation played. When it ended, he didn't move. Jaina waited for a reaction. Well? What do you want to know? Fett said. Whether he's crazy? Whether he's better dead or locked up? Anything. Suddenly Jaina almost slapped her hand to her mouth, appalled by her own lapse of judgment. Shevu was easy to identify as the man who'd set Jason up. Stang, she really wasn't on top form today. You know the officer risked his life to get that. I know how to keep my mouth shut. You should have noticed by now. Fett still seemed to gaze at the static image on the small holoscreen, although it was hard to tell with a man in a helmet. He could have been talking on his internal comlink for all she knew, because they could switch in and out of audio channels in those sealed bouchese literally in the blink of an eye. But she guessed he was chewing something over that bothered him. Here's what I see, he said. A sane man. Because they all slide down that path when they get power. And then they have to tell themselves lies to explain how they got there and how it wasn't their fault. That's when reality becomes a stranger to them. And there's you, ashamed of yourself, because you're thinking that maybe Mara Skywalker started the ruck. But you want to see her as some uncomplicated, completely innocent victim. Jaina knew it was true, because it hurt so much. And? That's a Barv who nearly got his backside handed to him by Skywalker's wife. He still looks scared when he remembers it, because she went at him like a maniac, just like Bevin showed you. It was the most she'd heard him say in one conversation. He'd need to shut up for a couple of years now to even out his average word count. Jaina was smart enough to recognize uncomfortable truth, though, and began unpicking all the implications in what he'd said. For a man who didn't seem to have a heart or any normal emotions, he knew plenty about everyone else's. It could have been just the sharp eye of a hunter, or he might have felt things more keenly than he let on. Jaina bet on the latter. Yes. I didn't want to think Jason killed Mara. But if he did, I wanted him to be completely to blame, she said. Mara didn't ask for it. Fett put his arm out behind him and shifted into a proper sitting position, legs stretched. She just went to do some necessary pest control. She nearly succeeded. You're saying he needs... that I have to kill him? It's not that simple. Why haven't you ever gone after him personally? Why did you tell your men to leave him for me? Because if I put him down like the vermin deserves, your family can blame that rotten Boba Fett again when the truth wears off, when you need an excuse to stop feeling bad about what you had to do. No. You clear up your own mess. I wondered, am I standing back to let the Solos and Skywalkers fight each other 
because I want them to suffer? No, it's only Jason who deserves it. And on balance, I'd prefer to see him live a long time in a lot of pain. Like I've said before, he's no use to me dead. Jaina tried to work out if she was on the receiving end of a subtle gloating lecture from Fett, or if he'd brooded about this long enough to have a lot of words looking for an outlet. Even her force senses strained to pick up clues. He really did seem to be thinking aloud, trying to find some answers. Jaina felt suddenly irrelevant. You can manage quite long sentences, can't you? It's all billable time, Solo. You hate Jedi. I understand that. Seeing your father killed, having to survive on your own... No, you don't get it. But if any of your kind could, it'd be you. Fett put his weight on one arm and jumped to his feet, looking pretty fit for his age. He walked off down the slope toward Kaldabe and didn't look back. With the 360-degree sensor in his HUD, he didn't need to. Jaina wasn't sure she'd had an answer at all, but she had a stack of extra questions. She broke her own rule and scrambled after him. Hey, don't give me the cryptic treatment, Fat. Jaina reached up from behind for his right shoulder and a little force pull made him turn. That probably didn't help, given the topic. Jedi killed your father. You hunted mine. I went on hating you and feeling pretty unfriendly about Mandalorians for a long time. We all do it. I'm trying to keep this simple. What? Mace Windu killed Dad. The barf ends up taking a walk out Palpatine's window, so I don't get to blow his brains out. Add a few years of lashing out at any Jedi, and then I stop and ask why I carry on. Because Force users are all trouble. Sith, Jedi, no difference. Although the Sith always paid well. Every big war since the Old Republic, apart from the Vaughn, has been about you two having your sectarian conflicts and dragging everyone else in. I say it. Guys like Venku say it. And then folks start thinking that maybe galactic peace doesn't include you. You'd starve if you didn't have a war to go to. Making virtue out of necessity. And we're peacekeepers. You can't always do that by appealing to folks' better nature. Yeah, I forgot. The compassionate Jedi. He held out his palm. Give me your lightsaber. I left all mine at home. Why? Give. Jaina took the hilt off her belt, and thought that only a Jedi who put excessive faith in her Force certainties would hand a lightsaber to an irritated Fett. He snapped the blade casually into life. He'd handled the weapons more than he admitted, that was clear, and sliced the humming beam clean through the branch of a small tree. Then he shut it off, tossed the hilt back to her, and bent to grab the severed wood. A weapon for a civilized age, you reckon? Fett thrust the end of the branch into her face so she could see it was a clean cut, not a lot of sap. You cut someone's head off. You trap enough oxygenated blood in the brain for two minutes consciousness, maybe. Then go and retrieve your dad's body parts and see how well you sleep some nights. Fett walked away again, and this time Jaina let him go. 
It was a little while before she recovered enough to think of yelling after him to demand how many of his kills had been instantaneous. But that was probably for the best. One moment she was close to thinking they had a good understanding, the next it was war again. Was this his plan all along? To set her up to harm her own brother, so the most powerful Jedi families could tear themselves apart? You can go crazy thinking like this. He's just a man. It's your own brother who's plotting and planning. Fett hadn't planned to see his daughter getting killed, and he hadn't known Jaina was going to show up asking him to make her a Jedi hunter. He was an injured but dangerous bystander, landing a punch any way he could. Okay, Jason. Would you think twice about killing me if I got in your way like Mara did? Jaina thought she knew the answer, but the next minute she doubted herself. Combat training was definitely out for the day. She decided to use the downtime to try building bridges with another Mandalorian who probably didn't want to talk to her. Gotob, or whatever his name had been when he'd still used a lightsaber. It must have been a very hard life for him. He must have been mad to choose it. Or desperate. Maybe the last place anyone would look for a Jedi was in the middle of hostile country like this. Bevin Vassar Farm, near Kaldabe. Mirta, where have you been? Sintas asked. Been on a job, Babuir. Fett watched Sintas making her way competently around the room, navigating by touch. Watching her when she couldn't see him made him uncomfortable now. He was predatory, intruding. He wanted more than anything to do what was right for her, but he was going around in circles. She located Myrta, and the two women hugged. What job, sweetheart? We seized an Imperial Star Destroyer. Sintas parted her lips slightly, then laughed. Oh, just a little job. Nobody hurt? Loads of people. But not us. I can remember how to strip down a blaster. You were a bounty hunter, Babuir. I can recall chasing a man who had something I wanted back. A metal box. I'd better remember how I did it if I want to earn a living again. Watching Sintas desperately grabbing at scraps of her life and trying to build herself back into a whole woman, made Fett feel scared and dirty. It reminded him that he'd failed in every aspect of living, except his job. Except killing people. It wasn't the killing that bothered him. It was the failing, and not being like his dad. Django Fett had taught him how to be a perfect soldier— but he'd also shown him by example how to be the ideal father. He'd managed one out of two. Sin, he said. You never have to worry about scraping a living again. I owe you credits. A lot. I'm paying up. Sintas felt her way toward him. She was going to touch him. He could see it coming, and he dreaded it, because it was going to bring it all back, not just the memories that were better left forgotten, but the way it felt to touch her, because that part of his life was dead and buried. You left her. She found his hand and took it. I know I must have married you for a good reason, and whatever went wrong, you still seem like a good man. Sin, there's some more bad news you need to know. She still had a grip on his hand. He'd seen her at her best and worst, although she'd never seen the best of him, and he never got over how beautiful she always was, whatever the circumstances. He needed her to let go of his hand, but he didn't want her to. 
There was nothing salvageable in the relationship, and he didn't even want to hear himself think, if only. Imagine if you'd both been happy when she went missing, though. Imagine pining all those years, getting her back so many years later, and then having to face the separation of age. That she couldn't want you again, even if she tried. Yes, it was better this way, if it had to happen at all. I can feel some of the things in the heart of fire, she said, but I can't make sense of it. Okay. Sit down, he steered her to a chair. Myrta watched as if she was waiting to pounce on any mistake. Our daughter died. Sintas took the news with a few blinks. It was a while before she spoke again. I feel bad that I can't remember enough about her. What happened to her? She must have been an adult, because Myrta's here. It was a guessing game, and Fett hated those at the best of times. I'm going to get it all over with now or I'll just be giving you a fresh bit of misery every day, he said. Or maybe it's because I need to blurt and run. She was killed, Sin. She was a bounty hunter. She blamed me for you going missing on a job, because I should have been there to look after you both. She stalked me for years, and she tried to kill me. But she got picked up by the secret police on Coruscant, and she died under interrogation. She was fifty-three or fifty-four, I think. And that's about it. Except she raised Myrta to hate me, too. And Myrta tried to kill me. But we got that out of our systems. Myrta was as tough as they came. She just stood there, and the expression on her face was acceptance. The boil was lanced. Sintas did a reasonable job of controlling the shock, but her lips moved silently as she tried framing a question and failed for a few moments. The anguished expression in her eyes was all the worse for the fact that Fett knew she couldn't even see their expressions. Regret, guilt, pain, anger. That's what you're missing, Sin. But I bet you can imagine it well enough. The Barv who killed my girl. Where is he? Is he still alive? I'll fix that. Sintas burst in anger. Maybe it was all so terrible and alien that she was too shocked to cry and Fett knew it was better to act rather than feel. And how could you want to kill your own grandfather, Myrta? You didn't even know him. Life was unraveling again. Fett had tried to do it right and take the blame as he deserved, and now it was spinning off like a broken rotor and hitting Myrta, who'd stuck by her mother through thick and thin. Fett felt that his whole life had been about others taking the shrapnel from the blasts he caused. Don't blame her, Sin, he said. Whether Aelin knew it or not, she was right to loathe me. The only good news is that I'm a rich old man now, and you're still young, so I can pay, and you can do some living. That was his emotional limit. He'd hit the end stop today. If he'd been like Bevin, all heart and pure courage, unafraid of love or the risk of being hurt by it, he'd have held Sintas, and told her all the little details that would have softened the blow and made more sense of it once the shock wore off. But he wasn't Bevin, nowhere near. He almost got the whole thing off his chest and told her why they'd split up, but he lost his nerve, 
There was a limit to how much Osik could hit the fan, after all. I'll see you later, he said. I think we can find a special doctor to get your memory back. And maybe your sight. Sintas had her hand to her mouth now, in a kind of slow-burn horror. Well, at least I'll be ready for it. I'm sorry. She rubbed her eyes. I'm sorry too, Bo. She didn't even seem to realize she'd said it. Bo. It was what she'd always called him. Go on, Myrta said. You've got things to do. I'll sit here a while. Fett tried to calculate how many hours he'd spent with Sintas since she'd been revived, and it probably didn't add up to a full day. No, it wouldn't be any different this time, even if the years they'd lost were magically erased. He couldn't face spending time with people. As he slipped out of the farmhouse, Bevin was sawing planks in the front yard. How's it going? he asked looking as if he knew anyway. Bad. Could be worse. This was Bevin's home, and somehow Fett filled it with the detritus of his own disastrous life, and Bevin never complained. The man found room for Fett's damaged ex-wife and a passing Jedi whose family was pretty well as screwed as Fett's now. He had to ask or else it'd look as if he was the only person who didn't realize that Bevin had saved him time after time. Why do you bail me out all the time, Goron? And don't say it's because it's duty to the Mandalore. Because nobody can live the way you do, and not notice how much it hurts. Bevin carried on sawing. I suppose it's me being grateful for not being that way. Bevin never pulled his punches. I don't understand why any of you do it, Fett said. Shisa, Spar, why didn't they say Fett doesn't care? Why should I do anything for him? I didn't even know Spar. I hear Spar did it for Shisa, actually because he told him Mandalore needed to look strong and stable to the outside world, like the Fets were back. Fett never kidded himself it was because of his lovable personality. He had his uses, but then that was how he treated everyone else, so he had nothing to complain about. And problems went away if you threw enough credits at them. Buy an assassin, a bounty hunter— or someone to look after your neglected wife. The only one that wouldn't go away with a good dose of creds was time. But Myrta was right. He had things to do, and if he didn't, he'd find some. He strode back to Slave One, opened the comm, and called his broker. They said the man could acquire anything. He could prove it, then— by finding the biggest blue heart of fire gem on the market, the rarest and costliest of gems. Or you bought Tapcalf, Keldabe. They said you wanted to see me, Jedi. Jaina looked up. She'd felt him coming anyway. Gotab left a very distinctive impression in the Force. Venku, always hovering close to support the old man if he faltered, was a dim light next to him. They were both edgy and a little hostile. I do, Gotab, she said, and stood to pull up a chair for him. Chom the barkeep lined up ales. And you, Venku, please sit down. Both men lifted off their helmets. She could see Fett reflected clearly in Venku, now that she was so familiar with that face. The mouth was different, but this was definitely Fett's genetic material. She'd learned fast not to call it family. You want something from me, Gotab said. 
Spit it out. You're a healer. Am I right? He pulled off both gauntlets, revealing age-spotted, veined hands, and held them up. Yes, I did a lot of healing. I look even older than I already am, don't I? Drains you, healing. How many folks here know you're a Jedi? I used to be a Jedi, he said quietly. I left the Order sixty years ago and became a Mondoad. But I suppose I'm pretty easy to spot for someone strong in the Force like you. What about you, then, Venku? They still hadn't said whether anyone knew what they were. You're harder to pin down, but you can use the Force, can't you? I can, Venku said, but I avoid it. So who knows? Nobody, I bet. Are you scared even now? Come on. I know what it's like to be a Jedi and walk into a cantina full of Mondos. Why do you care? Gotab said. In case it has serious consequences for you, of course. Venku and Gotab looked at each other, as if in some unspoken debate. Venku sighed and shook his head. Buir, he said. If you want to come clean after all these years, and any Mondoad so much as looks at you the wrong way, you know I'd kill them. After all you've done for Mandalore, nobody can call you Jetu. And what about you, Kataka? I'm not that much use to the Kaminoans now. Gotab snorted. Fett would still sell you. Jaina realized she'd hit a few nerves. And now Fett's name had been mentioned, she knew she would hit a few more. So you don't like Fett, she said. Gotab shrugged. He's completely amoral. He cared nothing for Mandalore when we were occupied by the Empire. I'm missing something here, Gotab. So let me tell you what I'm asking for. Jaina was surprised to feel an urge to defend Fett. He wasn't completely without morals. He had principles, all right, pretty rigid ones, but they didn't fit a lot of folks' idea of ethics. Fett's ex-wife, Sintas. She was stored in carbonite for over thirty years, and now she's blind and suffering from amnesia. I was hoping you might be able to heal her. She's done well to recover as far as she has, but there's not much more that doctors can do. You sure she wants to remember being married to Fett? He asked. It was probably a random insult, but maybe Gotab knew that their past was a messy one. He thinks it's fairer if she knows everything so she can make better decisions about her future. Gotab leaned back in his seat and looked at Venku as if they'd had a bet on something. Well, I've lived to see a lot of unexpected things. But Fett growing a conscience. Hwa'i. Venku took one of the glasses of Natragal, the sticky sweet black ale, and stared into it. You probably guessed that we have misgivings about Fett, although he's lived up to more of his responsibilities as Mandalore lately. So you wouldn't help his ex-wife? Will it help her? Well, staying blind and not recalling much of your past, not even your own kid, doesn't sound a better deal than finding out what a scumbag your husband might have been. Jaina was getting impatient. She needed to know if exposing the two men as Jedi would end in trouble. And if your neighbors know what you are, will you have to go into hiding? The doors parted, and Carid came in with a couple of other men, laughing loudly. He waved to Jaina as if she were just another regular. She couldn't imagine him coming after this frail old man and harming him for once having been a Jedi. 
If Gotab had been here for sixty years, then he must have known that Mandalorians, however violent and uncompromising, tended not to blame folks for who their parents or brothers were. On Mandalore, you could erase your past. It's going to come as a shock to Fett, for a start, said Venku. But maybe it's time, because even if anyone knew and wanted to exploit it, they'd have to take me first, and I don't come from a family of pushovers. Look, just tell me. Sixty years was a long time to sit on a secret that big. It grew to be a habit, and then it probably became unthinkable to imagine naming it. Jaina knew the size of the secrets in her own family, the ones about her grandfather. The longer she spent with Fett and the Mandalorians, the more she saw of how parallel their lives were in so many ways and she wondered how much of that had fueled the animosity. I was a Jedi general in the Clone Wars, Gotab said at last. I left the Order because I couldn't stomach how we talked about compassion, and then turned a blind eye to using human clones for our slave army. The clones I served with were my brothers— I helped them escape. I healed them. I did whatever I could to atone for the wrong that Jedi did those men. And Venku, Kodika, his mother was a Jedi, and his father was a clone soldier. We hid from the Empire for years, because they could have bred a whole new clone army from him. We hid so well that not even Fett's fixer, that Bevin, knew who we were, or even what our true clan name was. It didn't answer the question about Fett, but Jaina felt she'd pushed it as far as she could go. Living in fear and secrecy bred a certain paranoia. So, would you do it? for Sintasvel? Healing's hard work, Venku said. Look what it's done to him. Fett would pay, and if he wouldn't, I would. Gotab nodded, as if she'd confirmed something. Well, your brother killed her daughter. It's the least you can do. Was there anyone here? who didn't know every sordid detail of her family's troubles. But I don't want your credits. Or fets. I'll do it because I can. It's wrong to refuse, just because the poor woman used to be married to Fett. It was a breakthrough. She's at Bevin's farm. They're not going to think we're Kifar anymore, are they? said Gotab. No, but nobody's persecuting Jedi these days. It's not like the Purge. Venku hadn't drunk much of his ale, and Gotab hadn't even touched his. Venku stood up, making it clear the meeting was over. That would explain why the Jedi Council has fled from Coruscant, he said, because it's totally okay to be a Jedi now. They didn't miss much, even if they did live in the wilds, and wilds here must have been seriously isolated. You're not a Jedi, though, Jaina said. You were never trained. No and I'm all for keeping Jedi away from government. And Sith, of course. But I'll still always be a Force-sensitive, however hard I try not to be, and that won't always sit well with folks if they know about it. They think you mess with their minds. Jaina wanted to press a credit chip into Gotab's hand, because he needed to eat as much as anyone, but she didn't know how he'd react. 
she went back to the farm and spent the rest of the daylight hours overhauling Bevin's harvester droid and composing endless messages to Jag in her head. But when she got to the point of committing anything to the datapad, it all seemed like too much to tell him. In the end, she avoided calming him or her parents, and just sent a message to all of them saying everything was fine, and that she'd be in touch soon, and that flying a Besulik was a lot of fun. They'd all seen Jason's confession. Fine and fun didn't come into it. She felt guilty for expressing such trivial sentiments. Sometimes, though, life needed the illusion that ordinary pleasures still existed, and could be found again even after the depths of misery. That evening, while she was eating dinner with Bevin's family and making Schalk and Brila giggle by moving their plates with a force push, she felt Gotab and Venku approaching the farmhouse. Bevin, she said, trying not to say it in front of the kids. It's Gotab. He's the one who's going to be doing the healing. He's a Jedi. He used to be, anyway. Don't punish him, please. He's been one of you for nearly sixty years. Bevin and Medrit looked at each other, and it was obvious that Fett's fixer, as Gotab called Bevin, was clearly rattled that a secret of that magnitude had eluded him. He chewed thoughtfully, gaze fixed on the pot of calf on the table. We won't even tell Fett it's him, if he's that scared he said at last. Well, fancy that. The J.T. throwing his lot in with us. Puts Venku in an interesting context, though. Much as Jaina liked Bevin, she didn't think he needed to know that Venku was the son of a Jedi. If Venku wanted anyone to know, he could tell them himself. She'd already gone far enough. She smiled as best she could. Gotab's a healer. Remember? Maybe Venku owes him an old debt of honor. It was probably true. It was true enough for her not to feel guilty about saying it. Bevin got up to let Gotab in, and Medrit gave Jaina a knowing look. Danua and Jintar distracted the kids. We'd always heard rumors, Medrit said. Never thought it was Gotob, though. Jaina wished she'd thought ahead a little more and moved Sintas to the Oyubat for the healing session. I'm sure he's paid his debt to society. He didn't have a choice to be a Jedi, did he? No, but he chose to be one of you. Then the matter's closed, Medrit said. Schalk stared at him in the way that only a voraciously curious child could when he thought the grown-ups were talking secrets. And that makes Jane Skirata one of his clan, which is even more interesting. Gotab edged into the room with Venku looming over him like a bodyguard, and the two children stared at him. They didn't say a word. Gotab nodded politely and followed Jaina into Sintas's room. So, do you work miracles? Sintas asked, turning her head towards him. I could do with one. You can still say no, Gotab said. You know you have tragedy in your past. Sintas, amnesiac or not, showed a streak of tough resolve that must have stood her in good stead as a bounty hunter. Then I'll face it, she said, because it's part of who I am. Jaina suddenly felt pity for the whole Fett clan, imagining what it might be like to lose Jag and then find him again when she was too old and their bond was too damaged. Nothing could put Fett's family right. 
Myrta's children would be the first to grow up with a chance of ordinary happiness. It was a wake-up call for Jaina, too. Stay, Gotab said to her. Just in case we need a little extra force help. Force healing was low-key and tedious for a spectator. Gotab sat on the edge of Sintas's bed and placed both hands gently on her head. Even for Jaina, used to meditation, two hours of sitting with relative strangers and saying nothing was a trial. Oh, Sintas said at one point, Oh, that's... that's odd. Gotab smiled. It transformed him. I've healed brain injuries before, and my patients tell me they get disjointed flashbacks. Don't be afraid. It's not memories, Sintas said. I can see flashes of light. Jaina felt genuine elation. It sounded as if the impulses to the optic nerve were getting through again. How many sessions might this take? I don't know, Gotab said. He took one hand off Sintas's forehead and moved the lamp closer to her. I've never healed a kifar before. Sintas flinched. I can see the contrast. She rubbed her eyes, straining, and turned to the lamp. I can see light and dark. Jaina tempered her own excitement with the reminder that if Sintas's memory came back, it wouldn't be quite as welcome. Gotab seemed to be flagging. Venku took the old man's elbow and steered his hand back to his side. Enough for tonight, Buir, he said. Jaina knew he wasn't really Venku's father, but she wasn't sure if the term was simply respect or an indication of adoption. Let's get some rest. We have a long way to go. Medrit gave Venku a package as he left, a bundle of packets that looked like an assortment of meat and preserves. Mandalore was still a hungry place to live. I'm sure Fett will be grateful, he said. No need. Gotab headed for the door, leaning on Venku's arm. It's for Sintas Vel, not him. And don't feel so bad about never finding us when Fett sent you after the clone with gray gloves. Jang is an expert at covering his tracks. The best there is, as are we. Bevin listened to the speeder's drive fade into the night. I think I scared them off, he said. I don't know if they'll come back. Jaina lay awake that night, wondering what would happen when it got around, as things seemed to do here, about Gotab and Venku. Had either of them had kids? Were there Force-sensitive Mandalorians everywhere? It was all getting complicated, and making her mind race when she needed to sleep, and to concentrate on making the most of the training time she had with Fett. Sound carried a long way in the quiet night, and she could hear some celebration still in progress at Levitt's farm a little way down the dirt road. Revelers were laughing raucously, and she was on the point of storming over there through the field and snarling at them to shut up so she could get some sleep, just like a Mondo woman would. Then there was a sudden, complete silence, before a lone male voice, a surprisingly sweet tenor, began singing a slow ballad with the kind of perfect top notes that caught her off guard, and made her throat ache and her eyes fill with tears for no reason. One by one, other voices joined in, until it was a choir. Jaina couldn't understand a word of it, except for Mondo Ade and Mondayim. It still transfixed her. She held her breath. The chorus repeated twice, and then the voices trailed off one by one, 
to leave the solo tenor to fade into silence. The song spoke to her of yearning for home, and loves left waiting for the warrior's return. She was having trouble fighting back incipient tears. She made her way downstairs and found Bevine pottering around the kitchen doing chores in total silence. You're very stealthy, she whispered. I didn't know you were awake. Singing, he said. I'm not a heavy sleeper. It's my suspicious nature. Yeah, I heard it too. It was absolutely beautiful. Is it a love song? It sounds so lonely and longing. Bevin stifled a laugh. It roughly translates as, Nobody likes us, but we don't care because we're Mondos, and we're the best. Sorry to spoil the illusion, but we do have our mournful ballads. He cocked an ear in the direction of Sintas's room. I think she's having nightmares. Whatever Gotab's done, the old neural pathways are connecting again. Sintas was definitely having nightmares. Jaina listened outside for a while, and then went in to sit with her just in case she woke up screaming. She was thrashing around, muttering incoherently, and the only words Jaina could understand were, You could have told them! Jaina found herself unable to keep her eyes open, and dozed in the chair. She woke with a start. Sintas was sitting up, and it was starting to get light outside. Stang, Sintas said. Daylight. You can see? I can. That's excellent news. Jaina took her hand. You were having a nightmare. I had a dream, but I don't think it was one. I remembered something. There was a bounty I was hunting... But I ended up being grabbed, and there was this barb saying I'd be worth something for ransom, and he shot me full of some sedative or other. Someone who knew you were Fett's ex-wife? Bo. Oh. oh, Stang, it's coming back. Bo never took kindly to anyone messing with me, even after we split up. Then there was... Oh, Aelin... No, Jaina braced for some trauma to emerge. Just ending up in Carbonite would have been enough, but she had all the bounty hunter baggage, plus Fett, and then a dead daughter. Hey, take it easy. She was so excited. I said I'd be back from the job in time to take her to Coruscant, see the big city, buy her some nice things. Aelin had been about sixteen. Carbonite and fate had wiped out the best part of forty years and a family lifetime that could have been. Sintas seemed as tough as old boots, but tears were now streaming down her face. Oh, she said. He shot someone. That didn't narrow it down much. Jaina handed her a cloth to wipe her face. Maybe you need some meds to slow all this down a little. No, no, I need to remember this. I need to. Sintas put her hand to her mouth. Aelin. And then Myrta. Whatever did I say that made her go and do all that? I never told her about it. We never talked. I never told her why Bo and I divorced. Myrta thought he abandoned you. It was definitely none of Jaina's business and she shouldn't have said it. Too late now. Aelin blamed his not being around for your... well, death. I know, but... Look, Bo was exiled for murder. It wasn't like that. It was much more complicated. Jaina preferred Fett's more succinct analyses, He'd left her, and he obviously felt bad about the effect it had on her. 
It sounded pitifully small and domestic. The kind of stuff the divorce lawyers thrived on. Not the catalyst for a vendetta on Aelin's scale that ended up with Jason killing her. But Sintas was getting increasingly distraught as memories were starting to connect. She seemed to have a much more complicated recollection of the breakdown of their marriage. So the law had caught up with Fett at least once in his life. All that surprised Jaina was that he'd been caught at all. But he'd always have his reasons. She knew that by now. I think I'd better go and get Myrta, Jaina said. No, please. Not yet. You look like a sympathetic person who understands how families can tear themselves apart. They said Kifar people were psychic. They weren't wrong there. Sintas had the Solos and Skywalkers down pat. Okay, said Jaina. But I still think I should go get your granddaughter. Not yet, Sintas said. I need to work out how I'm going to explain this to her. That her grandfather was exiled for killing the man who raped me. His superior officer. Chapter 20 My Lord Kaidus, I disobeyed your instructions about where to search for the Jedi Council, and went back to the locations where Luke Skywalker had hideouts in his rebel days. I'm now on Endor. There's an old Imperial base here, just full of Force energy, even though the camp's been abandoned. The Jedi have been here very recently, but I don't know where they've gone. Yet. Calm message from Tahiri Vela, Sith Apprentice, to Darth Kytus, Dark Lord of the Sith and Chief of State of the Galactic Alliance. Kaldabe Mandalore, a week later. Myrta and Orade had exchanged marriage vows that morning, Vevut said, and so it was high time to have a few drinks and celebrate. Fett heard about it from Bevin. If he allowed himself to think about it too much, it would eat at him. He sat in Slave One's cockpit, half listening to the HNE financial news while he did the maintenance on his hut. Mandalore, self-sufficient and well able to pull itself up by its bootstraps minus Fett, went on thriving all around him. You have to give her the stone. It won't change a thing, but at least she can sell it, and she might even listen to what it's got to say. He fished in his belt pouch and held the oval stone up to the light from the viewscreen. A royal blue heart of fire, as rare as they came, five centimeters long and superbly cut, his broker had done pretty well to find it. If he held it just so, the rainbow of colors was complete. He peered into its heart with a magnifier from his HUD toolkit and admired the play of internal fire that created the iridescence. Geologists said it was due to microscopic bubbles of pinaclite trapped when the crystal was first formed, and also that the substance might have explained the stone's ability to store data from people who'd owned it. Kifar preferred the more mystic explanation, that it trapped a little bit of the soul of both giver and receiver. It definitely did record something. Gotab, the barve was a Jedi, and Fett had worked that out, even if Bevin didn't want to discuss it, could certainly skim Fett's unhappy marital history from it in painful detail. He wondered how much he'd burden Sintas if some of his soul got trapped in the magnificent blue stone. You know the thing actually does it. You had proof. Loud hammering on the side viewscreen made him look up. Bevin was standing on the hull, making impatient gestures. Sopen, Fett said. Get your shebs to your granddaughter's wedding feast, Bobica. 
Bevin stood in the hatchway in his cobalt blue armor, with a dark navy leather comma, the traditional Mandalorian half kilt. He didn't normally wear that. It was his holiday best for a special day. It's a disgrace if you don't. Fett held up the gem between thumb and forefinger. Matches your Beskar gem. For Myrta? Sin. Is that a good idea? It's a goodbye. I'm not delusional. Bevin just shook his head. She'd probably prefer one of your properties. I'm way ahead. Fett reached inside his dump pouch and slid out a flimsy envelope, the kind old-fashioned lawyers used. Portfolio here of shares and property. She'll never have to worry about bounty hunting again. When you give it to her, say that— Shab, Bobica, Bevin said. Tell her yourself. It's one errand I'm not running for you. But when you want to tell me what happened— I mean what really happened. Then you know where I am. Bevin jumped down off the airframe, comma slapping against his plates, and stalked off. How did he think Fett could show up to celebrate her marriage with what Sintas had told her? It was better that the girl had a fresh start and got swept up in a clan that didn't have a reputation like the Fett one or its remarkable bad luck. Sintas won't want for anything, nor Myrta. It's the least I can do. Fett went on tinkering with his helmet and wondering if Jaina Solo had what it took to deal with her brother. What's the matter, Bo? said a voice behind him. Don't you worry about security anymore? He stopped. Sintas was right behind him. She wasn't going to leave his life in a tidy, anesthetized way. He'd been naive to think he could avoid the pain. I can leave my hatch open here. I don't have to worry about Mondo's sin. That's just what Jaster said. And look what happened to him. So... As soon as I get my memory back and I can see, you're gone again. Still angry? No. He waited for her to edge forward into the front of the cockpit and look at him. But she stayed aft. I'm glad you're okay. And why haven't you shown at Myrta's celebration? Cowardice. I told Myrta the truth. She's devastated. You shouldn't have done it before her wedding. Bo, I never made Aelin hate you. I never told her anything. That was the problem. She filled in the gaps too much. I should have explained, but I wanted us to get on with our lives. Forget you. Hey, you know. I know. But Fett knew that he could have stayed in touch, or visited, and then Aelin would at least have seen he was around, and not totally callous, just mostly. It might not have made any difference in the end. I'm not good at telling people things either. If you'd told the magistrate why you shot him— You'd never have been convicted. And have everyone know what he did to you? You didn't tell anyone. You didn't want it dragged out in public. There was only one thing Fett could have done with a scumbag like Lenovar. He wasn't just any rapist, although that would have been bad enough. He was a journeyman protector. Fett's superior officer on Conquered Dawn, a constable who should have been upholding the law, not betraying his uniform and Fett's trust. If I could have killed him a few more times, I would have. No, 
The only regrets Fett had were the stupid rows with Sin. The cruel things he'd asked about whether Aelin was really his, and all the words that couldn't be unsaid now. She would never have told him about Lenovar. Finding out for himself had been the tipping point. Unrepentant, the magistrate said. You bet I was. With the fights and recriminations and everything he owned taken by the courts, and then the exile, how did anyone repair a marriage after that? Better men did all the time, but he didn't know how. Sintas edged closer behind the pilot seat. Fett thought it was better if she didn't have yet another illusion ruined. I'd have gone anywhere with you, Bo, she said. I didn't care if we lost everything. I know. I was the one who didn't have what it took. The last time I saw your face. What were you? Nineteen? Close enough. She was desperate to look at him. Fifty-odd years. He understood why she needed to, but it was still a bad idea for both of them. Being Sintas, she did it anyway. She slid around in front of his seat and looked into his eyes. Her mid-thirties, perfect. Him, over seventy, and with a savage life in those absent years that etched itself in every pore. Oh, Bo, whatever happened to you? I survived. She could have looked more shocked. She just seemed ripped up by regret, but not half as much as he was. She touched the scars on his cheek. Scars that had been etched by the sarlacc's acid. It was another story he needed to tell her. Come and see, Myrta, she said. Please? She'll give me the full number on why it was my fault for not telling her. No. She's a big girl now. She knows things are never as black and white as we want them to be. Sintas had never expected him to be eloquent, which was a blessing right then. He handed her the envelope. That was the simplest bit. Got a few things for you. Bo, you don't have to do that. Just shut up and take it. Shisa would have done this so much better. He could do anything with a grin and that accent. And I should have bought you one of these at the time. And this is yours anyway. Fett went back to calibrating his HUD, just so he didn't have to watch. Sin could do the strong and silent routine just as well as he could, as long as their eyes didn't meet. I know what's in the canister, she said, and I can't look at it right now. It was the only hollow image of the three of them as a family in that short, idyllic time before it all collapsed. But you're insane to buy me the stone. I'm never worth that much. Sell it. It's yours. I've got the first one. Half of it. And a lot's happened since. So there'll be a different set of fat memories in the bluestone. If you ever want to do some catching up. Fett wondered if Myrta had taken her to visit Aelin's grave yet. The problem with Myrta telling Sintas that he'd gone to so much trouble to recover Aelin's body and then buried her with half of the heart of fire was that it made him look like a nice, normal, loving father. And however decent his motives were when he destroyed his marriage— He'd never been man enough in the years that followed to visit his family and try to repair the rift. It took more guts than facing an army. You get the life you deserve, Fett. Everyone does. 
Sin. After I left. Did you find someone else? She was holding the blue heart of fire between both palms, one flat above, one below, almost as if she was rolling it, eyes a little distant, as if she'd already started listening to its silent voice. I did, Bo, more than once, she said at last, but in our line of work it never lasts, does it? You? I don't remember, he lied. She could tell anyway. Let's go do the family thing then. Sintas put the stone in the hip pocket of her pants. Just this once. He hadn't finished calibrating the HUD, but he put his helmet on anyway. And once it was on, he looked like the bow she once knew and loved, and the lost years vanished for a brief time. They went to Myrta's feast. Maybe Sintas would do that Kifar thing with the new heart of fire, and read and discover everything that had happened to him while they were apart, and what he just couldn't manage to tell her, even now. It was just three words, but it was three too many for Boba Fett. Novak Vevut's home, Keldabe, wedding feast of Myrta Gev and Ges Orade. I've found a use for Jedi, Carrie bellowed. I knew I would one day. Look! The line of ale bottles stretched the length of the Duraplast trestle table in Vevut's crowded courtyard. Jaina concentrated, knowing how critical the timing would be. Then she inhaled slowly stepped back, and force-pulled all thirty caps off in a rapid sequence that popped and rattled like a Lewitt pyrocracker. Froth welled from the necks of the bottles. The guests showed their approval with shouts of, Oh yeah! and Kondosi! hammering their fists on the thigh plates of their armor. Jaina took a bow. Now you know why Jedi apprentices spend years in quiet contemplation and earnest study at the Academy. The celebratory feast was packed. Guests had spilled out from the courtyard onto the grass outside the low retaining wall. A man in gray armor had an animal with him, a predator with a deeply folded coat and six legs. When she passed, it looked up sharply as if it recognized her and made plaintive grumbling noises, slapping its whip-like tail on the ground. Myrta edged through the crowd toward her, not looking radiant or blushing. Jaina could sense her misery, but she also knew the specific cause of it, because Sintas had told her. A single traumatic event, whose consequences had spiraled out of control, and finally fed into the crisis that now engulfed Jaina's own family, and much of the galaxy. It wasn't a direct causal chain, but it was so close and personal now that it might as well have been. Fifty-odd years ago, what was happening to us right then? Mom was growing up on Alderaan, Uncle Luke was on Tatooine, no idea what was coming ten years down the line. Dad. Dad was probably learning to steal speeders. And Sintas, who none of us knew or even thought about until this year, was a teenager with a baby daughter going through the worst time of her life. And none of us knew that we'd end up on this collision course. Myrta finally pushed through the sea of bodies and steered Jaina to a quieter corner. Babuir was here with Grandmama earlier, but I can't find them now, Myrta said. They've probably got some talking to do. All I can think of now is, what if I'd killed him? But you didn't. You don't understand, Jaina. It's all I can remember with my mama now. She built her whole life around hating Fred and making him pay, from the work she did to the man she married. 
and everything she taught me. I grew up on hatred. But you've changed all that, Myrta, Jaina said. You stopped that cycle, didn't you? That takes some doing. Put it behind you. Live your life. I think Fett wants you to be happy, even if he doesn't give you any clues. I'm talking about what I nearly did. I was going to kill him. If your mother hadn't diverted my blaster back on Corellia, he'd be dead now. Myrta hadn't struck Jaina as the kind of woman who worried about things like that. She was hard, pure and simple, an unsentimental and unforgiving woman. But in all that struggle to survive, and all the violence she had meted out, there remained someone who could challenge the core of her upbringing. It was an extraordinary strength. What ifs can be corrosive, Jaina said. You should... It's not about me, Jaina. It's about you. How do you think it feels when you find out that none of the events happened the way you thought, or even happened at all, but you were prepared to kill your own flesh and blood on the strength of it. You think I'm going to kill my brother. I think you need to hear from someone who nearly killed their own grandfather. Think about what it'll do to you. Myrta, he murdered your mother. He killed my aunt. Jaina had an image of Jason in her mind as he once was, and then imagined bringing a lightsaber down across his neck. It made her unsteady for a moment. Are you saying I should forgive him? Is that what this is all about? No. I think there are things you can't forgive. But executing someone is a step beyond. And if you're thinking about it, just remember me. Jaina seriously considered a little careful mind influence right then, just to stop Myrta being broken-hearted and guilt-ridden on her wedding day. But given Myrta's strength of will, Jaina was sure it would bounce right off her. She didn't even try. No disrespect to your granddad, she said. But he wasn't totally blameless, was he? I can imagine how much damage it does to a marriage when something that awful happens— but other folks handle it differently. He could have, too. He could have stayed in touch, at least. When you've got the blaster in your hand, and his back lined up in your crosswires, it doesn't feel like that. And things happened to him to make him that way. Maybe they happened to your brother, too. I can't believe you're pleading for Jason, Jaina said. If he walked in here now, wouldn't you shoot him dead for what he did to your mother? Yes, I would. Myrta had a few wild flowers twisted in her hair, but she was still in yellow battle armor. It was incongruous and very Mandalorian. Without a second thought, I'm Fett's granddaughter in every sense. But that doesn't mean it's the right thing for you to shoot him. Do whatever you can to get him locked up and treated or whatever. Maybe let fate take its course and leave someone else to kill him. And that was incongruously Mandalorian, too. Family. Not bloodline, but the living fabric of being a family meant a lot to them. And maybe that was the root of Myrta's anguish. She's worrying about me going through what she nearly did. Jaina was taken aback. That dualistic Mandalorian mindset, extreme violence, profound love, always threw her. I'll never forget what you're trying to do for me, she said at last. Myrta looked suddenly embarrassed, as if she didn't want to be caught being kind. Funny how I've only really got to grips with my own messy family since I've been talking to a Shabla Jedi. I've learned more than I ever thought I would from all of you. 
and I don't mean saber tactics either. There was nothing like living close to someone who wanted to kill their granddad to make you look at the lightsaber in your own hand and ask if you could really use it on your own brother. Jaina had been thrown up against the choices and consequences here in a way that she would never have experienced in her own polite, restrained, reasonable Jedi family. She was also a lot clearer about what it meant to be a Jedi, because of the mirror held up to her by Mandalore. Everyone needed to see themselves as others saw them. But she still didn't know exactly what she should do when it came to stopping Jason on his headlong rush to disaster. I'll be back later, Jaina said. I need to mull over what you've said. But please, go back to the party and be happy today. Promise me? Myrta didn't have a lot of happiness genes, that was obvious. But she managed to smile and clasped Jaina's arm. Let's never be in opposing armies. But if we are, we'll make sure we avoid each other. Deal? Deal, said Jaina. Jaina knew she wouldn't have understood that a couple of weeks earlier. But she certainly did now. She passed Sintas, walking up the dirt track toward Vevut's house from the center of Keldabe. She was clutching something tight in her right hand as she ambled along slowly, looking down at her fist as if she had a comlink link in it. But when Jaina got close to her, she could see that it had to be something much smaller than that. Sintas looked up as if she hadn't seen Jaina coming, and almost stepped out of her way. There were tears in her eyes. Jaina would have been stunned if there hadn't been. Losing your memory was bad enough— but having to recover memories as bad as hers was living through pain twice. Sorry, Sintas said, unfolding her fingers. There was a huge, deep blue gem in her palm, shot with brilliant rainbow colors as it caught the light. Just been doing some catching up. Sintas walked on. Jaina marveled at the ability of beings to recover from the worst experiences, and hoped her own family would be able to find some of that resilience. She could still hear the wedding guests singing, that same plaintive ballad she'd heard the other night. She chose to hear it as a song of love and homesickness. It would always sound that way to her, for as long as she lived. Well, you bought tap -calf. Keldabe. If Fett had wanted a drink in the tap calf today, he'd have had to get it from behind the bar himself. Everyone was at his granddaughter's wedding feast, including the barkeep, Cham. Fett waited for Admiral Dalla, thinking that it was a perfect freeze frame from his life that he was waiting to do business here while his granddaughter and his ex-wife were doing the right thing and celebrating the marriage. He watched Dalla walk through the doors, reflected in the mirrored panel next to his table. "'I've been arranging Gil's funeral with Rige,' she said. "'Did that involve a strafing run over Bastion?' "'The somewhat depleted Council of Moths couldn't see why we wouldn't release the body for a state funeral. I gave them back a few dead Moths to bury instead.' Corellia, then. Rige said Gil would have preferred that anyway. You can invite Jason Solo. He's a popular man on Corellia. They'd give him a warm welcome. Heat-seeking missile, maybe. Dalla didn't sit down. She looked as if she had somewhere else to go. Neothels formally declared the government in exile of the Galactic Alliance on Fondor. Who says Moan Cows don't have a sense of humor? And the Fondorians. Forgiveness is a wonderful thing. Sit down. You said, if I might remind you, that I could have an ale at Myrta's wedding. So I did. You seem reluctant. Is that because your ex-wife will be there? 
My ex-wife saw my face today, for the first time in fifty-two years. I've never seen you without the helmet. Time was when I said this was my face. Seen one, Mondo. Seen them all. Fett clamped his hands on the helmet's cheekpieces, thumbs under the rim, and twisted slightly as he lifted the helmet clear of his head. Dalla watched in complete silence, with her arms folded. The silence went on a little too long for him to feel comfortable. It's not about the scars, he said. Dalla looked him in the face, eyelids closing a fraction, the faintest of smiles passing across her lips. You scrub up well for an old man, Fett. I bet you broke a few hearts back in the day. If he had, it was only distant admiration. There was only ever Sintas. Ah. I do a job right, or I don't do it at all. She understood. Ah. Dalla was as hard as a hut's heart on payday. She hadn't made Imperial Admiral in a male-dominated navy by weeping into her handkerchief. But something had cracked that Beskar deck plating of hers, and her gaze flickered for a moment. That's a long time to devote to perfectionism. Saves me trouble I don't get paid to handle. And trouble that you can't ever buy again. Thanks for reminding me. Perfection isn't all it's cracked up to be, Fett. Sometimes good enough is all you need. No point surviving if you don't live. Fifty-two years alone. Not what I'd planned. But it could have been fifty-two years of misery with bad company. I know which hurts less. That thing's not your face, actually. Dalla stopped a fraction short of actually touching his jaw, but he thought she was going to jerk his face toward the mirrored panel and make him look at himself like some gawky, self-conscious adolescent being told he was fine just the way he was. And that's not your father's face, either. Fett had never flinched from his reflection, not out of sore conscience or insecurity, or because it was also Django Fett's face. He had always been able to meet the gaze flung back at him. Until today. Koane's smug, sterile Camino in judgment wormed into his brain. But what use is your wealth to you now? Maybe Dalla was right. He was already dead, and beating his tumors had only given him more years to contemplate just how very dead he was. You're right. It's mine. Fett looked at the reflection again, and survived seeing time ignoring his plea to stop, just like he'd ignored the pleas of so many targets. And are you another one who thinks it's unfair I got a blessing I couldn't use? Like Jaina Solo does? I got my second chance with Legius. I grabbed it. But Legius never stopped loving you. I didn't make him stop, either. Dalla stood at the Oyubot's doors, hands in her pockets, and looked up at the cloudless sky. Lovely day. I need my exercise. I'm cooped up on a ship most days. She held out her hand to him, palm down, as if telling a dawdling kid to hang on to her and not get lost in the crowd. Coming. 
Fett clipped his helmet onto his belt, feeling it tapping against the small of his back as he moved. It was a strange sensation, like someone trying to get his attention. Ready when you are, Admiral. It's Natasi, she said. Natasi, Dala. A good old Renatasian name. Kaldabe had seen him without the helmet often enough now. Nobody would turn a hair. Not about the helmet. And not about Admiral Dalla. Bralson, Mandalore. Next day. I knew you couldn't leave it alone, said Gotab. It was early evening and a haze was settling over the Kalita Valley in the distance. Jaina helped the old man sit down on a smooth-worn outcrop of pale gray granite. Close-cropped grass, ringed by stones large enough to sit on, lent the spot the air of a small arena. Gotab laid his helmet down and shut his eyes, facing into the breeze as if to savor it on his face. "'I need guidance,' Jaina said." Fett's still too busy. Discussing vital commercial issues with Admiral Dalla, then. It's not Fett's experience I need. It's yours. What she said next would either shape the galaxy's future or make Gotab walk off in disgust. I need to hear this from a Jedi. Former Jedi. You've got the whole Jedi Council to ask, Jaina. I bet they answer your calm right away. Maybe. But none of them have seen the galaxy from both sides. I haven't ever spoken to a Jedi who walked away from the Order, but who wasn't a Sith. I didn't just walk away from the Order. I didn't exercise right of denial. I stopped being a Jedi. Gotab laughed. I know the dark side, too. I lived alongside it for too many years, and I can't say that it was always a bad thing. But you're right. I'm no Sith. I'm just a man. Do you think of yourself as Gotab? Jaina looked over her shoulder, knowing Venku was around somewhere. In a way, it just means engineer. I was always good at fixing things. And people. He took out his lightsaber and held the hilt in his palm, hefting it. My name used to be Barden Jusik, but I stopped using my second name in case it got me killed after the purge. In private... To everyone who matters to me, I'm just Bardica. Do you have a family? Yes, but I know what you're really asking. Did I father more little Mandalorian Force users and train them as some kind of armored Jedi? No. I had plenty of adopted sons to look after, and daughters— my wife, may she find rest in the Manda, thought it was for the best. You could have had children via a donor. Clinics can do clever things. Mondo Ade, adopt. I chose the finest family a man could have. Why would we have wanted to conceive a child by donor? Gotab, Bardica, hadn't struggled to his feet to storm off, nor had he rounded on her. His impression in the Force was relaxed and a little sad, in a bittersweet kind of way that Jaina envied. It was as if he was looking back on a substantially happy life that had nevertheless had its moments of grief. She was trying hard to stay detached from emotions at the moment, because if she felt the good things in life— and there still seemed to be many, then she also felt the pain that reminded her that Mara was dead, that Jason was responsible, 
and that Jaina had sworn to deal with the problem. Things were fine as long as she held those events at bay and stared at them as if they were a disturbing holovid. The moment she let them slip past her guard and merge with reality, they were almost too agonizing to bear. I've got a terrible choice to make, she said. I have to stop my brother. I think I'm the only one who can. Mirta Gev, of all people, begged me to think twice about killing him and to leave him to someone else. There is no one else. Not even Master Luke Skywalker? My, my. So this one's bigger than Palpatine, is he? You sound very bitter about the Order, sir. I might be ancient, but I'm not an officer. Bardica, please. Flying creatures that Jaina couldn't identify wheeled and jinked high in the dusk sky like fighter craft. Gotab watched them in silence for a moment. The Order has long been about justifying its own existence, about acquiring and holding power, and from what I see now, nothing much has changed since my day. I know what I swore to do as a Jedi, and it didn't have anything to do with turning a blind eye to social evils, because the Sith were a bigger evil. But every act of evil we commit creates an environment where the Sith can exist. So Jedi who cut corners, a Jedi Order that cuts corners, forfeit their right to hold the moral high ground. Yes, I'm bitter. That's why I stopped being a Jedi, and just became someone who had Force skills and wanted to do no harm. I've killed and not regretted it. I've never wrung my hands while whining about my conscience. So if you genuinely want my advice, well, to hear my view, because that's all it is, then, Jaina Solo, we talk purely as individuals who can use the Force. I won't help the Jedi Order. Jaina was still aware of Venku wandering around the hill, keeping an eye on the two of them. She couldn't see him, but he was there. This is about me and Jason, she said at last. And you could have stopped him, any of you, if you'd united against him. One Sith can't stand against hundreds of Jedi. Your problem is that he's your own flesh and blood, and none of you have had the courage to do the job. You've been hoping that he'll see the light and stop, so that you don't have to do the dirty work. How many ordinary beings have died, while you made excuses for him because he's family? I know. Okay, I know. Jaina's gut twisted with guilt again. Yes, if Jason had been any other Sith with Jason's track record— She'd have cut him down without a second thought. Had anyone tried to redeem Palpatine, or that apprentice of his on Naboo? No. But Vader. Vader had turned out to be family. Uncle Luke had bothered to look for the good in him. You're going to give me the speech about no attachment, aren't you? Gotab turned to face her and smiled. The light was failing. He still seemed to have a luminosity about him, the sweetness of great age, despite the harshness of his words. Attachment, and you inevitably use your powers to serve your own family, or in your case, you fail to use them, he said. Avoid attachment, and you become an enactor of ritual. A sterile creature unable to truly understand love and sacrifice. There's no easy answer for a Force user, except rigid self-control. And I do not mean avoiding the dark side. 
I mean, not using the Force at all. That's not going to help anyone stop Jason becoming a galactic tyrant. Lovely job title, that. Galactic tyrant wanted. Apply within. You're mocking me. You want to know what I would do in your position? Yes. I'd kill him. Out of love. The reply shocked Jaina, because she felt it. He meant it. He wasn't serene. He was full of swirling passions, with hints of darkness in there somewhere. But he'd loved deeply, and still did. It was vivid within him. I can't avoid this, can I? She said. It's a lot more common than you think. People kill the one they love all the time. The motive can be anything. But in the end, you end the life you would have done anything to preserve. And then... Then... You go on living. You can kill out of jealousy, passion, revenge, mercy, duty, justice, greed, carelessness. How many people have you killed in combat, in war? More than one, I'll bet. You didn't love those people, but they're no less dead. So the only difference is how you square it with your conscience each day. We're talking about selfishness here. How will I feel? How will Jaina feel? And the rest of my family. Oh, sorry. I thought we were talking about the welfare of the galaxy. How foolish of me. Mind my asking why you killed? Duty. Fear, animal survival, and protecting those I loved. Mostly to eat. Gotab looked at her and nodded. It's about all living beings, don't forget that. Not just the ones we recognize as our own kind. It wasn't getting any clearer for Jaina. I thought I'd made up my mind so many times— but Myrta brought me up short today. My brother killed her mother, and she still begged me not to kill him, just in case I was wrong. And what if you let him live, and you're wrong? Jaina shut her eyes. She could sense Venku still taking a slow walk around the perimeter, a little irritable, growing impatient. The two men didn't live around here. They came down into Kaldabe from the remote north, the Oyubot regulars said. Even Mandalorians didn't drop in on them for a cup of calf and a chat. They call me the Sword of the Jedi, Jaina said. That's supposed to be my destiny. It's odd how these prophecies start to make sense when it's too late. Or maybe you're importing meaning into it that isn't there. What do you think? A sword is a symbol of justice in many cultures, Jaina. Real justice is blind, and personal feelings don't matter. But it wasn't about justice. She could suddenly see that. It wasn't so much about what Jason had done as what he would do in the future, cause the deaths of many more beings— there was no possibility that he would stop of his own accord. There was no intellectual or ethical argument about this. It was simply about a continuing threat to life. She realized Gotab was staring into her face. If they didn't activate a glow stick soon, they'd be sitting in the dark. But they didn't need to see each other's faces to know what was going on in their heads. It's not justice. And it's not punishment, she said at last. It's about saying this is as far as it goes. I have to stop him now. It hurts 
to say it. Not as much as I thought. But at the moment, it's just words. Barden finally resorted to a glow stick. He pulled it out of his belt and wedged it into a fissure in the rock to cast a soft yellow light. Then he took off his glove and held up a hand torn by old scarring, and gazed at the puckered skin as if recalling a long-lost, happier time. We keep strills, he said, hunting animals, the ones with folded skin and six legs that you might have seen around. A friend of mine loved his, but it started going crazy and attacking everyone, including me. He had to shoot it. Poor thing. It had a brain tumor. It wasn't itself. Killing it broke his heart, but he couldn't let it carry on. Not just for everyone's safety, but for the animal, too. Because it was utterly miserable. You sometimes have to kill what you love. End their pain. And take it on yourself. Because that's what love is, sometimes. That struck a raw chord in Jaina. Not the thought that Jason might be mad, if that made any difference to what he did, but that he was miserable somewhere in his soul. She thought of the embrace of pain, and the Jason who had survived it, and wondered if his torturer, Verger, had been even more poisonously subtle than anyone had ever imagined. Pain was central to Jason's life now. He thought he couldn't avoid it or forget it, so he used it. And in the end he'd grown to need it, and thought others did too, and that there was a virtue in necessity because he could do nothing to stop that pain as long as he lived. Better that it's me, then, Jason. Better someone who loves you and knows you than an executioner who just sees you as vermin. Did that make any difference? To think I blamed Jason's weakness for getting my other brother killed, she said, it was me who was going to the dark side then. Forget about you, Gotab said sharply. You have a job to do, that's all. Personally, I never bought this pious nonsense about Jedi violence being fine, as long as it was done with a pure heart. Sophistry, my dear. You're going to kill your brother, because he's a power-hungry, murdering dictator. No one else in your Jedi circle has the moral courage to do it, and you stand the best chance of stopping him. Finish the job like Fett and Bevin showed you. Then you can worry about your motives when the galaxy is safe again, and you have time for the luxury of contemplating the state of your soul. It was as harsh as a slap in the face but Jaina felt a cold certainty cascade over her, as if she'd been doused with icy water, making her instantly alert. It wasn't the kind of revelation that left you feeling enlightened and uplifted, understanding the galaxy better. It was the sort that said there was only one way out of the burning building if you wanted to live, and you would have to pass through fire. She stood up and stretched her legs, Thank you, Bardica, she said. I didn't come here to feel better about this situation. I came here for clarity. You've given me that. It has to be your choice, Jaina, not my orders. I choose, then, she said. I bet you have grandchildren, yes? Great-great-grandchildren, actually. Twenty of them. Then, Bardica, I'll do it for them. So they have a galaxy to grow up in. Her heart broke, 
and not for the first time. She thought of this drill, desperate and unhappy, biting those who loved it, and knew the burden of being the sword of the Jedi. Her biggest fear now wasn't that she would have to live the rest of her life with Jason's death on her conscience. She had found a way to replace it with what mattered. Not her personal problems, but the threat to the future of kids like Gotob's great-great-grandchildren. And, yes, even Fett's. She took out her lightsaber and handed the hilt to Gotob for him to admire in the dim yellow light. Do you still use yours? she asked. I spar occasionally, he said, but slowly, as much as a man of my age can. It keeps the joints more supple. If you could choose, would you give up your force powers? Yes, all except healing. I justified my existence with that many times. He activated the blade, and it hummed into life, casting a violet light. He made a few practice passes. Well made, Jaina. Can Venku use one? He has two, actually. Did you teach him to use them? Yes, but not for the reason you think. Gotab shut down the lightsaber and handed it back to her. She could feel Venku getting closer. He appeared over the ridge, the lighter-colored plates of his armor picked out by the glow stick. Buir, it's time we got you home, he said. I'm enjoying talking to Jaina, he said. Come on, Kadika. Join us. The old man smiled to himself. Funny. Venku's nickname is Kadika. Little Saber. He's a sword too, Jaina. But the sword of the Mandalorians. The one who persuaded us to look after ourselves. And not venture out to fight other worlds' war. Right then, that sounded like a good idea for anyone. She activated her lightsaber. It was a beautiful weapon. But Fett was right about recognizing it for what it was. Venku walked toward her, and then stopped. Want to practice? she asked. I'm not a Jedi. You don't have to be. Okay. Venku took out two lightsabers, both blue, and looked at them for a moment with a terrible, fond longing that completely shut out everything around him. Whoever had owned those before, Jaina would never know. But she understood that sorrow when she felt it. She took up her stance, saber held two-handed. Bevin's Beskod technique was for another day. Begin, said Gotab. Far into the evening, the darkness was illuminated with the bright humming blur of blades. And Jaina was illuminated too, and saw that the only way out of her dilemma was an agonizing but necessary passage through flame. Epilogue Jedi Camp Undisclosed location in the transitory mists, near the Hapes Cluster. Perfect Sanctuary was just a bedroll and a blanket on the dirt floor, and it was all that Ben needed right then. He just wanted to sleep. He crawled into the tent and let himself collapse face down on the bed. You okay, Ben? Luke's voice drifted over the faint whisper of breezes cracking with fatigue. Ben rolled over and stared up into the tent's ridge. Yeah, Dad. I really think I am now. You? You bet. Just checking. Get some sleep. 
Look who's talking. But Ben couldn't sleep. Not yet. He settled for letting his mind churn, wondering how Lon Shevu was doing, and if he'd been able to see Shula since he'd sent the transmission, and if Jory LeCouf's folks were coping, unable to tell anyone that their son died a hero. There were so many broken people and shattered families in this war. Ben felt as if he knew them all personally. I do, or at least I know too many. Sleep would come when his brain decided it was good and ready. So he didn't fight it. He just let his mind drift for what felt like hours until his father's voice jerked him fully alert. Yes, Dad was talking to someone. Who's woken him at this time of night? Nobody's going to track us down here. But Ben slid his arm to his side and felt for his lightsaber anyway because now he would never wake suddenly without reaching for it, for as long as he lived. It was one more legacy of this war. Oh, sweetheart, you found me. You found me. Stay a while. Ben wondered if his father was talking in his sleep, then knew that he wasn't, because he could feel Luke's sudden emotion like a light being shone in his face. His reflex was to scramble out of the tent and rush to his father's side, elated, with so much more to say and ask this time. But he stopped himself. This was Dad's time, not his. Ben knew exactly who'd found Luke Skywalker. He smiled laid his head on the makeshift pillow, and let the tears run down his face unchecked until sleep claimed him. End of Star Wars Legacy of the Force Revelation Book 8 by Karen Travis